Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Good morning, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of uh, General Olivier Rittiman, the Commandant of the NATO Defense College, and together with Marjorie Van Bellingham, Acting Director of IRSEM, it's my pleasure to welcome all of you to this event dedicated to perceptions of the strategic landscape and technological implications. I'm particularly grateful to Marjorie and to Evelyn Maté and the team at IRSEM for having organized this event. And I also want to commend the excellent cooperation between our two institutions, NATO Defense College and IRSEM, for what we've done over the last five or six years, uh, and in particular, the organization of this uh, event that takes place one year in Rome and one year here in Paris. What a revolution the last nine months have been for European security. From Russia's aggression and failed invasion of Ukraine, marking the return of war to Europe, the resistance and resilience of the Ukrainian people and its resolve to remain a sovereign nation, to the unity and cohesion of Western states and institutions, among which NATO and the European Union, in their opposition to Russia and support of uh, Ukraine, the European security landscape has been profoundly shaken over less than a year. For European and North American states and institutions, this raises a lot of questions, and the ambition of this event is to explore some of these questions. In particular, we are going to look at how key players have responded to the war in Ukraine and adapted to the new environment. What has been NATO's policy and how the new strategic concept gives the alliance a new direction? How have the US and European states contributed to the Western response to the Russian aggression of a NATO partner country? What are the challenges encountered by those Western key actors and how sustainable the effort <coughs> of supporting Ukraine is. This will provide an introduction to more specific questions in relation to the impact of technological evolutions on the conduct of warfare. Emerging and disruptive technologies, as we would call them in NATO, EDTs, emerging and disruptive technologies present both risks and opportunities for NATO and its allies. What are those risks? How can NATO and its allies respond to these risks so that they keep their technological age? How can the EU and NATO work together so that the opportunities of EDTs are maximized while the risks are minimized? And how can public-private partnerships be established so that societies and armed forces can best benefit from technological evolutions. These are some of the issues that we are going to explore, and I thank in advance uh, all speakers and moderators and you for your contribution to this event. I look forward to uh, the discussions. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, very good morning, and thank you very much, Dr. Tardy. Merci, Thierry, uh, for those opening words. As acting director of the Institute for Strategic Research of the École Militaire, I would like to extend a very warm welcome to all of you uh, here in the room and online. Uh, I know some people are joining us from Montréal and Brussels via Zoom, so I know all of you share the same interest for the issues related to the current strategic environment. I would like if you allow me to say a few words about IRSEM, Institute for Strategic Research of the École Militaire. The institute was created in 2010 and we play a central role in developing the next generation of researchers on war studies and security matters in general. I think uh, we can say we're unique in the sense that we bring together academia as well as military personnel and uh, collaborate both with the administration, the think tanks, and universities, both in, in France and abroad. And uh, as you may know, we are affiliated uh, to the Ministry of Armed Forces of France, 
and uh, the Directory General for International Relations and Strategy of the Ministry has oversight of our institute. Uh, we're made up of close to 50 personnel and we publish uh, different types of documents from uh, long research papers to uh, very uh, current affairs focused uh, briefs. And we also have a peer reviewed journals on war studies that's called Les Champs de Mars. Uh, so of course, all publications are available on our website and really encourage you to, uh, to take a look. We are trying to publish increasingly in English. Most of our publications are currently being translated within uh, a week or two weeks of their um, issuing in French. Um, we have a various partnership among which with the NATO Defense College of which we are extremely proud. Uh, recently, uh, we uh, developed more partnerships abroad. So we had historical links with the Japanese Institute for Defense Studies in, in Tokyo. Recently, uh, we signed letters of intent with um, ITSA in India, Delhi, the National Defense University in Washington, or the Academy on Fighting Terrorism of Ivory Coast. And uh, we also uh, had the initiative to create a network of uh, European Strategic Studies institutions called NESI, uh, set up last year, and that brings together 17 uh, strategic research institutions affiliated to ministries of defense of Europe as a whole. And uh, last but not least, we recently um, created a program called Paris Defense Young Leaders that was launched to enhance awareness on French perceptions in defense matters. Uh, for a community of promising, uh, you know, defense specialized young professionals. So now you know more about us. Uh, I would like to thank you again for taking part in this conference on the perceptions of the strategic landscape and its technological implications. Uh, we're very proud to bring together today researchers from academia and think tanks, representatives from international organizations, as well as national experts. As mentioned by Dr. Tardy, the event is jointly organized by the NATO Defense College and the Institute for Strategic Research of the École Militaire. Uh, we have nurtured very close ties in the last decade, and in 2017, we decided to organize uh, a yearly joint seminar, either in Rome or Paris, as you were mentioning, Thierry. And uh, before the pandemic, we focused, uh, so in 2019, before things closed down a little bit, uh, on the security in the Baltic Sea region, and it took place here at Ecole Militaire. And last year, we had a very timely topic, which was securing the Black Sea region. So um, it was hosted in Rome. As you can see, uh, those seminars really testify to very relevant choices in uh, topics. Um, the theme of today's conference on the perceptions of the strategic landscape and its technological implications really uh, finds its roots in the landmark event of 2022, the war in Ukraine, and I won't be saying uh, much more because Thierry, I think, has set the scene very well. And, uh, and also, it relates to NATO's new strategic concept. And uh, last but not least, I think the NATO uh, 2030 agenda is no alien to it either, uh, especially in its fourth dimension. Um, this uh, conference was organized to enhance awareness on the various components of the strategic landscapes. Uh, and it's going to revolve around a keynote speech and three round tables. And I see more about this in, a, in just a moment. So we all uh, want to share um, the appreciation of the pole mill context in Europe, but I think, and this is maybe the trademark of IRSEM's work, to analyze how we construct a perception of the strategic landscape uh, in maybe not a deconstructive way, but to analyze how we come with this uh, appreciation. And beyond, of course, we want to analyze uh, everything that's underlying it, uh, the transatlantic relations, the, the unity of reactions of the NATO communities, NATO, EUs, and partners nations uh, alike. And of course, uh, see the impact of the authoritarian pushback against the rules-based international order. Um, so the idea is to take stock of the risk uh, of how we discuss them between the lies and uh, how we are being uh, aware of our own vulnerab vulnerabilities and uh, how we show the willpower uh, to react. And I think this, um, the analysis of all this brings up uh, de facto the questions of our capacity to act and our capabilities for acting. 
And of course, the notion of partnerships in the wide sense of the terms comes into play as well, uh, as well as the need to strengthen our deterrence to the full range of threats in the short term and in the longer perspective. So I was mentioning we had three round table. The first one will address the issue of the identification of the current strategic challenges, how we read those challenges, the positioning of the main um, European key players, as well as an analysis of the American approach and its potential evolution, just coming up. And it will be followed by a keynote speech by uh, Camille Grand. Uh, Camille Grand has spent six years in, uh, in NATO's international secretariat in top management position, and we're very happy he accepted to share his conviction about strengthening deterrence and especially sharpening our technological edge. A second panel uh, will be centered around the technological stakes in NATO strategic concept uh, and how it calls for the uh, indispensable technological complementarity between the EU and NATO. Um, we'll talk about the increased role of industrial partnerships, traditional and more novel one. And of course, we will tackle uh, the budgetary constraints and uh, the sufficiency in capabilities. And the last panel, uh, also this afternoon, will focus on the identified trends for the evolution uh, of the global strategic landscape uh, with you know, climate change as, as a backdrop, a lot more than a backdrop, I would venture to say. A number of new risks and forms of competition will arise in addition to uh, those new spheres for rivalries. Uh, and of course, the question of hybrid warfare and its evolution. And it is on such open perspectives and, and multifaceted thought for thought that we will end our conference. So um, before closing uh, this introduction, I would like to underline that uh, we're very proud that we have a very satisfactory ratio of women and men uh, in, in those panels. Um, it, is, it is something we are uh, very uh, aware of at IRSEM. Uh, I want to share how proud we are to sign uh, early next year uh, a compact on uh, the visibility of women in public events and uh, their expertise in the media. It's a charter that's called Jamais Sans Elle, Never Without Her. Um, so uh, this is something we're very committed on. I want to thank you again all for taking the time uh, to share with us and the audience for being uh, here. Um, all those perceptions and convictions um, and Many thanks to uh, all the team at IRSEM, our research team and support team, especially Evelyn Maté. Mrs. Maté has been key uh, in putting together all this, and uh, I'm very proud we can rely on her and her experience and dynamism for this. Uh, Christophe Caram as well, and the usual suspect of the communication and event management with Marco here at the back. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this day. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's kick off the first panel with a, a wonderful lineup. So if you please will join me uh, here. Thank you very much. Bonjour à tous, à toutes et tous. Uh, good morning to everybody. Uh, I'm Evelyn Maté, and you anticipated that it would be Amélie Zima, who would be your moderator. She uh, let us know yesterday evening that she couldn't make it. So I'm ste stepping in for her. Uh, I will, uh, I will uh, introduce the member of the panel, uh, which will uh, aim at setting the scene and giving you a number of elements about the current strategic uh, um, landscape. Benedetta Berti will uh, introduce the, uh, the landscape, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce her and uh, uh, 
to have her as our first speaker uh, since she has been serving as the head of policy planning in the office of the Secretary General at NATO and has a very wide experience. She is an Italian policy advisor and consultant, an Eisenhower Global Fellow and a TED Senior Fellow. TED means technology, entertainment and design and it's uh, an NGO which has a, a very interesting development. She is also an associate researcher at the Institute for European Studies at Freie Universität uh, Brussels and a senior fellow at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. In the past, she has held position at West Point, the Institute for National Security Studies and Tel Aviv University. Her areas of expertise include human security, internal conflict, integration of armed groups, post-conflict stabilization and peace building, as well as violence prevention and crisis management. Benedetta holds a BA in Oriental Studies from the University of Bologna, a MA and PhD in International Relation from the Fletcher School, Tufts University. Benedetta, the floor is yours. All right. Great. Thank you so much uh, for that very kind uh, introduction. Uh, I have the privilege of starting today's conversation by uh, providing a few remarks on the uh, strategic landscape as uh, we look at it from NATO and then uh, highlighting some of the key challenges that uh, I see for the Alliance and for our transatlantic community at large. My starting point will be uh, the newly adopted NATO strategic concept that heads of, our heads of state and government uh, approved uh, in June uh, 2022, because that is the latest expression of a light grand strategy, if you wish. It is a joint assessment of the security environment and a collective uh, reframing of NATO's role and key tasks. So it's a good starting point for our conversation. Now I'm going to also reveal my personal biases because I was the one I was the one who wrote the strategic concept. So I think it's a very good document. Uh, and if you don't think so, please be kind. <laughs> uh, jokes apart. Uh, I'll start with uh, with setting the scene on the strategic concept, but perhaps also giving my own take because you can read the document yourself. And instead, maybe it will be a little bit more interesting if I also add some of the thinking behind the way the document is drafted. Um, so in terms of assessing the strategic landscape, I think there's a lot of different trends we could pick up. I will start with the one with the one that to me is the most obvious but also the more disrupting, and that is that we are in a time of systemic change. Um, as you would expect someone working in, in NATO, my, my, my understanding of this uh, would be through uh, what Gramsci said, so <laughs> forgive me for that, but uh, Antonio Gramsci a few decades ago looking at the uh, very uh, unsettling, of course, transition that was uh, occurring in Europe in the 30s, uh, looked at the word and said the old word is, is dead, but the new cannot be born. And it is in this time of transition that all sorts of morbid symptoms emerge. And to me, that was a little bit of an inspiration in terms of how to look at where we are today. Uh, what do I mean? The old European security order is no longer. It has the, what I mean is the post-Cold War European security order uh, enshrined in the Helsinki Act, uh, built on, uh, on assumption of stability, predictability, shared norms, shared values, cooperation. That system is not working anymore. Uh, all the principles and norms have been undermined, violated by the Russian Federation systematically for at least a decade. And today we find uh, ourselves, if you're very optimistic, you can say that that security order is on life support. If you're a little bit more pessimistic, you could say it's already dead. Either way, we are in a time of transition. Um, and that's very clear, I think, from a NATO perspective. And that's also reflected in our strategic concepts. We had Cold War strategic concepts that were very much focused. One theater, one threat, conventional. Then we had the 30 years of post-Cold War uh, reprieve 
the peace dividend here, what we really opened up in terms of how we understand security, and we de-emphasize to some extent collective defense and territorial defense of Europe because the assumption was that the European security order ensured a level of predictability and stability. And uh, if you read the 2022 strategic concept, the message is clear. The post-Cold War or era is over. We don't have those guarantees anymore. The Euro-Atlantic area today is not at peace. Uh, we don't see a clean or quick trajectory to restoring that order. And therefore, we need to prepare for a more multipolar, more complex, and more fragile security environment. So I think that's kind of the light motif, the overarching theme of our analysis. And in that sense, Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine is, yes, a watershed, but more than anything is an accelerator of a trend that was already there, meaning already before February 2022, we had seen this steady deterioration of the security environment. Uh, moreover, I would say that uh, the deterioration of our security environment, it's not just a reflection of uh, worsening relations between uh, us and the Russian Federation. It's more at large a reflection that the world, the global security system and the global international order is shifting. The global geo geopolitical balance of power is shifted, the global geoeconomic balance of power is shifting, and whether we like it or not, and I think that's, uh, really expressed quite clearly in the strategic concept, we need to prepare for prolonged strategic competition. Uh, I think in the, if I'm not mistaken, in France it's more referred to as great power competition. Pick your term, it's the same thing. We are going to be much more contested and in a much more competitive environment in which we see assertive authoritarian powers challenging us across the spectrum. So there is a kinetic dimension that we see, of course, uh, displayed in the Ukraine war. There is a military component in terms of military modernization, uh, rapid military modernizations of all the parties involved. But it's not just a military, it's not just military, it's really across the spectrum. We see technological competition, and I'm sure in the other panels we'll explore this further, but that's a, I think it's a key arena of geopolitical competition, technological supremacy will determine to some extent battlefield outcomes. So it's really at the forefront of how we see winning uh, the wars or the future. It's about economy, uh, exploiting interdependence, the downside of globalization, uh, exploiting vulnerabilities and strategic dependencies. It's about uh, competing political systems and views of the international order. Um, of course, already in the introduction, there was a reference to Russia and China pushing back against the rules-based international order. That's a defining trend and promoting alternative models of authoritarian governments, uh, governance. So that's a little bit, not very optimistic, but I would say the, the mega trend uh, against which we need to look at how an organization like NATO can fulfill its mandate. The mandate remains the same. It's about ensuring defense and security in the Euro-Atlantic area. But the environment where we do this is, of course, very much transitioning. Uh, the strategic concept picks this up quite clearly in terms of the framing. And then I think, uh, unsurprisingly for everyone in the room, it, it, it focuses on Russia as today, the Russian Federation being the, the most direct and significant military threat, threat to the security of allies and to the uh, broader Euro-Atlantic peace and stability. But we're also looking at uh, the Russian Federation's broader impact in terms of destabilization of the broader neighborhood and in terms of global spoiler, uh, again, often in concert with uh, the People's Republic of China. Um, so what is the, the, the policy prescription? We, I'm happy to discuss it uh, because, of course, it's a very complex one, but I think the most simple, uh, I think the most concrete insight we can see from the situation at the moment is that we got to prepare for an adversarial relationship for the time to come while managing escalation and ensuring that we have open channels of communication. This is not an easy balance, uh, but I think that's what the strategic concept puts at the center. And the hope that this relationship will become much better in the near term future is simply not uh, grounded in facts. 
Uh, the second main, uh, when it comes to systemic challenger, the, sacrum, the second main element that is addressed in the strategic concept is, of course, uh, the People's Republic of China. Uh, here we're not talking about uh, direct or an adversarial relation or a military threat, but we are talking about a systemic competitor. And that means uh, for an organization like NATO, it's one of the most interesting questions in terms of what does that mean concretely in terms of how the organization prepares itself. Uh, in terms of how to navigate competition, enhance resilience, boost unity, and so that's a very important conversation that is happening at the time. Um, and please let me know what I'm doing with time when, when it's time for me to stop but make a sign, because otherwise I'll continue. But uh, the first, so this is, I think, in, in, a, in a nutshell, that's one of the main trends that we are seeing, rising strategic competition. It's not the only one. We need to, I think, look at it in connection with at least two others. One is the fact that we are in a time of persistent fragility uh, in which emergencies become the new normal. In other words, we have persistent fragility in our neighborhood both to our east and to our south. Uh, and at the same time, we also see recurrent shocks from climate change to pandemics and all of these trends interact with each other. So the security environment is particularly complex. And one of the uh, issues we wanted to underline in the strategic concept is exactly this issue of interplay, intersections between different trends. And the fact that uh, for, an, for a regional alliance like NATO, it becomes more and more important to be aware and understand how global developments affect the Euro-Atlantic area and how there, there are relationships between regions and theaters. For example, we used to think about uh, fragility as something that, that concerned us mostly in the South, whereas conventional presence, uh, where, where threat from Russia con concerned us mostly in the East. Of course, that's, that's no longer the case. We see Russian presence all across our flank, mm -hmm. from East to South, and we see fragility both in our Southern neighborhood and in our Eastern one, and that's likely to continue. And in terms of relationship within theaters, this is the first strategic concept that makes links between Indo-Pacific and Euro-Atlantic, and how they both, uh, there are interplays that we need to be aware of when it comes to our security. The second interplay is between military and non-military. That's again complicated for a military organization that doesn't have all the tools, and that's why it's so important to work with others. But the reality is that uh, in, an, in a time of contestation, we, are being, we need to look at across the spectrum at how our adversaries are using both kinetic and non-kinetic means to undermine us. And I think the recent energy crisis that we're living through in Europe is a testament of the fact that our strategic vulnerabilities uh, in technology, in economy, and in critical infrastructure can and will be weaponized against us. Uh, in the future, so we have to be aware of that. So what, last three minutes, so what for NATO? Uh, the challenge is, of course, that everything matters and everything is connected, but not everything is, that's my own opinion, so take it or leave it, but not everything, well, not everything will be necessarily dealt through the organization. But the importance is that we are aware of this complex security environment and that we uh, preserve I would say a sharp focus on what is our one purpose, which is collective defense. And I think in the strategic concept, we try to do that by uh, underlining the importance of setting ourselves, of rebuilding that ability to do collective defense, territorial defense of Europe, um, thicken our eastern flank, really think through how to transition towards a more uh, forward defense approach, elements of, well, NATO's history is a struggle between forward defense and strategic depth, separate conversation, but point is we need to, to look at that trend. Uh, at the same time, we also need to embrace the fact that, uh, yes, it's going to be uh, very important to have a stronger conventional maritime and air presence, but we also need to be aware that the wars of the future are multi-domain and multi-domain integration, cyber, hybrid, cyberspace, land, air and sea are uh, key to how we win. Um, one, one element that I put on the table that maybe we'll discuss later is that, of course, also from, from Ukraine, we are, also, we are also learning quite a few lessons, hopefully. And I think one of them is that as we look at technology and innovations and the wars of the future, we must not forget the wars of the, fa the past. We must not forget the conventional war is still incredibly important, that mass matters. 
and that uh, is a good lesson for us, and that's why I see with uh, some hope the reflection we're having as a transatlantic community about addressing some of the industrial capacity deficit that we have and rethinking some of our planning assumptions when it comes to uh, our stockpiles, our, our reserves, our equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, finally, uh, yes, we are focusing on what is our primary job, which is deterrence and defense, but we are recognizing that that cannot be done uh, we cannot, we don't have the luxury of doing only one thing. And that's why the strategic concept also talks about the great importance of maintaining a crisis prevention and management approach and a, a strong focus on partners, all embedded into a strong political role in which we see the Alliance as the only platform where you have Europe and North America at the table forging consensus on the key security issues of our time. And one of them is of course resilience. Uh, Last but not least, of course, to do all of this well, we can't do it alone. And that's why the strategic concept really puts a premium on strengthening our partnerships. First and foremost is, of course, with the European Union, because here we are in a situation in which uh, mutual synergies and complementarity can and must be uh, pursued. But, also, but not exclusively, we also look at global partnerships and um, and the strategic concept mentioned specifically th those in our Indo-Pacific region, which uh, will remain uh, and become even more important in a, in a more interconnected future where there are inevitable links between different theaters, uh, which doesn't mean changing our focus when it comes to our per operational focus remains, of course, the Euro-Atlantic, but, uh, but we have to have a global approach. Uh, I think that's, I think I'm, two minutes over, which means I will stop. Um, I hope that's, uh, that's, that sets the scene a little bit for the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Benedetta. This has brilliantly set the scene, and I think uh, it opens up the, um, the seminar in a way which, uh, um, which covers uh, several domain and which covers domain which will be tackled by other uh, speakers. Jezine Weber will be the uh, second speaker and she will focus more on what is the positioning of the key actors, the key players in this uh, scenery. Jezine is a research analyst at the German Marshall Fund where she focuses on European security and defense and also coordinates GMF annual transatlantic trend survey. Her research portfolio includes the EU Common Security and Defense Policy, EU-UK relations, the E3, meaning France, Germany, and UK, and Europe's role on the geopolitical chessboard. She regularly com comments on and publishes on European security and defense in English, French, and German, both in ma media and more academic formats. Jezin is also pursuing a PhD research on European defense cooperation at the Defense Studies Department of King's College London, where she is affiliated with several research groups. Furthermore, she is an associate researcher for the European Council on Foreign Relations. Prior to joining GMF, she worked as a parliamentary advisor to a member of the German Parliament and a consultant for the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. She holds an AMA in European Affairs from Sciences Po Paris, an AMA in Political Science from Freie Universität Berlin, and completed the Fran French-German BA program at the University of Freiburg and the Institut d'études politiques d'Aix-en-Provence. Jezine, we are listening to your perception of the positioning of the key players in this strategic landscape. Wonderful, thank you. I hope that you can all hear me well. Um, and thank you, um, Benedetta, also for um, out or for setting the scene here with um, the um, view of the alliance. I will try to come in here with um, some key players. Um, I don't pretend that it's the key players because I'm not going to talk um, about Poland. As you heard, I'm more focusing on uh, France, Germany, and the UK. And um, yeah, so let's keep in mind that I'm only focusing on what's sometimes called the old Europe, um, also because we see um, interesting strategic sh shifts or recent adjustments in great uh, or grand strategy of these players um, so that I think it's worth um, having a look on these three but of course that's not um, exclusive to broadening uh, the horizon a bit 
on there. And after that, we're also having to have a deep dive into um, the US perspective. So um, I would say let's start with a look on the uh, European perspective here. Um, in a nutshell, um, things are moving on and have been moving on also since um, the publication of the strategic concept in summer. But, and, but what we see is that um, there is a significant degree now of um, the way how the partner or how the three countries look at these challenges or assess the strategic environment. Mm -hmm. And particularly um, with regard to Russia, but also increasingly with China. And the most important strategic adjustments in this regard have, um, as you will not be surprised, um, taken place in Germany. That's also why I'm going to start with a perspective on the Germans. You have all not heard about the Zeitenwende, the um, change of an era discourse from the German Chancellor. I'm not going into detail here. But um, the fact that Germany is now talking about security and defense and threats and the strategic environment is basically a huge step forward. I want to give a bit of a context here. Um, before Russia's um, invasion of Ukraine, this or this, these concepts, these topics were completely absent from German public discourse. You didn't find that in the media. You didn't have... Um, you didn't have it in the um, evening news. That was really a niche topic. And talking about arms and war and defense was kind of, um, you could even say, um, a complicated topic or a topic that most Germans pushed aside because they didn't want to talk about it. Now Russia forced them to do that. Um, and Germany decided to set up this 100 billion special fund and so on. But um, what I think is very important when we now look at how Germany reads the challenges that are upcoming and what maybe dis uh, distinguishes Germany from France and the UK in this regard is that first geopolitical thinking is really not in the DNA of German security and defense policy. So um, there is an assessment of the strategic <coughs> challenges, but um, this interlinkage or the, uh, the interlinked nature of challenges, the fact that there are economic challenges or that your economic policy might have a direct <coughs> impact on your security policy and on threats and dependencies, that is completely new. So um, now at the time where Germany is drafting its new security strategy, um, it will be very important to look um, how Germany um, brings these elements together. You know that there has been this, uh, this approach of change through trade um, towards China. Now we see Germany becoming a bit more hawkish. So that is um, definitely an interesting part. And um, another thing that um, w is something to look out for on the German side is the question how um, the allocation of resources um, will finally look like. So what are the priorities and where does the money go? Maybe a quick overview of the German assessment because I also want to go to the, um, to the other countries and what we might see in the upcoming security strategy. So um, first, it is the fact that defense does matter and also that territorial defense does matter and that it is indeed a subject that should be taken into consideration. Um, you also see that with um, Germany's support now for projects like the European Sky Shield, um, and that's an uh, anti-missile um, co um, cooperation project. So the fact that there is now a um, conceptualization of, let's call that maybe active defense, um, is definitely something that has changed. So the fact that there is a threat from Russia um, has really um, constituted a click moment, if you want to put it like that. In the, um, in the German mindset and in the German assessment. Another consequence, particularly now after the midterm elections, is that um, German security policy and German's approach to everything concerning European security is going to be transatlantic and is going to stay transatlantic. In this regard, the midterm elections have had a reassuring effect on Germany 
um, with many Germans basically saying, okay, Trumpism is not that bad as we thought, we can go on. And let's maybe, or let's continue as we always did, NATO has to be in the center of European security, and then we can try to build the EU a bit around that. And that stands in stark contrast with what basically France is pushing for. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and could potentially, when it comes to how the alliance is going to address these challenges, also spark um, even more disputes among Germany and France, because in the perspective of Germany, everything hard security should be NATO and everything else should be EU. That's um, a bit how Germany assesses and reads um, the strategic challenges. One thing um, where we don't have so much um, visibility at the moment is reading the China challenge, if you want to put it like that. Particularly the visit of um, Chancellor Scholz has been very contested in this regard. On the other hand, we hear and see um, German government officials increasingly hawkish towards China and even the business um, lobby, um, particularly small and medium enterprises, are growing increasingly wary of China. So um, the fact that China is, has, well, is not um, distancing itself from Russia is another moment for Germany to change its thinking and to adopt its approach towards China, which might also matter on the medium term, at least, um, for, for the alliance. I'm I've already been too long, actually, so I have 10 minutes left, so I try to be a bit quicker on France and um, particularly the UK. Um, what I thought was interesting when we are looking at how France positions itself is, of course, um, the new security strategy, or it's called the um, Strategic Review, Revue Stratégique Nationale, um, that has been published on um, November 9th, so quite recently. Um, and what is interesting here is that now the um, assessment of Russia gets very close or is getting very close to the assessment that also prevails in the UK. When you look at the assessment of um, the threats or the challenges, Russia comes first was not uh, directly the case um, before. So here um, thinking has changed and this is particularly true. Um, as um, the France underlines the threat of the Russia-China um, axis. So with regard to the assessment of the strategic environment, France is particularly afraid of the emergence of blocks. And the French answer to this is the concept of being a puissance d'équilibre. It's a bit difficult to translate that into English. You could say it's a balancing power or um, a power of the balance. So the idea is that Fra France, co France's conclusion from this changing geopolitical landscape is that, of course, France has allies and France has partners, but there is no automatism that the enemies of your partners are also your enemies. So um, that is basically important and interesting to understand for France's um, position as a middle power in the international system. And this could, at one point, also spark disputes or challenges, particularly when it comes to France's role in the Indo-Pacific, which is, of course, identified as a um, priority area. Without going so much in the um, geographical priorities and the geographical um, challenges that France sees at the moment, one thing that, from my perspective, is very interesting when it comes to how France reads the strategic environment is um, the prominent place that is given to high-intensity warfare um, and hybrid warfare in the new um, French security strategy. And with that, um, we see again that France and the UK really align when it comes to their reading of the international environment because this idea of high-intensity warfare was already quite prominent as well in uh, UK strategic approaches before the invasion of Ukraine. And um, now France is getting closer to that. So the idea that um, the Fr French armed forces have to be ready for high-intensity warfare and also that um, there must or that warfare is not only or might on the one hand be 
in this context of high intensity and on the, and on the other hand, right below the threshold of war in the hybrid, um, in the hybrid sphere is also quite important and also knowing that France has been pushing a lot on the European level, for instance, for the um, EU space um, strategy and the strategies on new technologies, um, I think hint already to the fact that we might really see um, Paris pushing for allies to pursue all that. And um, another point is, of course, um, when it comes to um, the overall conclusion that France had, or that you can read into the French um, assessment of the strategic environment, is overall that there is no way around an Europe de la Défense. So, um, a defense cooperation in Europe and really having a European space of um, defense cooperation, which should, should mean that Europeans really achieve strategic autonomy. So um, strategic autonomy defined as the ability to take decisions based on European interests and acting uh, autonomously if it's necessary and with partners wherever possible. Um, and for France, the current situation with different theaters, uh, Benedetta also painted um, or pointed that out. Um, for France, this basically means um, Europeans have to do much more. And um, it's good if they do it within the EU. And whatever they do within the EU has to be compatible with NATO. But um, for France, the preference is quite clear. And that already shows that partners, or France, Germany, and the UK might be going into different directions here, with Germany having a very strong preference for basically doing everything military in NATO, France arguing um, that the EU has played a role over the last months that um, NATO could not play, for instance, through mobilizing the European peace facility for arms deliveries and so on, and the UK still um, yeah, having a very clear preference for cooperation with NATO. Five, yeah, five minutes left. Um, speaking about the UK, um, we've seen, I think, the most interesting policy developments in the last five, four weeks uh, in the UK, besides, of course, um, the domestic shifts that we have witnessed here. But the fact that the UK is now joining um, the PESCO military mobility project, for me, really shows that it is now um, rethinking how it basically has to address the strategic challenges. So the assessment of the strategic landscape by the UK has not significantly changed, significantly changed since the publication of the integrated review in March 2021, simply because um, this integrated review already labeled Russia as a clear threat to the UK. And when Russia um, attacked Ukraine, um, the UK had, I don't want to say we told you so um, position, but the UK was okay, we anticipated that. And we um, were very clear about that threat from Russia. And um, the, there are currently also debates about um, labeling China also as a threat. So um, the UK is definitely the most um, hawkish country um, towards um, the two of, um, or towards Russia and China, and asks for a very clear answer on that. How exactly this is going to look like under Rishi Sunak, we don't know that yet. I'm still waiting for a um, for a major policy response. But what is interesting is that we see a lot of um, alignment between France and the UK, um, French British summit announced for the next year. So for them, um, it's clear NATO is and remains the go-to institution. But I think um, one thing to look at over the next months is really the question of French British leadership in NATO and as a European pillar of NATO, because let's be honest, Germany will have to deal with all the questions of defense investment and also struggles into the coalition that, um, the co that there won't be French-German leadership over the next months, whereas there might be a real window of opportunity um, for UK-France um, cooperation. I think that there is one major point, um, and that is also something NATO overall is facing, and that is that Europeans cannot do it all. 
And that is also really something that um, Germans, fr the French, and the British are perfectly aware of. So this fact that on the one hand, particularly the UK has very high ambitions in the Indo-Pacific with the so-called tilt to the Indo-Pacific, France continuously underlines the importance of the Indo-Pacific, but on the other hand, Europeans are also aware that if tensions increase, um, there might be um, more pressure from the U US for Europeans to do the very heavy lifting on European um, security and defense in Europe, and also when it comes to crisis management in the European neighborhood. So um, a major reading, um, I would say in Paris, London, and Berlin, is the question that at one point, Europeans also are going to face trade-offs and might have to manage expectations also in the US and among other NATO partners, what they can basically do in the Indo-Pacific. Um, I could touch about, uh, upon quite a lot of other elements, particularly on EU-NATO cooperation, how that is seen. But I think the major takeaway um, from all the three capitals at the moment is really the question of prioritization, moving forward and going into 2023, 2024. Um, so the question, where do we want to invest? Because investment is really going to set the scene for that. Um, which are the capabilities that we acquire? Are we doing it rather through the EU, through PESCO, through um, the European Defense Fund and so on? Or are we more like um, betting or putting our, um, our focus on NATO? A lot of strategic decisions to be made. And um, in the end, it's prioritization in the capitals that uh, will set the scene, I think, for where the alliance is heading. And with that, I'm closing um, and handing <coughs> it over to you again. OK, thank you very much, Lesine. I think uh, we've gone into fairly uh, de details uh, on the position <laughs> of the, the three uh, European uh, partners. Um, I now pass on the... Uh, uh, the floor to uh, Professor Garner. Let me introduce Professor uh, Garner to you. He is full professor and former chair of the international politics at the American University of Paris. His research blends a historical and theor theoretical approach with contemporary international affairs, concentrating on questions involving NATO and EU enlargement, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and its impact upon China and Eurasia in general, as well as the global ramification of the war on terrorism. An American citizen, Or Garner holds a PhD from John Hopkins uh, School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, DC. He taught uh, in Nanjing and in Washington before coming to the American University of Paris in the fall of 1990. His most recent work is Vers une stratégie transatlantique alternative, uh, published in 2022, both in French and English. And he has a, a website uh, which you can uh, consult. Uh, beyond his um, uh, known analysis of the international landscape, he is also uh, a writer of novels and uh, he will recommend to you the last one he wrote. <laughs> Professor Gardner, the floor is yours okay. on the Thank American strategic much. approach. Th Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I, some of you may have gotten the two um, flyers I put out on my most recent book um, published by the uh, Foundation Prospective Innovation uh, uh, on uh, Biden's global strategy, which I'll talk about today, and my other one called uh, um, uh, <coughs> uh, year of the um, Earth Serpent uh, Changing Colors, which dealt with the, uh, the uh, conflict in Tenement Square, which I lived through uh, when I was teaching for Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies back in 1988-89. And the theme of that book is precisely, indirectly, what I'll talk about today is the need to really understand uh, what China is all about in order to um, find a, a peaceful route to um, prevent the, the real possibilities of conflict between the U.S. and China. So it's a deeper uh, sociological, theoretical, and rel even religious uh, analysis of U.S.-China relations. Um, my thesis today is that the general global political, economic, and ecological crisis that we are facing, which is being further 
amplified by the horrific war taking place between Russia and Ukraine, will require the U.S., NATO, and the European Union to better coordinate their global geopolitical, political economic development, and ecological strategies. This means that the U.S. Do, must do everything possible to build up the European Union as an autonomous factor working with NATO, as just said, but uh, because Moscow will do everything it can to tear the U.S. and NATO down. The real threat here that Moscow is presenting is, is military, but it's more, in my view, it's even more political. That is to divide NATO and the EU. And most importantly, most obviously right now, what I call the Achilles heel of NATO, the, the Greek, Greek and Turkey relationship in which NATO, which Russia is trying to bring Turkey into its own orbit. There are other countries as well. Hungary is another uh, problematic issue uh, in that regard. The U.S. and to, to, to my point is that the U.S. and EU will need to um, implement a new U.S. or EU-U.S. Strategic Council that whose mandate is broader than the EU-U.S. Trade and Technology Council that just came into existence in the past year. Ironically, the war in Ukraine can provide a catalyst for closer U.S. and EU strategic cooperation and strengthen the Franco-German-European uh, cooperation that Jacine has just talked about, but it needs American backing to do that so that the, the tensions between the nations, France and Germany and, and the U.K., et cetera, uh, don't, um, can, can more cooperate than, um, than, than move in their own way. Um, and why is this? It's, the EU itself, as Jacine pointed out, will need to build its own military capability and autonomy precisely because the U.S. is looking towards Asia, specifically China and now North Korea, as we see the um, recent missile test at North Korea. Putin is playing what I call a North Korean car card in order to divert American attention to, to Asia. It's in the past, and I have a very different uh, interpretation of events um, than, than NATO's. Um, uh, I've been writing about this for 30 years, so this war, to me, was predictable. But um, the point was the NATO and the EU did not, the more in Ukraine, uh, did not possess a coherent and coordinated approach to the dual enlargements of NATO and the Euro European Union membership into the former Warsaw Pact in former Soviet-controlled space after the Soviet Union suddenly collapsed. For its part, NATO tended to emphasize defense integration. The EU emphasized political, economic integration. But both regimes downplayed, if not entirely ignored, Russian defense, security, political, economic concerns with respect to Ukraine, among other Soviet bloc states, as clearly articulated by Mikhail Gorbachev and Boris Yeltsin. Concurrently, most of the U.S. or NATO-led post-Cold War military interventions did not possess a clear end game, as was the case for the U.S.-led military intervention in Iraq in 1990 that liberated Kuwait. And, and, uh, at, but this lack of uh, coordinated uh, approach towards Russia and the former dominated states was only due in part to the fact that the Western world was in the end of history days, in the belief that democratic forms of governments were on the resurgence and that the possibility of major war was waning. The problem is that stemming from at least the war on Kosovo, war, 1999 war on Kosovo, the global war on terrorism in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, among other lesser interventions, have not uh, ended in satisfactory resolutions and at a high cost of some $8 trillion in rising according to the Cost of War project. So despite Biden's administration's withdrawal from Afghanistan, which is seen as a uh, humiliation from the United States, for the United States and those allies that uh, participated, GWAT continues in a form of over-the-horizon strategy with the use of cruise missiles, drones, special forces, and now with a focus on al-Shabaab in Somalia, al-Qaeda affiliates in Syria uh, and the Arabian Peninsula, ISIS in Syria and Iraq, while, um, as President Biden himself said on August 31st in 2021, the point here is that this uh, over-the-horizon strategy requires new military technologies, and most specifically, the use of uh, drone warfare, I think, which are becoming significant as well as controversial. 
that is during this war on terrorism that Russia and China quietly build up their military capabilities ever since the war over Kosovo. This is the point that they began to rebuild, 1999. It's recently, only recently, during this time that Russia and China have quietly rebuilt their defense capabilities, that the 2002 U.S. National Security Council, the 2022 Nuclear Posture Review, the 2022 U.S. National Defense Strategy, the 2022 NATO Strategy, and the March 22 EU Strategic Compass have all begun to approach regional and global security questions in similar ways. I read all these documents. They almost use the same vocabulary to identify co common threats, security, defense concerns, and now focusing on, as was said, great power rivalries or strategic rivalries. As a, they're not entirely downplaying or ignoring global war on terrorism, but in the for, what's, uh, what's been called the forever wars, but nevertheless, um, the, the focus is on primarily Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. Now, the U.S. Congress has been very supportive of higher defense spending uh, versus both Russia and China even prior to the, uh, well, we're right about 2014, uh, and certainly after the uh, 2022 Russian invasion of eastern Ukraine, um, after obviously taking the Crimea beforehand, in what was called the hypersonic moment, when China tested hypersonic weapons that propelled Congress to boost defense spending. It's the theme of the... the the seminar today, of course, uh, this, these new weapons are, are, are uh, certainly crucial to the, 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 the new uh, arms race that are taking, that's taking place. Now, Biden's administration's strategy is not particularly radical or transformative, but it does emphasize multilateralism as opposed to Trump's America first unilateralism. At the same time, however, Biden's strategy can, can be characterized as U.S.-led multilateralism, in which Washington at least opens the door to allies to cooperate by promising to build consensus in all areas of mutual interest where possible, but U.S. policy can still close the door to some allies in favor of others in asserting American interests first. And this was evidently the case when the Biden administration forged the U.S. nuclear submarine deal with Australia, overturning the French diesel submarine deal and then forging the AUKUS Pact with the UK and Australia. Now, however, the, 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 that nuclear deal appears to be back on the table for the French uh, to sell diesel subs to Australia. We'll see what happens there. But my point is that Biden's policy, while US-led, and of course will periodically shift towards America first, it also opens a, a dual perspective towards adversaries such as Russia and China, as opposed to a sheer containment policy. So Biden is willing to openly negotiate with Russia and China where the two sides have common interests, and only if those two sides, common interests of those two sides are held in the same order of magnitude. To simplify, both Russia and China may have some common interests with the United States and Europe in reducing global warming, but neither Russia or China sees the issue as existentially crucial. And to simplify, both China and Russia have sought sanction relief in exchange for the cooperation on the environment. Another dilemma remains that the U.S. and China uh, when, cannot, very difficult for the U.S., Russia, and China to agree on what is referred to as international rules order, international rules-based order, uh, as both Russia and China see that order as American opposed by the United States and the, the Western world in general. However, it is clear that the Biden administration has reached out to engage with negotiations just this past uh, month and, and, and recently with very intense negotiations with both Russia and China, firstly to prevent the Ru Ukraine uh, conflict from widening beyond Ukraine and to prevent the threatened Russian use of nuclear weapons. Um, at the same time, the U.S. is concerned with China's threats to Taiwan and has uh, at least gotten assurances from Xi that, uh, there, that that was not on the table, at least in the present, uh, present period. At the same time, however, as I mentioned in the introduction, um, the uh, efforts to limit the U war in Ukraine by the United States are, uh, are not entirely being reciprocated by Putin, of course, with the bomb bombing strategy he's engaging in, but at the same time he's also playing the Korean card to divert U.S. attention to the Far East 
in the threat of expanding the conflict to Asia, and therefore destabilizing the global political economy. Before coming to power, Biden raised hopes for more radical change in U.S. nuclear strategy and urged deeper reduction in nuclear weapons than he has so far implemented, uh, and largely because of the tensions with Russia. We don't foresee uh, significant changes in nuclear policy. But when Biden first was, uh, was, was coming to office, he was a strong supporter of no first use, but he now appears to be leaning to uh, what he calls sole purpose statement about nuclear weapons. Um, it, instead of adopting a no first use strategy, which could undermine allied uh, confidence that the U.S. Would, would defend them with nuclear weapons, such a new declaratory policy could possibly state that the sole purpose of U.S. nuclear weaponry is to deter nuclear attacks against the United States and its allies. Such an approach could help de-emphasize the now high-profile role of nuclear weapons in both American and NATO strategy without necessarily undermining extended deterrence. But this st strategic discussion is still open, and Biden has not ruled out, um, uh, well, he's ruled out so far the no first use strategy as well as the sole purpose strategy. And given the uh, ongoing war in Ukraine and Putin's nuclear threats, plus the threat now of North Korea's uh, uh, missile and, and nuclear program, the U.S. It will still keep the nuclear option on the table. So this means that if the war in Ukraine does not come to an end, we will be also confronted with a new nuclear arms race, hypersonic arms race, cyber uh, arms race. Okay, I don't want to go too far. Now, Biden did cancel the sea-launched uh, nuclear cruise missile. Uh, hold on, let's get the, he, uh, he did uh, begin to alter uh, American nuclear strategy. Uh, he, he canceled the sea-launched nuclear cruise missile that even the U.S. Navy did not want. And most importantly, he canceled the 2,400-pound B-83 gravity bomb uh, that can cause a 102-megaton explosion, 80 times more powerful than the A-bomb. At the same time, he has continued to develop the B-61-19 uh, tactical nuke, which extends it's, it's no longer a gravity bomb. It extends the range of the tactical nuclear weapon. So this tactical nuclear race between the U.S. And, and, and Russia is still on the table and needs to be addressed because there is no uh, the start uh, uh, talks. Um, strategic arms talks did not address these issues. Biden has, contrary to what he said uh, coming to power, he has supported most of the nuclear uh, system proposed by Trump such as the new 260 billion intercontinental ballistic missile, plus new lower yield warheads for missiles on the Trident submarine, even though he had posed those. Um, so now uh, Biden argues that deterring Russian limited nuclear use in a regional conflict is a high U.S. and NATO priority. Now, what I do find most significant about the U.S., NATO, and EU strategies is not that China was mentioned for the first time, as posing a systemic challenge, as, uh, but the recognition that of U.S., NATO, EU documents that the deepening strategic partnership between the People's Republic of China and the Russian Federation and their mutually in reinforcing attempts to undercut the rules-based international order run counter to our values and interests. More bluntly, the NATO posture review, not nuclear, Na U.S., sorry, NATO, excuse me, the U.S. Nuclear Posture Review asserts that by 2030, the, uh, 2030s, the U.S. will, for the first time in its history, face two major nuclear powers as strategic competitors and potential adversaries. The danger, if this situation is not wound down through diplomacy, this could mean that the Pentagon will seek out an even larger nuclear arsenal, perhaps as large as Russia and China's combined, in the expansion of their arms race, particularly as North Korea Putin plays the North Korean card. The possibility of a closer Russia-China uh, strategic partnership was not previously part of U.S. and NATO strategic vision. I, I, uh, in my many encounters and talking to U.S. officials and NATO officials, they always talked that Russia and China were moving farther and apart and didn't see the formation of an alliance. There are obviously tensions between Russia and China in the Far East and in Central Asia but they're being downplayed by both sides in a marriage of convenience which is being pressured, in their view, by NATO on one side and the U.S., Japanese, and now the AUKUS alliance on the other. 
So here, it is crucial that the EU begin to make, take the lead in policies that most impact it. Greater autonomy, as was mentioned before, and it's very important for that. Uh, this will mean a, re a potential restructuring of NATO to provide a greater European voice, if not a veto. After Brexit, which had been backed diplomatically by the Trump administration, the EU is concerned of Russian efforts to splinter the European Union. It will not be difficult for Moscow to play or pretend to play through propaganda upon intra-NATO and intra-EU disputes and tensions using both traditional propaganda and social media while also threatening cyber sabotage. Many disputes can be played upon by Moscow. I mentioned the Greek and, and Turkish dispute, but certainly the higher uh, agricultural and fertilizer prices, energy prices, uh, the migrant crisis between Italy and France. These are all issues that can be played upon by Russia to, uh, to um, create dissidents in, in domestic opinion. So in conclusion, it is time for the US and EU to form a transatlantic strategic council that goes beyond the new US and EU Trade and Technology Council that met for a second time in mid-May in mid -May 2022 in France. This council is a positive step in the right direction, but it's not sufficient to deal with the tasks at hand. The new EU council, the Te Trade and Technology Council, does deal with issues surrounding digital economy, artificial intelligence, internet surveillance, hacking, disinformation, data governance, climate change, clean technology, alternative energies, access to critical rare minerals, semi-supply chains, export controls to Russia and Belarus, trade challenges, and food security. So it's a broad list on, the, on this uh, agenda of the, of, the, um, of the Trade and Technology Council. But I would argue that what we need is a larger, uh, a council with a larger mandate, a strategic council, that will better uh, coordinate the overlapping and multi-dimensional geostrategic, technological, political, and economic, and domestic sociocultural crisis and conflicts in which the U.S. and EU are both confronted. Ironically, the war in Ukraine can serve as a catalyst for this greater strategic cooperation that seeks to strengthen Franco-German European unity in an effort to resolve these major crisis disputes and challenges. And here, to be specific, NATO's new force model of 300,000 men that is to be deployed as early as 2023, as this force is to be primarily formed of European troops, it raises the question as to what extent the Europeans themselves will have a say in NATO's deployment of these forces. Issues such as sanctions, which are more impacting Europe than they are the United States should be European priority, not American priority. As I said, th these are all these issues that need to be debated mutually, not to the exclusion of NATO, but in a way that gives the Europeans a greater role. But, but to do that, the Europeans themselves must be, begin to find a, a, a path towards a, a greater, a greater unity and consensus in their opinions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor. We have a huge challenge ahead, uh, ahead yes. of us. Yeah. Um, I would like to start the session of a uh, question and, and answer. Would you, would you have uh, some to be addressed to uh, all our three speakers? Can we start with maybe uh, Benedetta, if uh, she is ready to answer questions on uh, the uh, strategic concept? Ah, le micro, micro, micro. Thank you. Thanks. It works. Thanks to the three uh, presenters. My question goes to Benedetta, but maybe uh, Jezina Hal wants to, to look at it as well. I have two questions. One is you mentioned that Russia is no longer just on the eastern flank, but it is also present elsewhere in the southern flank and sub-Saharan Africa. And I was wondering what role you see for NATO in handling that uh, challenge or threat when it materializes in Mali or the Central African Republic. And I'm thinking here, of course, at both cooperative security, 
but also crisis management and what is now called uh, crisis prevention and management. And, uh, and second, um, what's your take, and again, Benedetta, but others, uh, and uh, Jezin, you, you dealt with European states, your take on what the Ukraine war says about the division of tasks between NATO and the European Union. Mm -hmm. One possible interpretation is that it clarifies who is doing what, um, i.e. NATO deters and defends, and the EU sanctions and funds, uh, which could be a convenient way to look at the cooperation between the two institutions. But I was wondering what, what is your take on, on this, and of course the, the narrative, the language of the strategic concept is very positive, as expected, but we know that in reality it's a bit more uh, complicated, and I suppose that question could also be addressed by the, the other speakers. Merci, grazie. Um, thank you, Thierry. That's a lot of um, really good questions. Maybe let me start with the uh, with the first one, which is NATO's role in countering uh, Russian uh, uh, interference, malign interference, and uh, in the broader neighborhood, and with a focus on uh, you mentioned especially the Sahel region and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, the roundabout way I'm going to start with is that. Uh, I think with the, uh, you're exactly right that we reframe the way, the way to think about crisis management by adding the war prevention, which is telling, I think, in, two, in, 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 in at least a few ways. One is, of course, this is a reflection uh, that we had as NATO, but I think as the broader international community about the efficacy and sustainability of large-scale nation-building efforts and on how much are we going to able to willing or and or able to do that in the future and i think uh, because the general answer is not that much <laughs> that we are much better served to focus on capacity building training work on prevention which means really uh, partner partner led partner enabled approaches to stabilization so I say that because that applies very much to the way we are looking at our work in our southern neighborhood at large, the Middle East and North Africa. Um, I'll, I'll get to Sahel in a second because, as you know very well, NATO is not present as such in that region, uh, with the exception of Mauritania, so we'll get there. Um, the approach is very much that of how do you work with regional partners to do training, to do capacity building, uh, to enhance their own skills to be at the forefront of the security challenges that they face and then impact us. Uh, when it comes to countering uh, malign interference, uh, we are, I think, taking some positive steps, working on cyber defense, working on countering hybrid threats, working more on thinking how do you approach the issue of resilience with partners as well. So there are some stepping stones. This is, by the way, also an area where I think there's great promise for NATO-EU cooperation because we have shared interests, different tools, but definitely a, com a common interest in stability in the broader neighborhood. With the, with, uh, with the Sahel example, uh, uh, NATO's role is quite limited, and that, of course, is down to, like everything else that happens uh, in NATO, being a, not a supranational, but a multinational organization of sovereign nations so it depends on what our allies wish to see as our um, priorities in terms of operational footprint. Uh, so the, the focus there is really on the training and capacity building with Mauritania, which is our, uh, our partner, from the, at least from the mid-90s, if I'm not mistaken. But over the last few years, there's been a step up in terms of resources. And just at the last summit, uh, we were able to approve a new capacity building package for the country, which really has some, I would say, bolstered tools when it comes to cyber defense, when it comes to, uh, to, to training on uh, countering hybrid threats, counterterrorism, of course. So, so there is an element there. Uh, that said, I will also be very, um, I'll be quick, but at, at the same time, I'll also be very clear, at least from where I see it, when it comes to broader challenges related to stabilization at the intersection between conflict, fragility, uh, external interference, and strategic competition, that the approach has to be whole of international community. NATO plays an re essential role uh, by working on the security defense side, but that's not the whole answer to that question. There's a lot more that is needed in terms of political development, uh, political reforms, and all of that are not 
uh, issues that will be tackled by NATO as an organization because others are better tools and we have a very clear mandate. Um, so that's a little bit on that. Uh, blah, blah. What else did you, you ask a really good question about NATO EU. Oh yes, NATO EU. Uh, <laughs> is the Ukraine, uh, is the war in Ukraine a prescription for a future division of labor? You know that the word division of labor uh, is a little triggering in a NATO context because it tries to uh, predict what the future will be like, which we don't know. That said, I think that the past few months have shown how the two organizations can complement each other, uh, utilizing their unique skill sets. And definitely, uh, as you mentioned, there's been uh, the regulatory power of the European Union, the coordination on sanctions, that's really important. Um, now the efforts to uh, speed up joint, uh, joint procurement and acquisition, which would also be very, very welcome in the context of the fragmented European defense industry, as long as it's done in a way that doesn't create, uh, th that remains interoperable with and, and available to NATO and open to third party uh, participation. Uh, so you have all that and, and then you have of course NATO uh, leading on the, on the defense, deterrence and defense on the, on, the, on the military side and as the backbone of the defense of Europe. And I think that works really well. But I think we also need to understand, and, and I'll stop here, that there are intersections between these two, uh, these two processes. For example, uh, one, when you mention, when you talk about uh, the uh, ability to coordinate sanctions, that's absolutely true and it's really important. Uh, I, would argue, I would argue that had we not had months of intelligence sharing, political consultations, building mutual situational awareness within NATO, between Europe, uh, and by Europe, because the word Europe is used a lot, and I don't want to be unpopular, but Europe means the UK, it means the European Union members, it means Norway, it means for us, Europe for us is bigger than, than, than just the EU, although the EU is a part of that. Uh, so for me, the coordination and the political consultation that you had with European allies, the UK, Turkey, Norway, the United States, and Canada, on understanding what was happening with respect to Russia and its intentions towards Ukraine. And the follow-up, this political discussions that we have were instrumental in then making sure that both through NATO and through the EU member states were able to move quickly. We had the same language, the same toolkit, the same shared assessment that would not have been possible. So in other words, yes, the vision of labor, but the, polit the, the transatlantic convergence can only happen uh, where you have everyone at the table, and the place where you have that at the table is remains NATO. So that's a non-surprising response for me, but it's also what I think it's true. <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Mark Madai. I'm from University of Warsaw. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists for, for presentation. However, uh, with a short comment, I would like to have a question to Benedetta Berti and to, to uh, Jezini. Uh, oh, sorry, Weber. Weber, yeah. Uh, so, first of all, uh, I would like to say that I am delighted by the uh, strategy, strategy concept, because you are one of the authors. Mainly because it's the shortest one in the po uh, from all <laughs> done, done I'll take in the it. post. It's a compliment. I'll take uh, it. But it's, it's good because uh, earlier we were often, let's say, too overburdened with too much issues. However, on the other hand, uh, I would like to ask because the strategy, strategy, of course, we are talking about three main core uh, tasks, but at the same time, one task is uh, definitely bigger than the others. And what for me as a Polish citizen is, is totally okay and Polish analyst, but that's the preferable option for me. But nevertheless, uh, it means that the two others, that is especially cooperative partnership, and, and cooperative security and, and crisis management are, let's say, half a page of, of strategy, literally speaking. So it shows uh, some kind of uh, uh, relevance of that issue. However, con concerning uh, the third one, that is partnerships and cooperative security, and what you sa have said, for example, about uh, limited presence in, in the Sahel. The problem I, I see, uh, also already uh, um, exercised by EU, that when you do a train and equip uh, model in the Sahel, for example, with G5, you end with uh, Wagner Group uh, as an alternative option for Mali and, and the Central Afri uh, African Republic. 
Therefore, to other, in other words, do you think that after, let's say, limited successes of such approach by EU, is it really a good idea to go the same path as far as NATO is concerned, even if the other option is simply not being present at all or being in, in very limited uh, way? So the, that's, let's say, a specific question concerning that part, even if I fully understand and fully support the fact that we should focus on collective defense, in my opinion, at least nowadays. Uh, concerning uh, what uh, Jazin was said, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you again as a Polish citizen that you mentioned Poland as a key players, which you won't speak about, but player, so I'm happy about it. I know that it's just because of circumstances. By the way, I think that unfortunately it was, we won't be, let's say, concerning Polish positions rather for psychiatrists, not for political analysts concerning the, uh, let's say, a bit twisted logic of, of current poli Polish defense policy and mm. Polish government, but that's putting aside. I would like to ask you a bit uh, about uh, uh, that idea of equilibre, which you mentioned in context of France. What exactly, it, in your opinion, it could mean in practice, because it, thinks, it seems to me a bit hard to operationalize that kind of approach when you are part of an ally and key player in this ally, no matter what you uh, what you think about, uh, about uh, uh, sorry, in the alliance and, and key player in this alliance, how to be a really equilibrium and to what degree it would go into, sorry for to speak and I hope no, no offense from French side, but how can it go into Turkish model, which is also a bit a model of, of looking for, let's say, balanced approach to, to uh, NATO partners as well as to Russia and that's something probably which should not be, let's say, copied, in my opinion, at mm. least. Uh, so how, how that equilibrium idea should be, in your opinion, understood? Thank you. Do you, you want to go in yeah. reverse yeah. order? I definitely will not take the last two, so they're okay, definitely yeah. for you. Then I'm, uh, happy <laughs> to take the then I'm happy to take that question of, um, the, um, of how France conceptualizes that idea of being a puissance d'équilibre or the equilibrium or the balancing power. Um, the thing is that um, this, again, I would say is very closely linked to this idea of European strategic autonomy and autonomous decision making. So um, this concept of puissance d'équilibre means first and foremost that you don't blindly follow a strategic doctrine that isn't your own. So for France, being an ally of the, ally of the United States, of NATO, means that particularly in the Indo-Pacific, you're not just doing what the US is doing and you're not blindly adopting uh, U.S. or copying U.S. strategic doctrines and interests as your own interests because these might diverge from the uh, French interests. So it's first um, the question of definition of interests and second it's also um, about what you do. So um, when for example um, the U.S. say okay um, if there's an invasion of Taiwan for us that also means defending Taiwan with arms then the question is, um, let's say in this case of example of puissance d'équilibre, that would mean, for instance, yes, of course, France remains an ally of the United States, but that doesn't trigger an automatism that because your ally is working or is um, providing a certain kind of military support that France has to do that as well. So it's um, really defining your interests and it's also particularly, we've also, for example, seen that with Macron's um, exchanges with Putin, which I know have um, triggered sharp criticism in uh, Poland and the Eastern European states. It's also about keeping channels of um, dialogue open where they do not um, necessarily continue to exist between um, emerging blocks or between uh, the blocks. So just because your ally, the United States, currently is not able to have, let's say, an exchange with Russia, that doesn't mean for France that you cannot try to exchange um, with them. And the same also, um, to some extent, um, or applies to the Indo-Pacific and China, although we see a softening tone in the last three, four days with the G20 in Bali and so on between um, the US and China. But um, I think overall, what um, as far as this uh, equilibrium power or uh, balancing power concept is concerned, 
it's going to be very interesting, in my opinion, over the, yeah, even over the short term, but particularly over the medium term, in how far uh, the EU as such is going to adopt this approach. Mm -hmm. um, also, for example, when we look at Germany and its relationship, uh, and particularly the upcoming China strategy, which will be published in the first semester of um, 2023, it's going to be very interesting um, whether Germany is going to align very much with US strategy or just to some extent. Um, I think that rather the second one is going to be the case because um, we see an, a rather converging discourse in France and Germany on a certain reluctance of the emerging uh, emergence of blocks in global order. So, um, but I think it's also that what puissance d'équilibre implies that you try to um, build multilateral coalitions instead of um, falling into a um, bipolar um, order of blocks. Yeah, um, maybe, yeah. I, maybe I can answer okay. the other yeah. one on uh, crisis management. Sure. Sure. Yeah, um, right, so uh, firstly, uh, I think that it's, it's undeniable that there was a strong focus on deterrence and defense as one of as the backbone of Article 5, as the backbone of our collective defense uh, commitment. So the phrasing was really, we do we have one job, it's collective defense. You need three things. Um, defense and de deterrence and defense today is uh, given a premium uh, role because that's the security environment we live in. That's number one. But number two, and I think that's something that it's important to also understand that the idea is not to push away the other task, but the reality is that for roughly 30 years, we didn't think about deterrence and defense. So this, there is a lot more to say about it because we kind of let it, uh, uh, we didn't let it completely um, go into disuse, but if you looked at how we structure our Air Force models, our training plans, for many years, we didn't put a premium on that, and now we need to. So there is a stronger emphasis because we are catching up. Whereas I would say on, on the other two tasks, we have a pretty robust idea of what our role is and what we want to do. Uh, as I say, for the crisis, for crisis management, we remain the, the priority is you want to be able, if there is a crisis, to have a coordinating structure with command and control that can sustain the deployment of multinational um, operations, including a strategic distance. So that you want to maintain. But your emphasis today, it's not going to be on that. Your emphasis is going to be on territorial defense of Europe and on investing in our prevention toolkit, which links crisis prevention with the work on partnerships. I will not comment so much on the Sahel because I like to stick to things that I more or less understand well, and I wouldn't say that I am an expert on that particular region. But I will d take your point about uh, is train and equip a good idea? And I will say, well, you're looking at the Sahel case, but let's look at Ukraine. Yes, it can be a very good idea. <laughs> I think that uh, one of the points we make in the strategy, NATO is making, and one of the areas of increased focus is, if you want to invest in prevention, you need to work more with partners. If you want to work more with partners, especially in our neighborhood, we need to think about what is our added value. And that's one of them. Uh, NATO doesn't do train and equip. NATO does train and others do train and equip. But the point is, yes, if you look at all the efforts that NATO, um, the EU, NATO allies uh, made since 2014 on Ukraine, now let me be clear, the military victory goes, the credit goes to them and to their fighting and to their creativity, to their heroism. But it's also true that the Ukrainian army looked very different in 2014. Mm -hmm. So to me, that is actually one lesson I take from this is we should, con we should think very much about uh, how we can use uh, our training, capacity building efforts to shore up vulnerable partners in our neighborhood. We should think about broadening that, not just to military, but also to the resilience element. And that's, again, an area with NATO EU is very important. So, so to me, it depends really. But uh, ultimately, when it comes to, to assistance, security assistance, yes, it can make a difference. Uh, if it's done, if it's done right, and also depends on the absorption capacity of who you're working with, of course. Uh, so that's I, there's not one size fit all. But uh, I would, I when it comes to our, I'll close. When it comes to our partners in our neighborhood, uh, think Georgia, think Ukraine, think Moldova. I would do more, not less, provided they want, because that's the only way it works.
There's someone here, and then. No, yes, uh, good morning. My question is for Mrs. Weber. Um, Could you we, introduce yourself, yes, sir, yes, please? Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, I'm uh, Huijun Kim. I'm a banker, uh, but I trained at uh, IHDN, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, the industry uh, also collaborates with the military uh, so, so for, through training. So my question relates to the fact that you mentioned uh, the emergence of uh, blocks. But uh, when it comes to European defense, can we say that uh, we really failed to create a European bloc as far as uh, well emergence of a strong unified uh, uh, industry? European, we have large groups and very strong groups, but uh, well, we see that uh, it's all a matter of uh, money and budgets as well, mm -hmm. and will because in the end of the day, isn't the the objective of Europe to be able to defend itself and to invest what is necessary to do so, while on the international front, well, uh, France has a very large uh, interest in uh, in the Pacific, but uh, first invest what is necessary on the political and, and the budgetary front to be able to defend itself. I'm not sure that uh, when we look at what's happening at the doors of Europe, we are able to do so. Uh, while, uh, unfortunately, when it comes to to uh, playing uh, flexing muscles uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, Europe cannot do that. Yeah, um, I answered answer directly to that. Thanks for that question. Um, I would say, um, or I wouldn't go so far and say that we have failed simply for the reason that um, a fail would be an endpoint and would in my opinion, mean that you don't move on again and um, the machine is still going on and Europeans are moving on. So um, I would say uh, Europeans have not failed to build a block, but they could definitely still do better and they have to do better um, if they want to be able to hit or to address the challenges that um, they are facing geopolitically. So um, I think or I wouldn't offer the most optimistic perspective on that. Um, I think we see two um, trends at this, at this moment, which are not directly going in the same direction. On the one hand, I think that we see um, really a willingness on um, the European level, um, in terms of the level of the Commission, and initiatives coming from Brussels. Um, that really show that there is a willingness to do more common investment, to invest better. There are many, I would say, good strategy papers on the table. But in the end, the question is really where the member states put the money. And when I see where particularly Germany is currently putting the money, the, um, that is uh, 35 uh, F-35 right. fighters fr uh, from the US. Um, and Germany argues that this is a short-term decision and this is um, just a reaction to um, the war in Ukraine and um, that it might potentially rather focus on producing European in the future. Honestly, if you buy 35 F-35, these are going to make up an important share of your stocks in the next years. And that um, will be taken into consideration for every question that um, concerns compatibility of systems and so on. So um, for me, this um, was, not the, um, was not the best decision when it comes to building a European defense uh, industry, um, to put that politely. So um, yeah, the question, and we also see, for instance, that um, EU regulations or proposed regulations on common procurement are now increasingly opened for systems that are not produced in the EU. So we are moving a bit away from this um, by European, or what could have become a by European. However, I think we also have to keep in mind that um, it's, yeah, it's also about really the compa compatibility of systems and not only investing more, but also investing better. So I think there is still hope that um, the Europeans could coordinate better, but that really has to be the priority in the next two years. Or, and um, I mean, the strategic con compass lines that out. And there are also synergies between um, 
institutions and formats that we see with the NATO, uh, with Diana, and the EU initiatives. And that really has to be the priority now if Europeans are serious um, about their um, ambition to defend themselves and to build also an industry that is able to provide the capabilities that they need. And for that, I'm very um, grateful for the comment that you made, um, Professor Gardner, at one point, saying that it's important for the US basically to be supportive of European defense. Um, because um, let's be honest, a strong US push would be very beneficial to the EU, uh, to the EU or European, even in a broader um, defense industry. May I add to that, sorry, uh, that's F-35 is precisely the issue. The U.S. and the EU should have discussed these, what kind of arms and what, what was really necessary, how to better divide European and, and U.S. interests. It's, it's not in the U.S. interest just to, to con even though it's money interest for the, the Lockheed, it, it doesn't, it's not the strategic, necessarily the strategic interest of the United States. So these have to be balanced and discussed. It's not happening. Uh, just very quickly, uh, just two points. First of all, to ease you, uh, F-35s are interoperable. They are. <laughs> I mean, it's NATO, right? Yeah. It's, NATO is the backbone of European defense, so F-35s are completely interoperable. That's not the problem. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sorry to be unpopular in the room, but I think it's also important to remember that there are 27 EU member states that have different understandings of what's the best way to ensure European security. And for many of them, the answer is the transaction. Atlantic framework and NATO, so they I mean, so they see uh, EU efforts on defense and security as an effort to complement and accelerate uh, the European pillar within NATO, not as a substitution. So in that mm -hmm. sense, they don't see any reason why they should uh, they should diversify uh, away from a transatlantic. Uh, it may be something that it's not popular to say here, but it's. If you travel to Tallinn, Warsaw, mm -hmm. uh, Copenhagen, Helsinki, and I can continue, the view is different. Mm -hmm. So it's just a reality. So but, just, but, just but. to substitute. <laughs> so when we say Europe, we also need to be uh, quite honest with ourselves of which European countries are we talking about, because there's not one view at all. Yeah, but, but the reality is US policy is shifting towards Asia, which puts a greater weight on Europe. That's the problem, and, and the U.S. and NATO have to come to an adjustment to that reality. Um, China and North Korea are major threats. It, it controls the whole sea lines of communication from Asia to the, the Middle East. Um, control of Taiwan by China will uh, allow China to dominate the, the world economy. This is the real issue, and uh, if we don't reach a compromise with China, we will be in a new Cold War, or worse than a Cold War, as I've said, it's not a Cold War, and, and this requires the Europeans to rethink their strategy vis-a-vis -vis both the, uh, Russia and the, United uh, and the United States and to uh, find some sort of compromise. And say, but, but again, working with NATO, not, not against NATO, but, but NATO has to rethink its, uh, its European uh, uh, pillar uh, in, inside the alliance, particularly if, we're, if NATO is promising or hoping to, to deploy 300,000 troops in, by 2023, and they're mainly European troops and not coming from the United States. And um, if I may um, add something to that, um, I think the conversation here is getting quite representative of the um, debates that are um, also being uh, held on the political yeah. level. Yeah, but um, maybe to um, add something to that, um, also from this um, perspective of the EU and also an argument, of course, that is I mean, coming quite often uh, from France here. Mm -hmm. um, this is that um, the EU has proven um, its capability to step in at some points where NATO cannot. And I think what is very important is to see that um, you have all these common financing projects in the EU and all the funds. And um, I see that actually as a major asset for NATO to say, okay, we have uh, quite an overlap in membership, so let's make sure that we have um, all the EU member states that are also NATO member states um, doing their um, procurement and armament policy together. Let's make sure they are all on the same track. Let's make sure we have good plug and play solutions with the other European, um, with the other European allies. I mean, that is already all on the way. So I would say giving them, an, the, those who are also members in the EU, giving them an extra nudge to use um, the formats that are already there, mm -hmm. to use the funds of PESCO and EDF, mm -hmm. 
Um, that is really the thing that needs to be done now because that can then um, also lead to a stronger European voice um, overall in NATO. Just a little point of order. Normally, we would have had a little pause. We are going to sauter because, in fact, at 11h15, Camille Grant will be able to intervene via Zoom. So, we will continue to ask questions if you have any objections, in order to make sure that everyone can benefit from the questions that are being asked. Yes, please. Thank you. 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 Bonjour, good morning, uh, Cynthia Saloum from the NATO Defense College. Uh, it's, it's a very short supplementary question, I'm sorry uh, for that. Uh, the question is actually maybe going to continue the political discussion here. What is your perception on European positions on German rearmament? How do you see Europeans uh, think and react uh, to uh, this fact or necessity? Do you want me to answer that? Yeah, maybe you want, maybe you want to take yeah. a couple? We can take the second oui. question as well. Um, so this is, so, sorry. this is more an operational question. Uh, Could you introduce yourself, sir? So hi, I'm uh, Dan Henry. I'm a colonel with uh, 20 years of special operations experience. Um, this is a question for Dr. Bertie. If we look at uh, collective defense now, we've been reminded of it. We are reminded that we have to fight across all domains as a complete force. For the past 20 years, we've been door kicking and doing counter-terror operations. We have a special operations school. We have several CIMIC centers of excellence. At what point does NATO decide that actually we need a, a partnership and training school and we need a partnership and training standing force to avoid mm. uh, units being dragged from all across NATO and Europe uh, into uh, fighting proxy wars, which are basically defusing Russia, China, which then creates gaps for Russia and China to be aggressive, because our best guys aren't, you know, we were on the ground for a very long time, but if we hadn't had the time period uh, operational in Ukraine, uh, and we're very proud of, of the training we gave, mm -hmm. if we hadn't had that time period and we hadn't developed uh, a number of different operational plans that could be just taken off the shelf. Uh, we would currently see Russia on the border of Poland. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. at what point does policy become operational? Two different questions. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I'll, I'll take, uh, I, I, I'm sure uh, Cynthia's question I can take in the break, <laughs> 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 offline. Uh, this one, I mean, it's a really uh, crucial question and I would say uh, two parts. Um, on the, our own homework as, 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 a, as, a, as a force structure, as our defense planning, I think this, the, glove is, the glass is really helpful here. Uh, meaning that the, this reset back to do deterrence and defense really started in 2014, uh, at least mentally. Mentally after Crimea, we started the process with the enhanced for presence and then with the, with the with writing new defense plans, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know the story. Uh, I think that it did bear fruits in the sense that had we not done all of that after in February 2022, there's no way that we would have been able to activate those plans within hours. As you say, they were already off the shelf, but also they've been exercised, they've been discussed, we've been talking about it in terms of understanding the politics. Um, so that's good, and it also allows us to have a qualitative step forward in our deterrence and defense. We're going from four to eight battle groups. We're increasing the presence, uh, thinking multi-domain, and then taking the decisions for the future. I'm skipping a lot of steps because I know we don't have a lot of time. So I think on that, the, the story is positive. Whether we'll get, the mistake would be to want to see a full transition from a essentially a tripwire to a forward defense approach within a couple of years, because it's not gonna happen. These are generational shifts. I was, uh, because I'm a little bit of a Cold War nerd, I was looking at, in terms of the Cold War, it took about 20 years to establish a full, a full uh, forward defense in West Germany. About 20 years from political decision to doing it, because it's expensive, it takes time, it, it requires restructuring your forces. I'm not saying that we're gonna take 10, 20 years, but what I'm saying is, 
in relatively short period of time, I see that there is real progress. The main uh, question for me would be whether we uh, really implement this strategic shift, meaning it's all about our mindset. We need to reset our mindset, especially Western Europeans, in terms of taking our defense, territorial defense, much more seriously. If we're able to do that, then we'll be able to spend enough, we'll be able to, to acquire the high-end capabilities, and then we'll also, we'll also get, get, get there. So it's still very much, I'm optimistic, but it's a work in progress. And the second part is, will we think more uh, systematically about the uh, training uh, and capacity building uh, element of this? Yes, we are. We are trying to, there's, we have done this uh, over the last uh, few years with the NATO 2030 agenda. It is really about uh, having a more structural and strategic approach to how we do training and capacity building, which does include uh, enhancing our um, how do I say it? Well, it's the NATO command structure to have an element that does exactly what you're suggesting. So we're going there. Um, and I think Ukraine, again, is galvanizing, is showing, is showing us that these are good investments. Investing in training and capacity building is not a distraction from uh, uh, doing deterrence and defense. It can complement our deterrence and defense. So we're working on all of these things. So the supplementary question then is, is that really driven from the top down from NATO, or is that partner nations that are being driving up? It always needs to to tango. You can never do that. When it comes to training and capacity building, it has to be partner country. Uh, one partner needs to listen and We both have to. Like when you work on, when you go in a sovereign country to do training and capacity building, we are not, uh, we're not, uh, we're not Russia. We don't coerce, we don't force. We no, go I'm according to. Internally, as a, I don't want to, do the, I'll, I'll close the back and forth because otherwise, as you know very well, everything we do at NATO is at 30. So without consensus, you don't do it. And yet we do a lot. So we, man, so we, we are quite, uh, quite skilled at getting consensus. Uh, uh, that's, that's the job. It's not always easy, but that's the strength of the alliance and it will never work any other way because uh, we work on issues that are uh, so inherent to the sovereignty of our countries, defense and security, where of course we'll always have to take decisions by consensus. So yeah, that's that's how it works. Yeah, I'm happy to um, take Cynthia's question on the European perspectives on German rearmament. I wouldn't directly call it rearmament, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I would rather say uh, it's addressing capability gaps that have been building up over decades. And um, then we st still have around one third of the special fund um, for multilateral products. So I would say first, let's really manage expectations towards what Germany can do. Um, and then I would say that overall, or when like this um, massive investment was announced, we saw two tendencies or two um, basically reactions. The so one was great, finally Germany is doing its share. Finally Germany is leveling up to where it has to be and finally Germany might have helicopters that actually fly <laughs> instead of um, yeah, being on the ground because they don't have enough people to repair them or because they are just in a very bad state. And the second one was, okay, what does that mean for the balance of power among Europeans? And what does that basically imply for uh, Germany's role in Europe? Is Germany going to become um, the EU's most capable military power? Admittedly, I don't think so, because it's really about um, addressing capability gaps. It's about um, buying ammunition. It's about um, buying very simple things at the moment, like, um, yeah, like clothes for the, for the soldiers, um, like having, for example, um, bulletproof vests for women that actually fit, um, instead of having them wear the ones for men because they don't, um, because they don't buy the right ones. It's really about like that level of defense investment that we are talking about at the moment, and um, I think that is also something that pretty quickly infused the reflections of European allies. So um, I have the impression that we are now pretty much at a wait and see phase. So after a phase of um, initial enthusiasm, 
and um, also optimism that um, Germany might potentially, or that this um, German decision might potentially also have a positive spillover effect on others. Now it's pretty much about a wait and see, particularly also from the industry side, because we have this announcement of 100 uh, billion to be invested, but when I talk to industry, industry tells me, okay, basically we don't have so many contracts that have been concluded, and at the moment there are basically no new contracts that are being concluded from the German government. So, um, and I feel that there's also, or this, this is already being re recognized in the other capitals, and that there is, pretty much disappointment coming in now that things are going so slowly and um, that after this huge announce, um, things are basically pretty much staying the same and you are addressing the gaps but um, not taking any form of leadership. Marco Simon, pour le lien avec... Okay, we have Camille Grand uh, on the Zoom. He uh, is uh, just arriving from Washington in, in Brussels and uh, is uh, going to talk about, uh, as you may uh, guess, defense investment. Mm -hmm. So let me give you just a brief uh, bio of uh, Camille. Camille is now working for the European Council on Foreign Relations uh, and, and he's a distinguished policy fellow after being for six years the former uh, NATO Assistant Secretary General for Defense Investment. He previously held the position of director of the Foundation for Strategic Research. His research and publication have focused on defense policy NATO, nuclear policy, and missile defense. He was also deputy director for multilateral issues and disarmament in the strategic affairs, security, and disarmament, di sorry, directorate of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. He holds various academic degrees in international relations, defense, and contemporary history. Uh, he, in addition to that, he has also completed the training of the Diplomatic Institute of the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Previously, he was an international affairs advisor and deputy diplomatic advisor to the French Minister of Defense, and he was also responsible for nuclear policy and non-proliferation at the French Ministry uh, uh, within the Delegation for Strategic Affairs, I should say before he was an associate researcher at the French Institute of International Relations. Camille, good morning. The floor is yours. And thank you so much, thank you so much for accepting to talk to us uh, uh, given your very constrained schedule. No, thank you very much, Evelyn. Thank you, thank you, thank you all, uh, and uh, a lot of apologies for not being uh, with you. Um, I am. I literally uh, landed from uh, Washington an hour ago, so I. I uh, um, it was a bit difficult to be physically in two places at the same time, in spite of NATO's uh, technological edge. Um, uh, the uh, my. Um, uh, so, first of all, let me thank you uh, and thank uh, Yersem, Jean uh, Marjorie, Jaivin, and and and, uh, and and the NATO Defense College. Uh, uh, I see Thierry in the room uh, uh, to for having me uh, deliver a speech today, even uh, remotely. I really uh, uh, would have liked to listen to the, the whole debate, and I'll try to do that so, throughout the afternoon. But uh, it's it was uh, it's just a pity not to be there in person. Um, um, let me maybe start with a, a couple of comments on, on the, 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 the theme of, of, the, of, the, of today's um, uh, uh, seminar, um, of today's uh, uh, colloque. Um, first of all, and I'm sure that this is something you've been discussing this morning, but um, I think we should not underestimate how dramatically uh, altered uh, is the strategic landscape in, in, in Europe. Uh, uh, and uh, I, uh, there is an image that I've been uh, using recently, which I think does capture uh, uh, something, uh, at least uh, uh, to, to help uh, especially Americans understand how deep is this transformation perceived uh, by the Europeans. 
I would, uh, I do argue that the 24th of February is a bit, uh, uh, is more significant for the Europeans and for European security than 9-11. The Russian war in Ukraine is really uh, changing the security environment in a, in a very, very deep fashion. Um, uh, it is the, the comeback of a major uh, conflict in Europe, um, a major uh, inter-state uh, conflict in Europe. Um, in, in many ways, uh, this is uh, um, unprecedented. We have a major nuclear power pursuing imperial ob objectives in a nuclear shadow. Uh, uh, those of you who are familiar with the a nuclear debate uh, uh, might uh, note that it really uh, is a scenario that was uh, more envisaged, uh, uh, that, that scenario of aggressive centralization was more envisaged uh, for uh, proliferators than for any uh, for major uh, power. Um, the second thing is the, the extreme violence uh, of this uh, uh, of this uh, of this conflict uh, and. Uh, the violence in the, in the battlefield, uh, uh, the um, losses that we've been seeing since the beginning of the conflict uh, um, uh, uh, that are, of course, are hard to document, but the, the, the figures that uh, uh, are generally agreed in the tens of thousands of uh, 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 combat losses of, uh, 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 and, and of, of killed soldiers on, on uh, probably both sides um, are also uh, unprecedented in Europe since World War II, um, and this is something that is uh, extraordinarily uh, um, uh, impressive when thinking about that. If you add to that, um, and especially these days, uh, the, the um, uh, a massive aggression on civilians, on civilian infrastructure, um, and the uh, uh, nature of what we is probably uh, um, uh, war crimes and, and, uh, and certainly a violation of laws of war um, uh, is, is something that is uh, really uh, uh, demanding, uh, and we have that we collectively have to think through, even if we are not um, um, immediately bordering the conflict, uh, which only makes things more acute. But I think that that's that has been a wake up call, and, and, and I heard the last part of the, the panel uh, uh, as, as uh, really. Uh, created a, a completely different uh, moment uh, across Europe. Um, so what does that mean in, in terms of strategic assessment? So we do have a Russia that does pose a strategic challenge in, in multiple domains. Uh, we've seen it is in this in the conflict uh, uh, in, in the land war, but uh, this uh, challenge does exist in the maritime domain, in the air missile and drone threat, and there there are uh, direct lessons to be learned from this conflict that we really have to uh, uh, collectively uh, assess, and second, um, cyber uh, um, uh, and hybrid uh, uh, attacks, including on infrastructure, um, is, is something that is uh, uh, important to take into account. Um, I think the, the cyber dimension of this conflict is an interesting uh, element of the of the conversation, especially in a context in which. Um, uh, I think we will need to fully assess the cyber dimension of this conflict, including the involvement of uh, uh, private uh, companies in, in support of Ukraine. I think this is the, the, those are a lot of lessons to be learned from a technological uh, standpoint uh, there. And there, I, I would uh, invite you to look at the, the uh, uh, information released by a company like Microsoft on, on, its, uh, on its support to Ukraine which both helps um, understand better the nature of, of the cyber uh, conflict that, that uh, has been ongoing uh, and the, the role of, of uh, such companies. Uh, the, the problem is that, is that from a geopolitical standpoint, the other threats have not, uh, or challenges have not disappeared. Uh, there is an enduring instability on NATO's southern flank. Um, uh, terrorism is, not, uh, uh, is still uh, present. And um, uh, it's something that was recognized during the uh, last NATO summit and in the last NATO, uh, NATO strategic concept, uh, the, the rise of China, uh, which is, of course, a threat of a different nature uh, than, than Russia, uh, is also, uh, is also to, be, to be taken into account because it is, a, um, as the European Union puts it, a bit of a systemic challenge for, the, uh, for, for, for all of us, um, uh, and that uh, the, these efforts, the 
there is a de very deliberate effort to counter what is um, our traditional Western uh, technological and strategic leadership. And um, make no mistake, you know, China might seem a bit of a remote threat, threat seen from uh, from the Euro Atlantic area, but uh, there, there is Chinese presence in, in very multiple ways in no direct environment. So, what does that mean? Uh, for uh, for NATO and what are the technological um, implications? And here, let me um, jump for for a minute in some of my uh, previous uh, responsibilities uh, that are relatively uh, fresh. Uh, probably, I, I need another uh, ten days to be fully out of the uh, out of the conversation. Um, uh, the uh, uh, which is to the, the fact that. This war is not a war that is uh, simply, um, you know, I think it's too easy to describe it as a as a war uh, that goes back to the World War II or World War One practice, which sometimes um, uh, uh, so some some commented that that way. Uh, there there are, there are also a lot of innovation. There's a, a lot of innovation ongoing. We need to capture that uh, completely. And in a way, the, the Ukrainian successes on the ground are also based on, on, on innovation, on tactical innovation, on uh, uh, smart use of, of, of technologies, uh, but also on the fact that they are operating under uh, modern uh, command and control, uh, under uh, arrangements, under uh, they are making the best possible use of, uh, of, of uh, intelligence, that they are uh, capable of uh, a uh, much higher degree of coordination that uh, seems to be the case for the Russian uh, forces. So, uh, going back to NATO for a second and to the theme of, of today's um, uh, event, um, I, I guess uh, the, the, the challenge for NATO is first of all to really recognize uh, uh, how are we going to prepare uh, for um, uh, 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 multi-domain operations. Um, uh, so, so to have this ability to integrate uh, uh, the three traditional domains, uh, cyber and, sp and, and outer space, that have been recognized by NATO as domains of operation in a, in a, in a single information environment that will enable um, uh, uh, a super, uh, at much faster pace of operation than what we've seen uh, 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 previously. So this is uh, going way beyond uh, simple interoperability or the, the, the ability to have mutual support. This is uh, uh, through um, uh, multi all domain or multi-domain operations, what the Americans called um, joint all domain um, uh, um, operation, the uh, JADO, um, uh, and that has been recognized in the NATO environment as multi-domain operations or MDO. And this is extremely uh, demanding. Uh, there are <coughs> uh, uh, scenarios, uh, uh, for instance, that could involve uh, uh, integrated air and missile defense that are that re that have uh, come with requirements on that. Uh, so, and this is where you you do inject uh, the role of, of data, the role of um, uh, artificial intelligence to bolster your ability to conduct uh, uh, such operations and to to uh, operate uh, in in this. Um, uh, uh, in this new and demanding operations uh, of, uh, of um, uh, uh, fully um, multi-domain uh, warfare. Um, uh, the Allied Command for Transformation is playing a critical role in this um, and uh, 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 in, in developing both the concepts uh, and working on the technology uh, that will uh, eventually make a difference uh, tomorrow. That leads me to my second point about those technological implications, which is the need to preserve our technological edge. Um, I think the, this has been always a critical asset for uh, the West, uh, for, for NATO allies, um, uh, and there, uh, but uh, the novelty is that that technological edge is challenging. It's not challenged across the board, um, uh, meaning that it's not in, in every single uh, domain, but it is challenging in, in several uh, critical uh, or sensitive uh, areas, uh, and uh, 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 when I say challenge, it doesn't mean that necessarily um, you know, potential uh, uh, competitors or adversaries are uh, necessarily ahead or clearly ahead, but they are uh, certainly uh, competing with NATO on that, and in certain specific areas, um, especially for China, potentially a little bit ahead. 
which means that we need to do uh, 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 multiple things to make sure that that does work. Um, uh, so for that, uh, what we uh, I would I would note two uh, strengths of work. Um, one of them is obviously to prepare for the future. Um, uh, and on that, one, one initiative has been uh, to the investment uh, uh, in innovation uh, and the establishment of a, um, a dedicated agency, which is the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, also known as DIANA, uh, which uh, really uh, aims to, to uh, bridge a gap uh, that, that is my uh, uh, former colleagues from the, the uh, Emerging Security and Challenges Division that, that uh, developed that uh, concept, uh, which is really aimed at, at uh, offering a, a new construct uh, that will be um, facilitating uh, innovation and bridging uh, the gap between the military um, requirements uh, and the science and technology community, by, and also bringing on board new, new players. Uh, that have not necessarily been working uh, with NATO uh, previously. Uh, the second thing is really to work on uh, uh, this issue, on, on those major programs that will allow uh, those multi-domain operations. Um, uh, this was more of my traditional responsibilities. Uh, those programs, uh, whether we're talking about the Alliance Future Surveillance and Control Program, which is the replacement capacity for, for the AWACS fleet, uh, whether we're talking about um, uh, the future of air C2, uh, 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 whether we're talking about uh, um, um, the command and control of uh, ballistic missile defense, um, uh, are programs that um, uh, uh, have been around for many years in some instances because NATO has had a tradition of investing in command and control, but um, have been uh, and command and control uh, tools or uh, joint uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capacity. But in that particular case, um, uh, though, uh, and here I'm referring to the line ground surveillance of so the um, NATO fleet of uh, global hawks that has been uh, in, in service for a few years and, and plays an interesting role in the um, uh, context of the uh, uh, war on Ukraine. So, what I uh, wanted to point there is that those critical major programs uh, are those that are going to make a difference by enabling NATO to be um, more capable uh, uh, than, than uh, potential adversaries. They now need to be brought together and, and also uh, thought in 21st century uh, terms uh, by adding a layer which we, we call the uh, 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 Digital transformation of the alliance, which is a, a, a very, very ambitious um, effort that we've uh, embarked into since the Madrid uh, summit, um, uh, that, is, that is involving both the uh, Brussels headquarters, but also um, the, um, and very importantly, the uh, strategic uh, commands and uh, the agencies, which is to really bring uh, NATO into the 21st century in, in terms of the digitalization of its um, operations, including in support of multi-domain operations that I already uh, spoke about at length. Uh, so that, that is a, a tool that will be um, uh, this digital transformation uh, from a, a military colleague uh, of mine uh, um, uh, noted that this was uh, as important to the 21st uh, century as the NATO common structure was in the 20th century. It's just to uh, uh, stress how important this is. And this will have to be supported also by extremely innovative solutions uh, coming from um, uh, 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 artificial intelligence and, uh, and, and, and a, a very data-centric approach uh, that will be uh, relevant. Um, uh, uh, so all of this is, is, a, is a, a very significant transformation, which is supported by uh, the fact that there is additional um, uh, common funding available to support this, these developments, um, uh, and also will require a, a, a transformation that goes way beyond technology, because it is also a transformation that will require a, a very, very um, uh, uh, important transformation of how we operate now the, 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 the force uh, that is um, uh, at the center of what we, we do here. 
the integration of all domains will also need to be uh, completed by the full integration of cyber and, 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 and space operations. Uh, there, I would argue that uh, for the time being, we've uh, uh, have had a, at NATO a bit of a, of a decision in, in principle. Um, uh, now we have to work on the actual implementation of the, the whole thing. So with this, and, and, and also uh, wanting to keep a, a, a moment for uh, questions, if, 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 if there are any um, uh, to be a little more part of this conversation, uh, let me say that, um, uh, in conclusion, uh, that the, the issue of the, the technological edge for the Alliance uh, is uh, uh, not necessarily granted, but is, an absolutely, is absolutely critical. So we really do have to, to work on that. A second thing, which is more of a political issue, is I think there is work to be done on the NATO-EU relationship when it comes to these issues. Uh, you're all um, uh, probably familiar with the, the efforts undertaken by the European Union with the establishment of the European Defence Fund um, and other uh, initiatives uh, aimed at um, uh, bolstering uh, uh, defence technology uh, across, uh, uh, across the European Union. I think there we need to, to um, uh, find ways to uh, mark more closely together. Um, the, 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 end, the, the point there is that I think one of the lessons of the, the recent uh, 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 crisis, but also of, uh, of the, the technological environment, is that probably no ally has, no, has the solution alone. So it is really important to be able to, to wear, uh, uh, work on that. And the third conclusion, to which I already alluded to, is I think there is a, a good uh, work to be done on um, uh, how do we, um, uh, what lessons do we draw from, from, from the war um, uh, uh, on Ukraine. And there, uh, uh, I, I would argue that there are enormous, an enormous range of, uh, uh, um, of, uh, of lessons to be, uh, to be learned. Uh, from uh, very uh, uh, tactical operational lessons uh, to broader um, uh, strategic uh, uh, lessons to be uh, um, uh, to be drawn from this um, conflict, um, uh, ranging from uh, the use of uh, man-man systems, uh, by by the way, both belligerent um, in the battlefield uh, or as a as a tool uh, for for. Um, uh, 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 targeting uh, infrastructure uh, uh, to uh, the, the um, uh, use of, of um, integrated and uh, uh, air and missile defense capabilities by the Ukrainians, which has uh, consistently denied uh, air, air uh, dominance by, by Russia throughout the conflict uh, quite successfully, um, uh, to uh, uh, the use of um, uh, long range uh, fires. Uh, throughout the conflict uh, 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 by both sides. So uh, uh, without uh, sounding uh, too cynical, uh, uh, there, there, I, I would argue that there are a number of them. Um, uh, we, we are seeing uh, uh, a, a live experiment in the battlefield of many of the discussions that um, uh, you will be probably having and that we've been having um, when, when looking at these issues of technology and transformation of warfare. All that. So on, on, on this note, uh, and uh, again, renewing my thanks to, to, uh, uh, to, to the organizers uh, um, and giving a, a good, uh, nice uh, uh, salute to my former NATO colleagues that are in, in, in the room um, uh, or, uh, or connected. Um, uh, let me just uh, um, stress in closing that there are, there are many of these issues will be uh, on our collective plates, uh, whether we are researchers or uh, 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 um, uh, uh, academics uh, or uh, uh, officials uh, in NATO, uh, EU, and, and uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the capitals uh, there. So uh, I'm, I don't know if you, uh, Evelyn, I'm in your hands. If you wanted to open the floor for a few questions, I'm happy to take them. Uh, I just hope that my um, uh, uh, lack of sleep didn't make this uh, 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 intervention completely incoherent. Um, uh, uh, that's why I did uh, write it before delivering it. Um, uh, but uh, I'm very happy to uh, to take any questions you might have from from the from the room or the team.
Thank you so much, Camille, for uh, giving, us the, giving us this presentation. I'm sure that we have quite a few questions, and I understand that Thierry may be the first one to uh, intervene. Well, first, uh, thanks a lot, Camille. Merci beaucoup, Camille, for spending some time wi with us this morning, given what you uh, that you were in the U.S. Um, until very recently uh, on behalf of IRSEM and the NDC. Thanks a lot. You ended with um, a few lessons from the Ukraine war and crisis. And one of the lessons that we are collectively drawing is the importance of the, the human dimension, um, the societal dimension, the resilience, the human capital, and how the Ukrainian people <coughs> has been able to fight as a force but also as a society. So technologies matter, and uh, it was your portfolio until recently, but the human dimension equally matters. And I was wondering what is your take on how NATO, uh, you left NATO recently, but uh, how NATO can help uh, foster uh, this human capital in NATO uh, societies so that uh, when there is a need to resort to force, uh, it's not only technologies that are going to be ready, but also the the, the human dimension, uh, resilience, and capital that are equally important. Thank you. Um, merci Thierry. The, 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 it's a very good question. I, I think that there are two um, there, there are two sets of issues there. Uh, um, uh, one of them is uh, uh, I think the conflict in Ukraine does shows the importance of resilience uh, in a whole of society approach. Uh, uh, and uh, there, uh, it's going to be very interesting what our new um, uh, Finnish and Swedish allies bring to the to the conversations, because they've had a, a, a well-established tradition of uh, looking at what they call total defense and things like that. So, so a whole of society uh, uh, element. Uh, and I think we uh, we are testing this at the moment. We are testing it uh, ourselves uh, on a, a what I would argue is a, a, a reasonably light uh, version uh, with the, uh, the, the uh, energy crisis and the rise of the price, uh, the inflation and all sorts of things that are uh, to a degree um, coming from the, as a consequence of the conflict. But more broadly, in, a, in, a, in an environment where there is an open conflict, there is a, uh, a need to indeed think through how does or uh, how our society is able to sustain this? Uh, what uh, and then I would I would draw uh, two lessons and come to your your point about what can NATO and, and other organizations do about this. Uh, the the first point is that I think we collectively did better than I would have anticipated. Um, you know we are nine months into this conflict with the uh, um, gas supply to Europe essentially uh, cut. Uh, um, uh, and and the, this um, uh, uh, the, the, the sustainability the, the, of uh, uh, of the support to Ukraine uh, is uh, still there uh, across uh, Europe um, with nuances probably but it is there uh, and uh, uh, so of course the uh, atrocities committed by the Russians uh, um, help uh, keep uh, everyone everybody's mind uh, focused but. Um, the, the fact of the matter is that the, uh, the, the Europeans are standing together, the both sides of the Atlantic are essentially on the same page, uh, and this is uh, uh, ongoing. The second thing is that indeed there are lessons to be learned because we probably have forgotten in Europe what it actually means to be engaged in a conflict. Um, and again, there are very, very few European countries that are prepared for that hypothesis. So, so there, there is a need to, to do things. And thirdly, uh, I think, and there, um, there is a role uh, for uh, uh, both uh, uh, research institutions but, uh, and organizations as NATO to um, inform the, the public um, uh, on what does, that has been a bit surprised by uh, this, uh, uh, return of war in, on the European uh, soil uh, on such a large scale. Uh, uh, and so there there is a, a, a role, and again, this is not a matter of uh, propaganda or, uh, uh, you know, uh, preparing uh, uh, the 
public opinion. Uh, the public opinion is very diverse, very uh, is changing across across Europe. There are um, uh, diverse threat perceptions. Uh, this is very obvious. But more broadly, to maybe go back to a form of um, uh, society resilience, you're, you're at uh, l'école militaire and. Uh, uh, the, for instance, the, one of the, the roles of the um, uh, uh, has been to, to, to foster the, what they called uh, in the old days, l'esprit de défense and all of that. Uh, so here again, um, uh, it's not necessarily going back to all solutions, although we do have a number of European countries that, for instance, reinstituted uh, conscription. Um, I'm, not, I'm not recommending this across the board by any means, uh, but it means that um, somehow uh, enabling our publics to have a better sense of uh, what does that entail uh, uh, to, to uh, uh, fight a, a significant conflict or to face a significant conflict on our borders is something that we need to think through uh, uh, and probably be a little more uh, engaged into that conversation uh, in our diverse capacities and to, to, to um, uh, help um, and I, here I'll take an, uh, uh, an example that I've, I've faced both under my NATO hat not so long ago and, uh, and um, as, a, as a, uh, a, and back in the, the think tank environment. Um, the nuclear dimension of this conflict is, is uh, uh, creating a lot of uh, anxiety in the public uh, and, and, and uh, creating uh, tons of questions from the media. Uh, what, how do we address those? Uh, and there it's really a matter of how do we bring together uh, that, that those conversations in order to uh, enable our, our publics to um, be um, not range from one extreme to another. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, the fear of an immediate nuclear war or a, a, um, a lack of understanding of the, the, uh, of the fact that this is uh, now a distinct, uh, that the nuclear use is, is not uh, uh, as, as uh, impossible as it might have seemed uh, uh, not so long ago. So there, there is a, uh, uh, there is a work to be uh, done and to be completed. And, and I think that is something that is, uh, uh, should be part of our uh, collective uh, role and thinking. And, and again, there is not a a univoke solution provided by uh, NATO or the ministries of defense. It's more of a, of a societal debate that I'm, I'm advocating here. Any other question? Uh, we have one. Please, um, Kami, um, Professor Gardner. Hall, Hall Gardner. Um, NATO has proposed a new force model of 300,000 men. Is that in, in happening? Is it where are these men are going to come from, and uh, how does that relate to the NATO EU relationship? Because I assume most of these men will be coming from European uh, countries. Well, uh, the, uh, uh, um, uh, Benedetta might want to jump in on the NATO hat, but uh, uh, the, uh, let, let me uh, let me just uh, uh, maybe elaborate a little bit on this. Uh, first of all, this is a work in progress. Um, uh, uh, and in a way, it's been work in progress since 2014. So, so what I would stress here is that since Crimea uh, uh, and the, the first Russian attack on, on, on Ukraine uh, in 2014, there has been a lot ongoing at NATO. Uh, not always visible, not always um, uh, public, but the transformation of our force posture has been very, very significant uh, over time. And that transformation is, has been accelerated uh, uh, since uh, last uh, winter, uh, a little before um, uh, the, 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 the uh, 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 Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, uh, so we, so, that, so the, the first point is really to have in mind that this new force model is the sort of um, evolution uh, uh, that really started uh, from uh, uh, the mid, uh, uh, the, to about eight years ago, from a NATO that was essentially exp uh, uh, expeditionary, that was uh, uh, that viewed uh, the collective defense uh, scenarios as extraordinarily remote, uh, uh, and that therefore was not necessarily building a force structure, 
uh, that would enable us to do that. Now coming to this new force model, um, the, the the issue is uh, is a is, is uh, it's not purely a matter of numbers. There are one what, what about 1.2 million soldiers in Europe only, uh, in, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and and some um, uh, and if you add the, the uh, North American forces, uh, you can uh, you can. Uh, uh, almost uh, the double those numbers. Um, uh, the, the point uh, here is how, what is the degree of readiness, combat readiness, robustness of this, uh, 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 of, of a significant portion of that force, uh, including on the eastern flank, um, uh, 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 with a significant portion that is now deployed on this eastern flank. Um, uh, we've seen enhanced forward presence moved from a relatively light, uh, rather tripwire function to forces that are more combat ready, that are not necessarily, you know, uh, moving from uh, battalions to divisions, but, uh, uh, but are uh, much more capable of uh, playing a, a direct military role in the event of a, of a, of a, of a, of a of a of an aggression or a, or a crisis, uh, so which which is very important uh, 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 signaling in terms of deterrence and defense. Uh, the second thing is that for the first time since the Cold War, there have been more forces under Sakyo's command, uh, which is a um, you know a bit of a uh, an untold story uh, because uh, you know that happened very very quickly in the spring. Uh, but there is, I think it's more than 40,000 troops that are um, uh, under uh, Sakyo's operational control. And the issue is how many more uh, should be in this new force model um, uh, 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 ready and capable uh, to play a core uh, role in the um, uh, uh, especially collective defense scenarios. Uh, by being at the right level of uh, readiness and and um, and capabilities, uh, and this is the the whole in intent. So again, uh, we're not. Um, uh, uh, and I was uh, uh, um, uh, listening to uh, Gézine making the point that um, uh, the German uh, uh, process is not so much about the rearmament uh, uh, or an arms race than than. Uh, um, uh, and uh, enhancing and, 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 and enabling the, the Bundeswehr to, to reach what is probably the right level of, of uh, readiness and, and ability to, to conduct its missions. This has been a problem across the board. So, so many allies uh, uh, meeting those readiness requirements, uh, this ability to combat, to, to, to uh, uh, conduct high intensity warfare operation, are very are the very demanding scenarios. Uh, let's be honest about it. Uh, partially because uh, some of our allies had gone uh, expeditionary, and 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 to be clear, because NATO was asking for it, you know, to, ten or twelve years ago, being a good ally meant uh, having um, uh, um, um, a, a couple of combat groups uh, ready for deployment in Afghanistan or or uh, or, or elsewhere. Um, uh, that is, uh, now we, we've created uh, requirements that are uh, quite different and in many ways more demanding. So this is the, this is the whole point. Um, this makes sense and will have to be connected with the effort conducted by the strategic uh, commands and by ACO uh, in particular uh, to uh, establish the right set of plans uh, that uh, you know, will make, will define the posture better and there, therefore uh, will connect it to the force model uh, and the force structure that, that will be uh, uh, um, uh, appropriate. So altogether, um, uh, the, the point, and, and this is why I'm, I'm cautious with numbers, um, uh, is that the point is not to say we're moving from a NATO response force of 100,000 to a, a new force model of 300,000. Uh, it is uh, uh, it is much more about um, uh, the readiness, the uh, nature of the combat we're preparing for, the more integrated uh, approach. And here I connect to my point about multi-domain operations, um, uh, the ability to react in a swift and 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 um, uh, manner to any contingency, 360 degrees. 
um, and all of that. So all of this, you know, if you start adding all these things, uh, you create, you do create new requirements, uh, and this is something that we we will have to we will have to do, uh, and that we we've undertaken uh, uh, as NATO. Um, uh, but that sort of follows a path that was, you know, there were the first major decisions we were taking in Warsaw in 2016. Have been there has been very significant decisions since. Uh, for instance, there was a decisions to have uh, uh, the so-called 30, 30, 30, so the 30 battalions in uh, on, on a 30 days readiness, um, uh, which was a big uh, project of Jim Mattis when he was Secretary of Defense that he pushed really hard on allies. And again, it, it's very interesting because you, you say, uh, how how can could we be in Europe uh, with not 30 battalions ready within 30 days, uh, and for those 30 battalions, 30 air squadrons, and 30 combat ships. Uh, uh, and the, 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 the sad reality is that it proved uh, that relatively low bar proved quite demanding for a number of countries uh, to meet. And now we are pushing that further um, uh, to take into account the new environment uh, and to recognize that um, uh, having uh, forces that are uh, relatively light uh, is, is uh, probably insufficient. In that context, and I land on that, there is a specific role for those countries on the eastern flank uh, who, who uh, 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 are bringing a, a large portion of that force um, uh, and, and cooperating with those allies that are forward uh, stationing um, uh, and deploying uh, uh, additional capabilities there. But the issue of how do you integrate that is also very, very important uh, so that um, uh, typically, I don't know, the Polish forces are not operating in, in a vacuum separated from NATO's forward presence uh, there. So, so that's, that's also part of the effort. Thank you. Didn't answer my question. Yes, sir. Um, Dan Henry, um, in terms of Diana and the innovation fund, Obviously, NATO is a, a supranational body and it's focused on far future uh, technologies. Is there ever going to come a point where the NATO Innovation Fund is actually looking at actively solving the urgent operational short term needs that, that we're seeing that have arisen in, uh, for instance, the Ukraine war, and, and before that it was the Syrian war, and before that it was Afghanistan? How? How will the role of innovation and innovation funding within NATO evolve, do you think? Well, it's, uh, uh, first of all, and then uh, I'll be, I'll be uh, very honest, uh, this is a, a work in progress, uh, meaning that we still have uh, collectively uh, as an alliance um, to, to sort of find and uh, fine tune what the exact role of Diana will be. So I'm, I'm, I'm just being, uh, uh, this is, uh, you know, the, uh, in one of my last uh, meetings at NATO was the um, first board of Diana, uh, uh, and that was in early October. So, so and the uh, um, uh, managing director has not been uh, yet appointed. So we're, we're still talking about a construct that is that is uh, very much work in progress. Having said this, I think there is a, a, uh, um, uh, a very interesting idea behind it, which is to say, okay, what can we do uh, to do that? And and an effort which I hope will continue to be to not necessarily position Diana as some sort of, a, of a, an innovation hub that uh, works on innovation in a vacuum, but something that is really connected to military requirements and demands, and probably finds its best niche in the global innovation ecosystem by focusing on um, uh, where uh, it can make the biggest difference, at least in my view, uh, which is uh, uh, um, in the um, uh, sort of a, a, a desert valley between a smart ID being uh, somewhere uh, and its operationalization and deployment in the force. So that could be through uh, facilitating experimentation, for, through putting the funding that helps moving from a technology to a military development uh, and all of this. 
Um, I would certainly hope and, 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 and have recommended that um, a focus on, on immediate on some immediate requirements uh, is uh, is also part of, of NATO's efforts on innovation, whether it's through Diana or through the efforts of the Allied Command Transformation. Um, uh, I, I do believe that uh, um, we've had some uh, modest but uh, uh, interesting successes uh, um, uh, in the recent past. Uh, in in uh, 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 counter UAV, for instance, technology where we've done some good work, um, uh, and there I, I I very much believe that there is a um, there is room for a, for a tool uh, uh, like Diana and for a use of the, those funds in to meet quasi uh, immediate operational requirements. Uh, so you identify a problem. Uh, you turn to uh, the, the innovation community, you do have a tool to fund this under uh, a mechanism that are not the traditional uh, uh, um, uh, contracting because it, it, that allows um, uh, to, to take uh, uh, more risk and to engage uh, 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 diverse solutions. And hopefully the loop is short enough that you do make an operational difference uh, within months, let's be realistic, uh, I'm not talking about the days or weeks there, but uh, rather within months than in, in a traditional development that would take uh, several years uh, there. But that requires uh, probably, Diana, to focus on a, 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 uh, that very specific moment at the junction of technology and development uh, and with a, a laser focus on, on uh, military requirements. Um, uh, which is going to be, I, I, I would argue, the, the, the challenge for the, the team uh, there to identify such projects and to work hand in glove with the uh, uh, military uh, uh, while engaging as well the tech community uh, on those innovative solutions. So, so this is, you know, the, the, again, uh, there, in all innovation efforts, there is, there is no magic formula or single uh, model, uh, uh, but. Uh, it is uh, quite clear uh, that um, uh, it could um, it could make a, uh, the, there is a potential to make a, a difference, uh, uh, but that will have to be uh, tested over time. And I'm sure uh, that uh, if um, uh, the, the Diana team manages to uh, uh, secure some uh, uh, good successes in the early days, there will be more appetite uh, from allies to be to use that tool and to fund the mechanism. Thank you so much, Camille. We feel we are very privileged to have listened to you talking about your, uh, your perception of what's currently going on, on the uh, possible lessons learned from the, uh, Ukrainian, uh, the, the conflict in Ukraine. And uh, we really uh, would like, uh, you know, on behalf of uh, NDC, IRSEM, and all the people in the room, to thank you very warmly for the uh, uh, efforts you, uh, you've made to be present at 1115 mm. shop, coming back from Washington, and in delivering a speech which has uh, opened up bright, bright, br broad horizons, even if they are not that bright. And um, we have, uh, especially to me, it has been important that you've said that uh, basically we need to accelerate the tempo of reaction whether it's with industry or in operation. So I think it's a, it's a message which is very important. Um, I have been following NATO for, for 30 years now, and I think it's the first time we, we really have uh, this in mind so clearly. Thank you so much, uh, Camille. Uh, uh, we will be talking to you over the telephone. Bye bye. Thank you very much. Thank you all for, for being here and thank you for this kind invitation and have a wonderful uh, day in Paris then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I have another announcement to make. We have uh, the possibility of uh, a lunch in uh, one of the uh, Rotunda uh, salons. So uh, if you feel like uh, joining us for the lunch, uh, you are all welcome. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. We are uh, almost about to resume this conference. Allow me to present myself. I'm Cynthia Saloum. I come from the NATO Defense College, and I'm very pleased to be here at the IRSEM, an institution that uh, hosted me as uh, an affiliate young year researcher at the very beginning of my research career, and that I, uh, that I have uh, very close and dear to my heart. Um, I am here to uh, moderate a very important session within today's uh, uh, conference, and it is about the technological stakes in NATO's strategic concept. And I want to say that I hope that we will not only talk about that, but focus on the technological stakes for NATO at large and, and the Allies. Uh, and I am sure that uh, our three uh, guests uh, will uh, deliver uh, interesting brief and uh, uh, food for thought. Our first briefer on my right is Dr. Antonio Calcara. Uh, he is from the University of uh, Anvers, uh, and I'm going to give you a few words about his background. As I said, uh, he's a researcher at the University of Antwerp. He teaches at Sciences Po Paris too. Uh, he uh, focuses on the crossroads between international relations, international political economy, and security studies. Uh, and his specific focus is on European defense industrial issues. He's published in International Security, a Review of International Political Economy, Security Studies, and, and other journals. Uh, he won an Egmont in European Security and Defense uh, uh, College uh, Prize. And uh, we're absolutely delighted to have him in order to cover uh, a first uh, topic on technological complementarity between NATO and the EU. Uh, our second speaker is my dear colleague from the NATO Defense College, uh, Dr. Gilli. Andrea Gilli is an Italian senior researcher in military affairs at the NATO Defense College in Rome. Uh, he's also affiliated to the Center for International Security and Cooperation at uh, Stanford University in Palo Alto, California. Uh, he holds his PhD from the European University Institute, uh, but he also studied in the London School of Economics uh, and in the University of uh, Torino. And he focuses on issues that are related to international security, specifically uh, about uh, military technology and innovation. He's going to be talking to us about the increased role of industrial uh, partnerships. And uh, last for this panel, but uh, not the least at all, I'm very uh, pleased to have with us uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lucie uh, Liversin. Pardon, je cherche mon... Voilà. Uh, Lucie comes from uh, the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. She's actually a doctoral candidate, so uh, soon to be, uh, uh, at the Center for Management Research at the Ecole Polytechnique uh, à Paris. Uh, she's a graduate of the Ecole Normale uh, Supérieure, quite an interesting mix. We were talking about this earlier. The Ecole Normale Supérieure and Polytechnique gives a two different type of formation, is, is uh, very impressive but also an Associate Professor of Economics and Management. She is uh, pursuing a doctorate uh, at the Center for Management Research at the Ecole Polytechnique, and her work uh, is in collaboration with the Centre Indisciplinaire des Études pour la Défense et la Sécurité, uh, and she's taken uh, to the heart of the problems of integrating innovation into armament operations. Her specific focus uh, this afternoon will be on budgetary constraints and capabilities sufficiency, we will be all ears. <laughs> With that, I won't take more time of uh, the speaking uh, uh, time for panelists. We are going to be starting with Antonio. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks Thanks a lot for the for the invitation. I also prepared some slides. I don't know if I can share with you. So if anyone is the room yeah. in the room is able to come here for assistance to show the slides, thank you very much. Mark was there. Uh, Christoph is coming oh, as well. Christoph. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot, Mark. Sorry for bothering. Okay. Is this one? Yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot. Um, thank you for the, for the invitation and thank you to the IRSM and the NDC for this wonderful organization of this, of this event. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, really. So I have two main objectives with my presentation. So the first one is to present the state of the art when it comes to NATO and EU complementarity 
on emerging and disruptive technologies. So I will just focus on emerging disruptive technologies because this makes me makes my life easier when it comes to compare two very different animals like NATO and the European Union. So NATO is a military alliance and the European Union is a, is a political union where there is also transfer of some authority, especially when it comes to trade and some innovation policies. So in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I will just focus on emerging and destructive technologies. And then hopefully what I want to do is to try to make a step forward. So try to understand what are the right incentives to, to innovate. So the, the central argument of my presentation is that the first thing that we should do is to try to reflect and to capture innovation when it comes to emerging and destructive technologies. And then once we are able to capture innovation, it will be easier to make the NATO and EU agendas more compatible or to try to create some synergies and, and, and so on and so forth. So let me briefly give a super general overview on what NATO and the EU are doing when it comes to emerging and destructive technologies. So NATO identified nine priority areas that range from artificial intelligence, big data, autonomy, quantum, biotechnology, hypersonics, space, novel materials and manufacturing, energy and propulsion. At the same time, NATO is developing uh, very new and important initiatives. I will some of these initiatives were already mentioned in the morning, uh, like the NATO Innovation Board and the, the, the new Diana uh, framework that tries to work directly with entrepreneurs and with startup in order to generate innovation in, in security and defense. There is also the NATO Innovation Fund, so the idea is to give one billion of sort of venture capital fund for startups and small and, and small and medium enterprises that are trying to innovate in, in, in defense. The EU is doing something pretty similar, actually, because they identified six priority areas. And if you can see, like, we are talking basically about same technologies. So if you talk with NATO or EU uh, policymakers, I think you will have a pretty similar answer when it comes to what are the critical uh, uh, technologies of, of the future. Uh, so we have artificial intelligence, again, quantum, robotics, big data, hypersonics, and, and, and so on and so forth. And also in the EU, they are developing new and very important initiatives, like the European Defense Fund that was already mentioned this morning, also the Observatory on Critical Technologies, and the new, uh, very recently proposed defense innovation, innovation scheme. So is there complementarity in between the EU and NATO when it comes to developing critical emerging, emerging and destructive technologies? Yes, when it comes to the general principles. So both organizations, they recognize that technology is an essential component for success in defense, okay? I think there is, there, is a, there is a consensus on this. Again, there is a similar list of emerging and destructive technologies. So we are really talking about the same, the same things. And then both recognize that we need to open up our relationship with different players, like private and, and commercial industry. I'm sure that Andrea will, will cover this, this angle la later on. There are also some points of frictions when it comes to stuff-to-stuff -to -stuff, uh, interactions. Uh, there is some interaction between the NATO uh, ADT roadmap team and the European Defense Agency, but probably more should be done in order to, or to create some sort of joint task force in order to make sure that we are, uh, that we are uh, align our, our agendas when it comes to emerging and destructive technologies. Uh, some people say that there is a, a bit of fragmentation of efforts because there are also different forums, like the, this morning was mentioned also the USEU Trade and Technology Council, and they also talk about artificial intelligence and new technologies and so on and so forth. Probably there could be some overlap Right, so the EDF well, between, for instance, what the EDF is doing and the, and the Diana will do from 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 next from next year. Uh, I would say let let's start from the positive points because I think that all the negative we can solve all the negative all the negative problems if we if we start to reflect on how actually to generate and capture innovation in the digital age. Okay, so complementarity is easier when there is more innovation. So our, the first thing that we should reflect on is how to produce more innovation, how to capture innovation when it comes to, um, to, to, security, to security and defense. So the question is, are we sure that we are providing the right incentives to innovate, especially are we sure that we are providing the right incentives to the private sector in order to make them innovate in emerging and destructive uh, technologies? So I will provide a very super simple 
three models of innovation, like two models that are related with the industrial age and one model that is related with the digital age. And I will argue that all the technologies that we are talking about, that NATO and the EU are, technology, uh, and the EU are, are talking about, are actually related with the digital age. Okay? So in the, in the industrial age, we had basically two ways of generating innovation. So the first is the classical, here on the left, the classical vertical integrated model, right? So innovation was produced within the company, so within the R&D labs of the, of the company. So the best and the brightest people were hired directly in the company in order to produce innovation, right? There are many examples of this, I don't know, Bell Labs, the EBM research, Xerox uh, research lab, and so on and so forth, and they produced very new and, 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 innovative, and innovative, innovative things. Then there is a second model, that is related with the classical value and, 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 and supply chain model. So there is a focal firm or a systems integrators that tries to absorb innovation from other suppliers, right? And innovation is produced within this sort of vertical relationship between the focal firm and all the different, and all the different suppliers. So if we want to sustain more innovation in the industrial age, we need, to do, we need to do very basic things, right? So in the first, in the first model, we should probably protect or try to protect our vertically integrated firm, right? Or to try to subsidize them or to use some forms of industrial policy tools in order to uh, make them protected and more competitive, to hire, best, uh, to hire the best people and to innovate more, right? In the second, what we can do is to, or to protect the systems integrator or to try to specialize, right, in some of the different some of the different niche that you that you have that the, the suppliers are are, are are producing. Okay, this is this is this is quite simple in in, in, in principle. Of course, it's 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 already very it's it's already very difficult to to implement. But the challenge that we have now is even more difficult because actually right now innovation is produced by continuous and horizontal feedback loops between different types of actors. So you have the focal firms, for instance, the big tech, the big giants, and so on and so forth. There are also platforms, complementers, and also the end users that are producing innovation. And this feedback loop between these different actors at the end is the one that produce, produce innovation. And I will, I will give you just a very simple example of, of innovation in the digital age that is related with cloud computing. Right? This morning we mentioned that big data and artificial intelligence are really, really important. And cloud computing probably is one of the technologies that will enable uh, NATO and the EU to, to, produce more, to produce more innovation when it comes to security and defense. If you look at the innovation ecosystem in the cloud computing, is there are many, many actors, I would say. So there are the cloud providers that are really the big giants. Right? So there is Amazon Web Service, Microsoft, Google Cloud Computing, and they produce innovation through a continuous relationship between those who provide the physical infrastructure, so those who build submarine cables, those who build the data centers, and so on and so forth. Continuous interaction with the software industry, especially open source communities. So Amazon Web Service and Google Cloud Computing, they are both part of open source communities in the software industry. They both use uh, like OpenStack or other different platforms in order, to, in order to innovate. And even Microsoft had to open up their ecosystem to Linux in 2014 in order to generate innovation in cloud, in cloud computing. And then the end users, so those who use and buy the cloud, service, uh, the cloud services are those that are actually producing innovation. So Amazon Web, Web Service has a continuous interaction with very innovative end users, for instance, Netflix. And they adapt continuously their, their offer to what, to what Netflix or other, or, or, other, or, other, or other end users need, right? So the challenge that we have is, is, is really big because this is quite different from the previous models of the industrial age. And this is very different from what we are used in the defense industry. Right, which is a, which is a very close way, uh, close ecosystem ways of, of 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 innovation. Right. So, what is the first implication of this? So, our objective should be to try to unlock innovation ecosystems. So, to give the right incentives to all these players to work together. Right. And we we need to make sure that we are not giving them the wrong incentives. So, if we start to subsidize one of these actors, actually we can give them the incentives to close their ecosystem, 
right? Because they are protected and they don't need to operate with, with others. So our goal is to really to bring all these actors, to bring all these actors together so to nurture innovation ecosystem. The second implication is that we need to involve users all the time. This is crucial in, in defense. Like military innovation is defense is also produced by the ones that are using that, that, that innovation. If you look at how uh, software, for instance, in the F4 or in the F16 of the United States was continuously updated, Lockheed Martin basically used also open source communities and they involved the US pilots in order to improve all the time the, 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 the software of the F4 or of the F16. So we should do this. We should not forget that users are the ones that should be involved in every step of, of defense innovation. Especially in the EU, there, are, um, uh, there, is, there is a debate on this triple helix between government, industry, and academia. But let's do not forget the, the users because, again, innovation is produced by this continuous feedback between these these, these actors. So the way forward is, I would say the first point is to stop creating new initiatives and new institutions. We did a lot in the past two years. So now our job now is to make these things work, right? So I understand that there is, there, there could be also the political incentives to always create new initiatives, to create new labels and so on and so forth. But I will argue that we have all the right instruments in order to generate innovation. Now our goal should be to bring all these actors together. And also to be pragmatic, I have heard today like the classical old debate between EU and NATO, F-35, the Rafale, and so on and so forth. I will argue that when it comes to destructive and emerging technologies, innovation is in NATO is beneficial for the EU and vice versa, right? So once we are able to capture this innovation, I'm sure that will be also easier to complement and to create synergies between these two organizations. Okay, thanks a lot for the, for the time and looking forward for the Q&A. Thank you very much, Antonio, for this. Uh, we're gonna move to uh, Andrea's uh, presentation and it's gonna be complimentary as you're gonna look at uh, partnerships precisely. So go ahead, please. Yes, so thank you for, for being uh, here today. Thank you to Yaksem for uh, the, uh, the organization. Actually, I was here as well at the Colmini Third during my PhD at the Centre de Documentation pour, uh, pour faire mon uh, thèse de doctorat. Mon français n'est pas uh, improved, as you see. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to uh, say a few things, and probably it's going to com be complementary with what Antonio just said. Uh, I don't have PowerPoints, so I hope it works regardless. Mm. So the first thing when we talk about uh, industrial alliances, let's uh, try to nail down uh, uh, a three main issues, uh, which are the three main trends which are affecting the industrial evolution and technological evolution. The first is the rise of complexity. The second is the increasing role of software. And then I use a buzzword, which is disruption and innovation. So I nailed down, uh, I got a bit more in depth in these three uh, realms. The growth of complexity. Modern weapon systems are way more complex than 100 years ago. 100 years ago, an airplane was at uh, two sensors, the eyes and the ears of a pilot that were the sensors. Nowadays, uh, you have beyond visual range sensors, uh, which data fusion, so you take and use a lot of data coming from different angles, even other, uh, other platforms and put together. The end result is that to develop uh, like the dreadnought battleship before World War I, uh, it took two years to uh, Great Britain. This was probably the most complex weapon system ever invented. Nowadays, uh, the next generation uh, frigate, destroyer, submarine takes 20, 25, 30 years uh, just to, to make uh, uh, a comparison. Increased number of, co of components, increasing interactions, obviously much more uh, performance. Software. There's uh, an important, important, probably fundamental uh, article on the Wall Street Journal published in uh, August 2011 by Mark Andresen. Mark Andresen is one of the most important venture capitalists in the Silicon Valley. And, uh, and the title is Why Software is Eating the World. And that's really crucial because since then, software has basically entered every single industry and domain. There is this famous quotation, some of you may be familiar with, uh, from Tom uh, Goodwin who says, uh, Alibaba is the biggest uh, retailer in the world. He has no storage. Uh, Uber is the biggest uh, taxi uh, company in the world, has no cars. Uh, Netflix and Facebook are the biggest uh, media companies in the world. They produce no content. 
So this is how software is becoming, uh, there are obviously other examples, it's becoming bigger and bigger. But the key part is that the, f the way software works is totally different and connect with what Antonio was saying okay, from the previous era. So like, to simplify, the industrial era was characterized in a way by economies of scale and the decreasing marginal return. So if you have a lot, you could sell a lot of products, uh, you could cover uh, fixed industrial, uh, fixed uh, investment costs. But at a certain point, if competitors had an equal amount of uh, scale, they could, re uh, could basically catch up because uh, marginal returns were decreasing. Software works in the opposite direction. What you have is basically zero marginal costs. So if you go on your phone and you make a copy and you send it, it costs close to zero. If I want to produce 100,000, 1 billion copies of an electronic book, it takes basically zero effort, zero time. So this is a dramatic change. But there's another one which is more important. The advantage of software in terms of scale does not come from the supply, but come from the demand. The more users, and this connects, the more power you have because you can integrate those data and basically immediately adapt uh, uh, your, your platform to uh, your software to the users and increase. And it's impossible to catch up. It's just, I mean, uh, it's basically a, a mathematical identity. So and if, if, if you have doubts, uh, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, and so forth, these are software companies, which is close to impossible to, uh, to catch up. The last part, uh, the, the third trend, is about innovation and disruption. Disruption is, is really a bad word, often used in the wrong way, but I use it just to understand what we are talking about. And I think there are a few issues here to clarify. The first is that innovation, uh, in contrast to what uh, is generally understood, is not about technology, it's about concepts. The concepts come before the technology and the techniques. And it was interesting, the slide from Antonio comparing the, uh, the, the list of emerging disruptive technologies from the EU and NATO, which are the same, but one is nine and one is six. And so you wonder, well, because the way they conceptualize the realms is just different. But at the end, the material things are the same. So and this is pretty important. And uh, just again, for an example, Google, Facebook, and so forth, initially were just a concept was a simple idea to make things in a different way. And then they used a bit of technology with what was existing, and then they invested in the improvement of this technology to uh, execute. But at the end, the, the real challenge was, uh, was at the concept level. And I think it's important to, to be reminded. But when it comes to innovation disruption, two other aspects deserve attention. The first is that it opens new realms. Space, uh, which has we, was basically dominated by Western countries a few, uh, till a few years ago. Now is more contested. Cyber, which didn't exist until a few years ago, now is a new realm and has a set of implications, including for security, but also uh, defense. And the last issue is that, obviously, disruption innovation opens opportunities for solutions. And so and there is a bigger issue related to what Antonio was saying. Who is going to provide the, the solution? And it's not only the startups, it's not only the, the big system integrators, it depends on the, on the situation, the context. Now, that was kind of to give the introduction. The, the brackets, when we reason about industrial alliances, uh, I think that they can play a, a fundamental role, but it's also fundamental to bear in mind the two extremes, which is, on the one hand, we need to keep the market incentives at play, so exactly not to give the wrong incentives and companies or any stakeholder goes in the direction we don't want, like prevent innovation. Or at the other end, but at the other, at the, um, at the other, uh, on the other end, you don't want market failure because if then you, you, you go just full market, well, we know that markets not always work. The main reason why R&D is primarily funded by states, by governments, is because it's a market failure. Private companies cannot appropriate the benefits and so have little incentive to go in that direction. So when we need to, to always square these, uh, these, uh, uh, this circle. So a few considerations going towards the, um, uh, the issue of industrial alliances. About complexity, the challenges ahead uh, is uh, one actually of scale for Europe in particular. Because if you look at the European expenditure on procurement and research and technology and you compare it to the United States, uh, it's just staggering. 
the US, roughly speaking, spends 140 billion per year on R&T and uh, evaluation and, and so forth, research technology. Uh, the, the all EU27 spends eight, so 140 to eight. When you look at procurement, the weapons we buy, the United States spends 136, so ar around 140 to simplify. And when you look at Europe, we spend 36. So again, and if you consider the, the importance of R&D to understand the future to develop technologies, and when you think about the economies of scale to sustain production, well, there are some considera political considerations to do. And uh, I'm not here to give you the considerations, but uh, in either you accept that your platforms are gonna be massively more expensive by unitary cost, or you expect that they're gonna be significantly lower in performance, or you expect that you have to, you cannot have uh, basically uh, industrial sovereignty and you accept in an increasing growing uh, number of realms uh, uh, to be dependent, or you want to spend much more. So that's, these are the four options. Maybe there are others, but these are some of the, uh, the main uh, takeaways. And I think everybody is free to, to pick the one uh, he or she uh, prefers. When it comes to software, uh, uh, the implication for industrial alliances is that winner take takes all, in a way I, uh, I, I glided it, but software is about human capital. I mean, uh, if you look at the, the uh, now the, the NASDAQ is going down, so uh, I solved all the stocks before, so thankfully, but the thing is uh, that when the startups were being bought, what was bought was literally an office and a, a few people, Instagram and so forth. The value was the know-how that these people had. Algorithms are just software coders. So what you buy is the knowledge that these people have. And this is quite important when you think about uh, uh, the, the European perspective, because on the one end, sharing knowledge is difficult. I mean, if I start talking with a software engineer, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna get much. You, you cannot transfer the, the, the knowledge just by, by interaction. And even if I start studying now, software engineering, I don't think I will succeed much. But at the other end, uh, there's also that uh, knowledge is proprietary. I mean, if knowledge is the key of your competitive advantage, it's something you don't want to share. And so, and this is important, I'll come in a second about this, when it, why it matters when it comes to Europe, uh, NATO, and defense. There's another aspect. Uh, software is eating the world. What does it mean in practice? Uh, think in 20 or 30 years uh, time, uh, and we'll probably have something close to autonomous cars. And uh, in an autonomous car, what is the crucial component? Is the software. Is the software that permits that the car doesn't go crash. The rest, uh, the hardware, will be fundamental, will be to be integrated, but clearly the added value will come from the software. Why this matters? Because when you see how the European automotive industry is reacting to the idea of autonomous cars, you see that ultimately they are quite scared because the risk is that the big uh, uh, car companies in Europe turns into suppliers of, it can be Google, can be Apple, can be Amazon, can be whatever. Could it also be a software company in Europe, by the way. But these change as fundamental industrial, economic, because the profits go where the value is in the software, and ultimately political, because if you build the, the hardware, but you don't have the software, obviously, I mean, if it takes one click to ground all your fleet of autonomous uh, vehicles, and you cannot use them any longer, and it can be just a bug, it can be just a cyber attack, but do you want to have these uh, vulnerabilities? Now, the last issue about innovation, and then after this I go to some conclusions and, and implications. Um, the uh, innovation and, and disruption. What I think is important to understand, especially when you think about the European Defense Fund, your uh, NATO Innovation Fund, is that throwing money to generate innovation doesn't work. I mean, if it was only about money, there are a lot of countries that have a lot of money but have not succeeded so far. The key idea is uh, uh, putting together the incentives. And what I think is really crucial is understand that there's no innovation if there's no failure. If you don't understand, you accept that the high rate of, in, of failure is part of the game, you cannot have innovation. And this challenge is primarily cultural, then is institutional, and then is all the rest. 
because if you don't accept these, uh, engineers are not gonna risk their career because uh, uh, if they know that uh, whatever their project is gonna be uh, uh, closed and so forth. And this, in my view, I may be wrong, but there is definitely something which in Europe is lacking for different reasons that we can discuss, but Europe is in general way more risk averse uh, than at least the United States. And you just see in the numbers, if you put together the big, uh, all the tech companies in the world, uh, basically 90% are between North America and Asia, and Europe has very few. And you look at the, the big tech companies in Europe are ultimately very few. And so that's something to take into consideration. Now, what are the implications for industrial alliances, especially in defense, NATO, EU aspect? For when it comes to complexity, next generation weapon systems is close to impossible to go alone. For two reasons, the cost and the amount of technologies which you need to master, which without proper scale, uh, no European country can likely manage altogether. And in fact, we see when it comes to uh, next generation uh, combat, uh, air combat systems that are being uh, done in cooperation. But here, the problem is that Europe has a long history of uh, cooperative agreements. They've always gone into some troubles. If you talk to the industry, and I did it recently, they told me, but we are learning. We are setting up new in, uh, you know, governance structures and it will work better. I'm a bit skeptical because any cooperative agreement has uh, uh, two challenges uh, which are uh, to address and they cannot work together. One is principal agent dilemma. The one is a uh, uh, collective action problem. The collective action problem is about how do I know that my industrial partner is not gonna leave in three months, six months, one year, whatever. The principal agent is how can I control that actually the thing works. If you have too much control, ultimately the, the venture doesn't work. If you have too loose control, the project is not gonna deliver the times or, or the way you, uh, you, uh, you basically <coughs> want it. The key issue is about sovereignty. So I think that the key is uh, if there is a, uh, a dimension of joint sovereignty, can be at the political level, can be on technologies, it's much easier to have industrial partnerships which work. When it comes to software and um, industrial alliances, uh, I think one key aspect, and uh, Camille Grant, uh, mentioned, Grant sorry, uh, mentioned it before when he spoke about uh, multi-domain operations. Uh, if you look at the cost of multi-domain operations, it's pretty impressive conceptually because it's, uh, I mean, it's remarkable. The idea is that you use simultaneously uh, all available capabilities all, in all domains to achieve the more, uh, the, the best effects on the battlefields or just even for, for the terrorists. So that's great, but to do these, you need to have, for instance, common standards uh, for sharing images because if the satellite shares images which the, at the tactical level, the air defense systems cannot, uh, cannot process, is not gonna work. Having a lot of those standards uh, agreed upon, identifying all the standards, which have also industrial implications because if a company uh, invested on a standard and then uh, at the NATO EU level we decided we go for another, it's not gonna be uh, easy. Obviously there, is, uh, there are some uh, variations, but that's a key part uh, to, uh, to discuss. And somehow related on, uh, uh, again, on the standardization and regulations, is about cybersecurity and especially when it comes to disruption innovation. That if you need to have, and the European Union is doing some important things in this respect, about regulations in order to close the gaps uh, generated by, uh, by, cyber, uh, by cyber threat. On this picture of the three trends, I had a few words and then I'm done. I don't know, I'm fearing with the time. Five. Okay, so I have still a bit of time. Uh, semiconductors. In the US, it was possible to, have, to have see the growth, the dramatic growth of the semiconductor industry because there was an industrial alliance. Because the, the pace of change could only be in a way coordinated. And uh, this happened, if I'm not wrong, 1985, 86, uh, in which all the stakeholders worked together to have a common framework which could help the semiconductor industry to work. I think especially when Europe wants to strengthen its role in, uh, uh, in uh, chip productions, that's one aspect to be considered. Similar issue when it comes to 5G. 
I mean, the, a few years ago, we had the 5G scare because of the role of Huawei, but also in that case, uh, you cannot break an attempted monopoly from, uh, from Chinese companies on 5G without industrial alliances, especially when the competencies are spread throughout Europe slash NATO. So you have some companies faring better on software integration, some others on antennas, some others on, on, some, technical, uh, on some technical standards. Um, so one aspect, which I think is probably fundamental and, and often at least in my conversation neglected, is the energy transition. To be honest, I think that more than AI and uh, quantum, which are gonna be important, but the biggest disruption to the European defense industry in the future could be the energy transition. Because if we take what is being decided about diesel and fuel engines more in general, that, and we translate on the battlefield, tanks, uh, arm, uh, personal, uh, armored personal vehicles, as frigates and so forth, we think that maybe a lot of them either will have to transition to electric engines or the producers of the, electric en of the fuel engines will see such a drop in the demand for uh, fuel engines that will struggle, and so there will be a lack of, potential lack of suppliers. It's something, it has to be really thought about. It won't just be about, uh, okay, we replace the, the fuel engine with the, the electric engine. It's much more complex, because the, the performance, the characteristics, and the, a set of other issues are, uh, are, are different, and probably there will be a reconceptualization of some of the platforms. So, last two issues. Europe has an advantage in terms of comparative advantages. Different countries are specialized in different areas, and I think this should be exploited the most possible. But important is also to see, given the current trends I described, and also there are many others, where these trends are leading us and whether they are going to put us in a competitive, and not comparative, competitive advantage or disadvantage, meaning the energy transition for instance, are we going to be systematically weaker because we have not thought it well, or is it gonna make it much stronger, for instance, because we don't depend any longer by Russian uh, uh, oil and gas? I don't have the answer, but it's something to be understood. The, the idea is the one of net assessment. You look at long-term trends and you see what's the implications for the long-term competition. The last issue, the last point, is about artificial intelligence more in general, not in the world of defense, but has a clear, in my view at least, a clear implication for the entire ecosystem. So artificial intelligence nowadays is mostly about deep learning, machine learning, which are uh, techniques uh, the specialized for prediction, optimization, pattern recognition, and so forth. To simplify, they make things more efficient, okay? The challenge is that when you optimize a lot, when you uh, look for more and more efficiency, you have systemic effect. I'll give you an example. So 20 years ago, people were flying at uh, Charles de Gaulle or Orly, and uh, the cab drivers were, the number of, uh, of cab drivers were basically fine-tuned, more or less with the number of, uh, of flyers, and there were lines, uh, and you know, you could sustain a certain number of cab drivers and a certain number of passengers. But now if you have an algorithm, and you see the prices, and you see that if you take immediately the cab, uh, it costs 100 euros. If you wait 15 minutes, it costs 30. What you add in the medium term is a decrease in the number of cabs. You don't need that many. It can be just optimized on the curve, okay? Well, this means some cab drivers may be unemployed eventually. Apply these, uh, I'm really making a simple uh, argument here, but apply the same logic to any industrial uh, dynamics. Uh, can be Airbus, can be Leonardo, can be another, which is used to buy a certain amount of uh, inputs. Thanks to optimization, internal optimization through machine learning, we, they see that they need much less. Well, what is gonna happen to the suppliers? Some suppliers may not be able to sustain the drop in demand and may just go bankrupt or may have to change business. And these systemic effects is something, I, at least again from my conversations, uh, is not really thought about because it can create major gaps uh, either at the national level or at the European wide level because it can be that some countries are actually, the reason why they make a lot of profits is because their system integrators are very inefficient, don't have all the data, don't have all the knowledge. But when you streamline all these, uh, 
And this is probably the moment where Antonio was talking about the subsidies. There are probably aspects where artificial intelligence brings more efficiency, but some industrial players, some component makers need to be subsidized. Okay, see Cinzia's look, uh, I'm done. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very much. I like the Italian pronunciation of my name. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, uh, I guess uh, in the Q&A we might also um, discuss some of the interlocutors that might uh, uh, be uh, able to uh, bring uh, experimentation and fielding uh, in such a way, you know, in Europe, especially in such a way that for the public who is not uh, necessarily expert uh, on this topic can grasp with uh, some examples maybe uh, how it translates in reality. For now, let's talk about uh, money, mm -hmm. <laughs> partially about money. So yeah. uh, the floor is yours, Lucy. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. It's uh, an honor for me to be here. Um, and of course, thank you both for your presentations. And very happy to, to hear that we need to better understand uh, how we can capture emerging and disruptive technologies such as AI. Um, to uh, put them into uh, operational implementation in a fast, cheap, and robust way, even in a war economy or even under budgetary constraints. Mm -hmm. um, so a short presentation for myself. Um, Lucille Versa, I'm starting uh, a second year um, as a PhD student uh, in Ecole Polytechnique uh, in management science. Uh, so it's not very uh, famous, uh, I guess, uh, from all of you because Ecole Polytechnique is an engineering school. Uh, so uh, actually the research center I'm working uh, in um, is the first research lab uh, dedicated to uh, research and management to have been uh, recognized uh, by the CNRS uh, in the 80s. Um, and so to get you a good understanding of what we are doing, uh, the aim of our research is to bring together theory and a practitioner's perspective to seek solutions to problems uh, faced by managers and organizations. Um, so basically we are in a lot of um, research action settings um, and so I'm collaborating on my research project with the French uh, Defense Innovation Agency and I'm actually investigating the question um, of how new uh, uh, sorry, how non-traditional actors and military organizations uh, collaborate to integrate unplanned uh, capabilities and of course under certain constraints such as budgetary constraints. Um, so eight months ago, um, after the start of the uh, Ukrainian conflict, many lessons have been learned, including the return to high intensity. Uh, one of the major issues uh, that has arisen um, is the question of integrating emerging technologies uh, to provide an operational advantage to the military. Um, so supported by the US Department of Defense, uh, partnerships with uh, Microsoft or um, AWS, uh, Amazon Web Service, uh, to protect Ukrainian uh, data sensitive to Russian uh, cyber attacks or the use of uh, Elon Musk Starlink mobile terminals to give uh, connectivity through, um, uh, sorry, to Ukrainian forces uh, on the ground have uh, highlighted the importance of the rapid uh, adoption of generic technologies for military needs and the effectiveness on the battlefield. So it's uh, basically a huge challenge because uh, commercial capabilities are disrupting the industrial base and um, also military organization to meet the needs of a new high intensity context. Um, so uh, basically there are new mindsets and way of working that are required to generate more agility, more frugality, um, tighter time frames for implementation of solutions and increased cost effectiveness. Um, so open innovation, which is a very famous concept in management science, uh, was developed by Henry Chesbro in 2003, is now largely introduced in the defense sector to tackle uh, this issue. And um, in the open innovation model, firms and policymakers need to uh, systematically seek for and combine internal and external assets to uh, create value and develop new projects. Uh, so obviously it implies a transformation of the ways of working about innovation in all industrial sectors and obviously in the defense uh, sector. Um, so just to understand um, some uh, emerging technologies uh, such as deep techs, uh, big data, artificial intelligence, they actually accelerate this transformation because they uh, transversally impact most capabilities. Um, they are flexible enough to allow new uses 
uh, that are not easy to anticipate. Uh, that's why it's really difficult for anybody to uh, um, understand what uh, AI can basically do in the battlefields. It's, it's really difficult to, to explain it. Yeah. Um, and so um, they are considered as diffusing technologies um, including significant evolutions in uh, sectional, uh, sectoral sorry, boundaries. And there are a lot of new competitors that emerge. So I talked about uh, Microsoft and uh, AWS in the defense sector, of course. Uh, we will not choose to uh, hear about uh, those uh, competitors. Um, we can also uh, talk about tech scale-ups. It's basically uh, what we um, explain a bit more in a few words. So there is actually a paradox um, between open innovation and the, and the defense sector uh, because uh, traditionally open innovation and uh, the model of defense innovation are to some extent in contradiction with each other. Um, defense policy makers have a constant focus on the control of technologies, the protection of the supply chain and the preservation of capabilities in the defense industrial base. So of course, uh, Ministry of Defense uh, acts at the same time as clients, but also as regulators and firms as system in integrators, they represent the key actors for the development of complex military programs. So they develop techno -push processes, uh, implying verticalization of the value chain. And in this perspective, military services are not absent from the development of complex systems because they represent the end users, but they intervene at formal steps and they intervene really uh, not that often. So uh, we can consider for several reasons that the defense sector is quite a closed ecosystem. Um, I can take three reasons, for example. The first one is that the uh, proprietary supplier strategies lead to a lack of modularity of equipment arch architecture. Um, there's also rigidity of procurement processes, massification of contracts, and risk aversion of uh, customers that puts organizational barriers to fast procurement of emerging technologies. And maybe one third reason, which is quite interesting, is that secrecy in partnership relations uh, maintain uh, the fact that for any new actor, it's really difficult to have access to users in a broad sense. Uh, but all I'm saying is actually not new. Um, I can maybe uh, quote the Parkard Commission in um, the late 80s that explained that uh, DOD's acquisition problems are deeply entrenched, resulting in an increasingly uh, bureaucratic and overly regulated process. Um, so, so, I mean, it's not new what I'm saying, and it's uh, obviously uh, more and more important to now uh, understand how to introduce more flexibility by combining various models of innovations, and most notably combine the techno push approach, of course, because it's uh, really important for uh, hardware uh, um, and, for example, for uh, um, for ships or for uh, really complex um, uh, programs, but also uh, to combine it with a user centric approach. So that's what does uh, open innovation actually. Uh, let's move back to uh, my research agenda. Uh, since 2022, I'm collecting collecti uh, qualitative data. So I'm about um, uh, 70s interviews and participating uh, or, uh, observations from uh, what I call defense tech scale-ups. Uh, why uh, those actors, those non-traditional actors? Because it's exactly what they are doing. They are providing disruptive innovations that can deliver operational capabilities to a battlefield. So in my panel, actually, I have um, 40 companies uh, coming from France, US, and hopefully I try to extend the analysis in other nature countries. Uh, but I have the same thing in common. Uh, first thing, uh, it's companies that have scaled up, meaning that they are not startups anymore. Uh, they proved that they, are, they have a scalable uh, business model. Uh, they are tech co uh, companies, uh, so it means that they have a scientific core business and especially uh, they accelerate adoption of uh, general purpose technologies, such as AI, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, they generate revenues from the sale of the proprietary and protected technology. And uh, the technology, the, the, the technology is combat proven, um, and they show that they are able to accelerate the development of uh, innovation cycles. 
Um, so there are, there are a lot of examples. I can maybe just quote one because maybe uh, you, are, uh, you, you know that company. Uh, it's an example of a French defense um, AI scale-up. It's the case of uh, Prelegence, uh, which has provided specialized AI-enabled software for the defense and intelligence community. Um, those uh, products are actually battle tested and used by NATO uh, within the NFC, so it's the uh, national, um, uh, the NATO um, um, intelligence um, center in Japan and also the French uh, armies. Um, and with AI globally, I mean, uh, presence is just helping monitoring areas of interest in a way limited human sources couldn't uh, do it uh, anymore facing the tsunami of uh, uh, imagery data um, from sovereign, but also commercial satellite, satellite sorry. Um, so what's interesting is that um, Prelegence, for example, that I could take another scale up, of course, um, was founded uh, a few years back in uh, 2016 uh, with only one deployment of its technology. It's now scaling up with 30 deployments uh, per year. But surprisingly, uh, it's still really complicated for this type of companies to get the innovation adopted. So we gotta understand why. So basically, generally, we think that it's an investment problem. And I, I understand what you've told. Uh, it's not quite an investment problem, but, but more about a dominant design problem. Uh, the new military programming law, for example, in France, does not derogate from uh, this rule of allocating the majority of resources to programs um, that's 40% and to deterrence, 40%. So it, it leaves 20%, I mean, of a budget, if I'm uh, just uh, uh, doing like a big, big math and it's not precise, but it leaves only 20% for maybe different concepts, but uh, you have also to pay the salaries and etc. For example, um, 1 billion uh, euros are invested every year by the French MOD for intelligence sensors. So basically it's uh, the satellite CSO uh, um, in France and uh, also in um, uh, countries. But without AI analytics, intelligence an uh, analysts could barely see 10% of the images. So just guess the return on investment of uh, this 1 billion. It means that actually if you don't manage to you know, uh, see all the images, nine, uh, 900 million are just wasted for you. So that's uh, something we have to, to have in mind. And so those tech scale-ups, they had the, great, the greatest difficulty obtaining public orders. Um, and when they do, it's on payment appropriations that have not been uh, disbursed, bit of projects, uh, budgets in R&D, support, etc. So there are a lot of constraints. Not, it's not correlated to investment, but correlated to dominant design because we are used to, uh, you know, fund uh, equipment and not think about uh, new concepts. We think about them when we when they are in the R&D uh, phase, but not when we have to scale them up. And just a guess, how much France allocates to AI to analyze all this image data? It's about 0.6% of the equipment value. So it's basically around 10 millions to produce value from the 800 millions that would have been lost without AI solutions. So uh, that's uh, something you, that we all have to have in mind. So we need to understand how did those startups to scale up? Uh, how did they create and capture value that bridge the gap between disruptive technology and operational implementation? That's what we need to understand and to be able to after create incentives in order to foster bridge breeding capabilities. So um, if we look to the data I've collected, uh, actually we, ha we have drawn the characteristics that influence inter-organizational collaborations uh, between these SMEs, these uh, tech scale-ups, scale and military organizations. And uh, actually uh, we can put um, the, the value creation in four categories. The first one is uh, about the context, I told you about the secrecy practice, uh, practices in the defense sector. But one of the particularities is its business to uh, government relationship. We have to understand that uh, government customers often make unanticipated changes to the procurement processes. They uh, change in uh, budgetary priorities. Uh, they make procurement reforms. Uh, they put a lot of uncertainty for the scale-ups to be sure that they could get paid 
because that's what they want, actually. They want to have orders. Um, the second uh, category is about uh, product or technology complexity. Um, I, I've told about uh, all the complexity of big uh, equipment um, like, uh, like like chips, of course, but uh, we need to understand that sometimes uh, when we think about future concepts, we have to apprehend what we call uh, what we call unknown unknowns. This means that we don't have an identified customers. We have untested technologies. We have also untested business models. So um, where both the problem and the solution are very unclear, that's what we can call ambiguity, uh, beyond risk and uncertainty, uh, we have to you know, use different me uh, methodologies like exploration models, exploration products. Um, and on the other end, customers, which means end users, they want uh, something to be functional, to be robust, even if it's low tech, but it's, uh, it's got to work. It's got to work on the battlefield. So sometimes there is some uh, you know, uh, fear of adoption because if it doesn't work, uh, some lives could be in danger. Um, on the uh, product market readiness, uh, most of the SMEs in the ecosystem underline that customization is the main strength coming uh, from the operational expertise and customer knowledge. Uh, so that means that uh, it, n it needs to be user-driven innovation. Um, and of course, it needs to be uh, resulting from uh, involver involvement oh, sorry, of users in the development and production uh, process. Um, and the last one is about trust and credibility. Um, actually, developing a demand for emerging technology requires trust. And of course, in AI, I think uh, we all know about uh, a lot of works uh, on trust uh, on AI. Um, so uh, we need to understand that, uh, that's uh, what the, the tech scale-ups uh, try to develop. So um, in a few words, because I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm missing some time, um, what we can understand from our material is that uh, those tech scale-ups, if they succeeded in scaling up, is because they actually, um, uh, in, in, in a dynamic capabilities perspective, they, uh, you know, understood how to answer to uh, operational implementation issues and user issues. Um, so I, I don't have the time to explain, but maybe in the q and I will uh, do it. You have to understand that they are seizing, they are sensing, and they are transforming uh, opportunities that the user give to them. And they are doing it not once, not twice, but in a spiral way. So that it means that actually they are like uh, um, giving the knowledge, the understanding of what the user needs back so that the user can you know, evaluate and maybe uh, uh, develop other capabilities. But what is really interesting is that uh, there is like a transfer of knowledge between the user and the tech scale-ups. And the particularity of defense is that um, for what I saw, it's really complicated uh, when it's um, uh, scale-ups that are coming only for the commercial sector. It's really um, um, better if they have a strong um, uh, revenue from the defense. Uh, so to conclude, um, what is interesting in this analysis is that uh, there is a spiraling dynam dynamic that goes incrementally and iteratively from uh, the customers to the military uh, organizations to the tech scale-ups, and it changes the way they actually uh, do. I mean, the, it changes the way the French MOD, for example, is working. Uh, when I uh, talk to you about the um, uh, presence example, uh, it changes the analyst workflow, intelligence analyst workflow. It's also, um, uh, you know, uh, they, uh, they um, for example, uh, they use a classified data uh, to train algorithm in the de dedicated uh, facility. They also use a licensing model to give recurring revenues for um, the, 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 the SME. It's done, it, it has done a lot of changes, actually, that are not really uh, famous. So just uh, to, to finish, what are my recommendations um, in terms of policy making? I'll, I'll push just four ideas. Um, first one, sharing knowledge with a customer. Secrecy practices in open innovation can be overcome with integration periods. Uh, for example, we talk a lot about the, the reserve in France. Uh, it's what uh, scale-ups do, actually, when I uh, was um, working with them. 
um, second, uh, second recommendation, expand knowledge to decision makers of use cases of emerging technologies so that they can dictate and capture uh, commercial um, technologies. We have also to encourage uh, acqu uh, acquisition professionals to, to use um, all those um, emerging technologies and to use the flexibility of innovation contracting. That's, that's another step that's, which is really difficult. Um, so you have to eliminate uh, barriers uh, to reduce uh, procurement timelines, of course. And the last one is, um, and I, I think we can uh, uh, maybe uh, um, have a debate about that, uh, it's about cre creative incentives. And uh, maybe what I think is more important is to reward risk taking from all uh, those uh, different entities and of course from uh, the military uh, organizations to you know uh, integrate disruptive uh, technologies thank you thank you very much lucy for your presentation i think you the three of you were quite innovative because you've served us uh, a rich material that we didn't also expect uh, while uh, seeing the titles of, of your presentations. Uh, we have about 25, no, 28 minutes for discussion. So I will please ask you to raise a hand. I see that there is a first question just here in the front. Uh, also Thierry, is there a microphone in the room, please? Yes, the microphone is coming. Well, if you're on this side, maybe you can give the microphone to Dr. Fardy first and then uh, next to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, just here in the front. Thanks to the, the three presenters. My question goes to you, Antonio, but maybe Andrea will, uh, will want to comment. I, I wonder if, the, of, if EDTs is the best example of NATO-EU cooperation. I'd like to have your views on this because one thing that we see when looking at EU-NATO cooperation is that one prerequisite of such cooperation is the fact that each institution would have first acquired some capacity in a given field before it can meaningf meaningfully cooperate with the other institution. We've seen that with crisis management, we see that with maritime security, and we see that to an extent with cyber or hybrid threats management. And most of your presentation was less on NATO-EU cooperation than on the need for each institution to, to use your words, to capture innovation, as if you were implying that the EU and NATO were at this stage, or not even at this stage, of the prerequisite. So NATO and the EU first need to capture innovation, and then, only then, they'll be able to cooperate in a meaningful uh, manner. So I, I'd like to have, is that the point that you were trying to make, in which case we are probably not yet at the stage of a cooperation between the two institutions? And if this is the point you are making, would you say that Diana, the Innovation Fund on the NATO side, or the Innovation Scheme on the EU side, and EDF, um, um, good ways to start that process of capturing innovation before then they can um, uh, cooperate. And linked to this, the competition dynamic. Um, are we not here facing a field where competition dynamics between two institutions are likely to prevail over cooperation dynamics? Thank you. Thank you very much, Thierry. If you allow me, I'm going to take a second question and then give the floor to the panel. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Eugene Kim. I'm an investment banker interested in the defense industry. Um, my question will go a little bit further, uh, complementing to what you said. Um, for cooperation, uh, for NATO-sponsored uh, well, cooperation on research, uh, at the basic level, you have the private companies uh, who are at the core of in, uh, innovation today that is now applied to the military industry. And most of them, and even if you want them to cooperate in a supranational entity with uh, both legs, see what I mean, <laughs> US, Europe, uh, these companies are competitors. They are fighting to get markets. So to the extent you ask them to cooperate on a specific project, out of which if something comes out, 
each company will have a fair share of the market. Uh, you see my point. Uh, facing reality, being from the private sector, isn't it uh, an issue? And to that, you have to, to add uh, the, the issue of uh, sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you very much. And if you allow me, uh, I will ask one question. I don't know who would like to take it, but I'm very interested in the regulation uh, issue. Uh, Andrea, you've mentioned you know, the balance between uh, uh, tech companies in Europe versus in North, in North America and in Asia. At the same time, we know that Europe is normative based and it's really you know, pushing this uh, uh, practice of being the one that will regulate. How do you see Europe being able to position itself in regulating the field while being the smallest player uh, at the same time. And with that, I'm going to give the floor first to you, Antonio, yeah. for your response. Yeah. Okay, so thanks a lot, thanks a lot for, the, for the question. I will, I will answer to Thierry's very interesting question, and I, I, I perfectly agree with you. So it's very difficult to compare the EU and NATO when it comes to emerging and disruptive technologies, because this is something really new. So this is really a work in progress. And I would say this, this is also a long-term game. Right, so we are not talking here about short-term solutions. Then there will be other dynamics at play, and, and my point is, is, is exactly the one that you made. So first, let's try to capture innovation and let's let's try to think how to align our 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 agendas, and then on the uh, on the cooperation and and and, and competition, um, I I perfectly see I perfectly see the, the the problem, and I think the way to I think it's important both for the EU and NATO, the way to frame this is not to frame this as a zero-sum game, right? So that innovation in the EU is just beneficial for the EU, innovation in NATO is just beneficial for NATO, because we are talking most, we are talking about the, basically the same pool of resources when it comes to, to industrial, to industrial, um, to industrial technological uh, innovation. And uh, yes, I'm optimistic in that. I think that the EDF and, and Diana are, two very good initiatives. I, I think it's a good starting point. And, and my point is, let's stick with this. Let's give more money to the EDF and, 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 to, and to Diana, and they will, they will probably create some more, some more synergies. And then on cooperation and, and competition, uh, I think both me and Andrea, we wrote the, the thesis on, the, on the, um, European defense industrial cooperation. So, and, and uh, I, I don't have an answer to this, right? Because it's, it's clear that these, part, these partners are also competitors in the market. So what we are seeing now is that cooperation is a necessity, right? So we need to cooperate. Uh, a cooperation is also more difficult than in the past, right? Because, see, because think about the Eurofighter. So they basically split the project, it was a huge mess again, but they split the project in percentage. Right, so the 25 percentage to the UK, 20, 20 for Italy, 20 for West Germany, and so on and so forth. Now with FCAS, it's not possible anymore. So they're talking about pillars, but of course, who owns the pillar one yep. will be probably the winner of this, of this game. So I think the way forward in, in this, if I can make a very humble suggestion, is to accept the fact that there will be winners and losers, and try in some way or another to compensate the losers. Right, and this is line what 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 Andrea said. But let's do not pretend there will be that that cooperation means that everyone will win, right? Because in a market where there is a winner takes all dynamics, no one, it's impossible that everyone will win. So let's accept that these winner winners and loser dynamics, and let's try to do something to compensate it, both financially and and potentially politically. That's an interesting suggestion. I wonder how compensating financially the losers will be will be possible while the interest of the winner is not only to gain status and position, but basically to gain financial gain. Uh, so it's it's uh, quite interesting. Um, I maybe want to give the floor to you, Andrea. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. so, uh, on this point, if you look at, we look at the, exa the experience of the U.S. procurement uh, uh, across history, uh, you see increasing concentration in the industry. And one way to fix the compensation of the losers mm -hmm. would be to try to launch simultaneously to a competition for next generation uh, weapon system. The, the starting grant for 
the next next generation. This could be a way in which you preserve some competition and, uh, and it could be, I'm, I, it's not a magic uh, uh, solution. I mean, there, there's gonna be problems, but that could be one potential way. Now I go in order and I try to be short, no, no, better, I go, I start from your question about normative power. Um, so the first is that when you look at emerging and disruptive technologies, the role of the EU as a normative regulatory power, the reality mm -hmm. was a disaster. Mm -hmm. Like the GDPR, what it did was destroy the ecosystem of uh, um, startups working on uh, artificial intelligence because machine learning requires data. If you uh, prevent startups to gathering data or you impose a lot of uh, basically regulations becomes more, more expensive, they cannot. Uh, if you talk with all the Americans or North Americans uh, and the entrepreneurs, smart uh, ma management uh, professors, they say, it was a, such a great favor that Europe did to us because all the potential competitors for them was much harder. So that's, and this is where you have to think about, uh, I mean, I understand that the need of privacy, but the implication was that it significantly undermined the, uh, the role, the, the ecosystem. And when you think that at the same time, Europe then wants to strengthen the role of startups, you see there's clearly a contradiction. So that's the first. The second is that, uh, the, the normative regulatory power in uh, as technology in general, but high tech, I mean, emerging technologies, uh, it cannot work if you don't have a base of technical knowledge because about standards, standardization and regulation. So you need to understand what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And if, uh, first, well, that's one example where something was done not fully understanding what they were doing, but there are a lot of other areas where it can be about frequencies, it can be about technical issues in which if you don't have a clear understanding and for which you need technical knowledge, your regulations are, are not gonna be effective or generate uh, consequences which you did not expect and may even uh, fire back. That said, I mean, I mean, uh, you know, uh, there's a famous line about, I think either Edward Allet uh, uh, Carr or Morgenthau saying that power for power serves no purpose, there is an ethical basis of power. So I, I'm not saying there must not be a normative aspect, so whatever is done, but it has to be, in my view, a bit fine-tuned. So uh, Thierry made a good point about the EU NATO innovation funds. I, my view is that what is fundamental is that they are both designed that they work. So I mean, what the, the goal is not to throw just money. The goal has to be that they help companies, startups, whatever, technologies emerge, which without them would not have emerged. Because if we go funding companies which would have emerged regardless, then the question is, okay, why we did do it, do it? Obviously, you don't have the counterfactual, but the idea is if you have an innovation fund, is because you believe uh, that the existing system, th there's a market failure. You don't supply the funding where it's needed. And that's what is needed, and that's why I emphasize the aspect of re or f uh, risk acceptance. We need to un accept that some uh, numbers of those companies will fail, some project will fail. Because if you want only winners, it's really like, okay, well, everybody uh, passed the class, and then you check the knowledge and nobody, uh, no, you, you want this. So the, the, the most important aspect is that they, they fund technologies companies which will, would not have been funded, and they actually promote technologies which are needed. Uh, so not just to show that, okay, we funded all this, but who needs that? Oh, nobody, okay, then. What, what, what? So the first one. Obviously, the best would be they either work in synergy or they're complementary, but at the end, if we think of the Silicon Valley, I mean, you have venture capital, capital firms competing to go funding startups. No, I mean, they, they are in competition. And the, actually it's very good because uh, in a way, I don't trust this company, this technology, I don't put my money. I see that, well, if this promises, if you fa follow the, what has happened now with uh, FTX, uh, the, the cryptocurrency, you see Sequoia uh, <laughs> lost, I don't know, many millions, maybe billions. So they do mistakes uh, and somebody was smart enough saying, no, I don't trust this technology. So per se, it's not bad, it may actually be positive. Again, uh, what the, the main uh, issue is, uh, 
uh, that they work. My question, and I don't know enough, and, uh, but it's, it, it builds on your question, is uh, how the governments can be done in terms of uh, uh, funding at the national level the different companies. So I, I wonder a bit, uh, would they fund uh, the same company? I mean, like I, I have a new AI uh, startup. Uh, can I get the funding both from uh, the Innova NATO Innovation Fund and European Defense Fund? I mean, in the Silicon Valley, this is clearly not forbidden. No, I mean, it makes sense. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm just curious uh, how it works, and I have not, don't have uh, an expertise. Uh, last point I want to add uh, to uh, what uh, Antonio was saying. I mean, the Eurofighter and many other projects, the Horizon frigates between Italy and or the Fram frigates between Italy and France could be built because we're industrial products. You build some part, I build some others. We both give a, a certain amount of work to our shipyards. And more or less it works. In some cases, like the Horizon Fram, I would say exceptionally because, you know, uh, they, they are among the best frigates uh, in the world. Um, but with software, you cannot do it. The, the, the simple reality is that either you know how to write the software or you don't know, and the, the vertical integration you have, there is gonna be a, a winner. So there are literally two options. Either companies, like in the case of the Horizon, you would have uh, uh, now with this Nava Group and Fincantieri, you decide to make a joint cell, uh, or one of the two is definitely is more like the F-35 uh, uh, industrial system. So one is in the lead and one is in the, in the back. And that is a political mm. problem without, I mean, it's, uh, it's clear to everyone. Mm. Uh, that's it, thank you. Oh yeah, just, just uh, one, um, one idea about that because um, uh, I was thinking about the difference between the um, EU fund and the NATO l and and uh, what I'm seeing from uh, the, my perspective, which is uh, uh, more about big tech scale-ups, is that uh, the innovation, uh, the, um, sorry, the European uh, Defense Fund and all the initiatives, uh, EDPIP, uh, for example, um, they try to you know, foster industrial partnerships, uh, cooperations, but it's actually for funding for scale because uh, you don't have end users in the uh, um, European uh, Union, um, but NATO does. So actually what, what is interesting from a NATO perspective is that uh, you can, uh, of course, have end user that can help uh, uh, innovation diffusion and that can help us also foster uh, competition. The problem, uh, if I understand that, about the EU is that we're trying to, you know, uh, have all the, uh, the competitors on the same table and maybe we cannot uh, choose uh, the one we are uh, uh, giving the lead. Uh, that's the problem, uh, of course, uh, on uh, different European programs. Uh, so basically, when you have users in the end facing the innovation, you can foster competition. So I, I believe that's, uh, that's more uh, a NATO thing, and uh, that's why uh, I would uh, encourage uh, this type of um, you know, initiatives. Thank you very much. Andrea, you wanted to add some small thing yeah, while the microphone is uh, actually going uh, there on the so left I and in front, please. The two, yeah. And you can start in front. So okay. building just on the question of, of theory, which is, and also what you said before about exploring, the key issue is that these technologies or platforms, products have to be bought by somebody. Because the key issue is reforming the, the procurement. Uh, because if we do like, the Air Force or the Navy of Country X says, we really need this thing, and then they cannot buy it. Well, that's a case where here you need to change the regulations so that they can procure what is needed. So, and here is the question, what is the, these two funds gonna fund? Because can you see now in the future that they provide the funding to buy what for whatever reason cannot be bought for budgetary, regulatory, or, or else? Because if you build something and nobody buys it, uh, that's a challenge. And if you look at, we know more about the US because of the way we know the, about their procurement, the armed forces complain that they cannot buy some uh, set of capabilities technologies because of regulations. Mm -hmm. And without national governments changing procurement regulations, uh, there's gonna be a stopping. And that's where it would be a case where we have two fantastic innovation funds generating fantastic innovation, <laughs> but then cannot be used. And that's something I think we want to avoid. Yes, please go ahead. Um, so th this is a little bit of a comment. Um, I, I set up a uh, special forces innovation unit of a major NATO partner. 
um, and also I'm currently the founder of a defense startup. Um, so if you look at somewhere like France, we've got Battle Lab Terre, and we're actually getting all the units are generating innovations and there's a pipeline there. So we're listening to the end users and that's probably the, the critical issue where innovation is driven from. Uh, and that builds to you mentioned the F-16. When you look at the F-16 program, uh, one of the major innovators was the UAE and they actually licensed their technology back to Lockheed. Mm -hmm. So every yeah. time a modern F-16 is sold, the UAE makes cash out of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and again, with the, the Leclerc main battle tank, that was partially funded again by the UAE. So, so when you're a NATO nation, like France, which is substantial, you're still having to outsource your, your defense investment. It makes it very hard for someone like me with a founder, and bearing in mind that I set up uh, the innovation program in Australia, helped set up SOFX in America. Um, so it's not like I don't have the contacts. <laughs> and yet I find myself being bounced from the Agence Innovation Defense mm. and finding it very hard to speak to investors in France. Mm. And yet when I pick up the phone and I speak to Khalid bin Salman, I speak to Edge in the UAE, they're talking multi-millions mm. because they have the capital, they have the appetite for risk because they associate risk with power. So, so it's a question of, and this is, this is probably the question for the panel, do you think NATO has to break and lose all its power before we actually get back to innovating properly? And my final point is, is having fought for 20 years, um, if you take, for example, Mosul when we fought Daesh, uh, we were using drones, Daesh just hung bed blankets over the alleyway so we couldn't see them. And then when we used thermal images, they just started using flares. So we've talked a lot about new technologies, AI, all the rest of it. Perhaps the innovation stream we're missing is how we use old school technologies in a new manner. Mm. And, and, and again, that, that's, I, I used to have a test I called the corporal test, mm. which is where, where we have the idea of innovation. We farm it out to a university or a SME we get it back and then the first thing I used to do was flick whatever had been uh, devised to a couple of my angriest young soldiers. And if, it, if they couldn't break it within 12 hours, I, I knew it was probably a winner. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, comments, I guess. Maybe a question in there somewhere. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you for contributing. Uh, this practitioner's experience is very important. We still have a question. We have seven minutes, so yeah, I thank you. Do my best to make it short. Uh, Marek Mare, University of Warsaw, once again, thank you for your presentation. I would like to deal with the issue of technological complementarity of NATO and EU, uh, also due to the fact that we have to take into account that we talked about, for example, European Defense Fund, then Diana, I don't know what kind of money will be in Diana still, but European Defense Fund is 8 mi billion of euro per six years after cuts. So uh, I think that there is also an issue to make it really complementary and useful to think about the phase in which we are investing that kind of money. Of course, the European Defense Fund is constructed in that way that the majority of, the, um, sums, uh, of that sum is also to support national investments. And so some additional money anyway. But nevertheless, the, what you have said in the panel shows that it's a venture uh, issue to invest in innovation with limited money, especially in context of, of military industry, which phase should be then explored? That the most venturous, that is innovative phase of conception, or maybe we should focus in context of uh, using that kind of money of EU and, and NATO, rather on phases when initial concept is already done and we are talking about development, testing, evaluation, and so on. That's for, let's say, discussion. What is just due to limited resources we have because 8 billion of euros per six years is not something which will <coughs> impress people in Silicon Valley, by the way. And one small comment in context of, of, of that uh, analogies to Silicon Valley. I would be a bit, I'm not a big expert on that, uh, but nevertheless, I would be a bit uh, cautious about it. Also due to the fact that even the Uber you mentioned uh, was running on losses until the very next, this year. So with the kind of steroids they have, it's easy to say that it's so, uh, is in context of military industry, you cannot expect that finally, that investors, for example, cannot expect that finally it will bring definitely some 
money and I could bet on it. So, and also they do not call themselves taxi uh, company also due to the fact that they uh, outsource all risk associated with personnel and so on. So I think that uh, agreeing that software is, is uh, cheaper, at the, at the end of the day, military means also hardware very often of software used to use uh, hardware. And then the issue of cost in scale comes back. That is, it's easy to produce one million of e-books, but then you have to print them and scale is coming back. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your uh, contribution and question. We have five minutes, so really a word for everyone to conclude. Um, I'm wondering if uh, both of you want to answer this last question and if Lucie has something to, to respond to. Uh, the, the obstacle of capital for risk and also, as you mentioned, the obstacle uh, of the uh, link to domain design. Uh, both are national problems. Uh, is the solution only national? In the, in the case of France, for instance, what would be the solution? And um, I, I'm done with that. I'll turn to you, Antonio, for your final yeah, word. I think I, I will answer to the EDF, EDF um, European Defence Fund uh, question. Yeah. Uh, I, I agree with you. So the European Defense Fund was a product of a very complex negotiations, right? So the member states were not really happy at the beginning to give to the Commission all the all the power to to fund this, especially some member states. There were also other issues related with third party uh, participation, what to do with the U.S., with the U.K., and 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 so on and so forth. So at the end, the ADF now is a very strange creature. Right, so they slashed basically by half. So the Commission proposed 13 billion, and then they slashed at the last moment, uh, saying there is COVID, there are other reasons. So now it's 8 billion. So on the on on this, I think we should we should do more, and also it designed in a very strange way because there are different phases that you can fund. For instance, only the 8 percent goes to emerging and destructive technologies. So I I, I agree with you. So there is margin for. For, for improvement, and then a more general point on the on the on the European Defence Fund and, and, and Diana. I think like the the point of my presentation is that we don't need to look at these things in isolation, right? So the European Defence Fund, Diana, they will not solve all the problems. They are not silver bullet that we can use in order to to solve to solve problems. We need to coordinate things, mm -hmm. right? So I agree that one of the major problem of the of the European Defence Fund is that they do not take at least on paper, the users into account, right? So there is no, if you read the, all the EDF regulations and so on and so forth, why? Because the basis, the legal basis of the European Defense Fund is industrial policy. Mm -hmm. So it's not defense policy, right? Because this is the way which, like this, this was the entry point of the European Commission, saying like, this is not defense. This is not related with the military. This is industrial policy. That's why we need mm -hmm. in some way or another to support national companies, even potentially some inefficient national companies, because this is industri industrial policy. So I think there is a lot of works to do, more, more in general, I would like to, mm -hmm. to end with this. There is, there is a big challenge uh, ahead of us, but I think like we should face this in a positive way, right? We should build on our strengths. This is also related with EU and NATO uh, interactions. It's clear that there are many contradictions and political problems to solve, but we should start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And I think the EDF and, and Diana can be a good starting point. It's not perfect, but potentially can be a good starting point. Thank you very much. Andrea? So, um, very briefly, uh, I think I may be wrong, but the dates are, are not that different. Uh, I think Amazon uh, had the first profit in 12, uh, 2013, so he went with major losses for like 20 years, uh, and then when he started accumulating uh, uh, profits, they were huge. Uh, and now, among others, they dominate uh, the, um, the cloud computing. Why I'm saying this? Because that's the logic of exponential growth that we have, you, uh, you can achieve with software. I, I agree that you still need hardware, but in that case, and this brings me to the related issue of what are EDF uh, and NATO in the, in the, uh, Innovation Fund supposed to do? In my view, they're gonna be useful if they do what now nobody else is willing to do. So if nobody's willing to take risks, they have to put money when, when there are risks, even accepting enormous risk because it's a market failure. If you have some future Uber of defense who's gonna accumulate a lot of losses but need to be subsidized as venture capital uh, that does regularly in the beginning to uh, enable the company to grow, gain scale, and then succeed. That's, that's a market failure you want to fix. And I'm curious about your example, about you say 
investors, funders, uh, investors don't want to talk with me. The question is why? I mean, it's because the the regulations would not, or, or whatever other so, reasons. So to, to put this in context, if you look at our, our financial plan, we've got a standard personal financing at the moment. We've got buy-in from a number of exceedingly big customers who we're talking to about investing simultaneously. And it's actually a, a thing of uh, people don't understand defense. So, well, so, so, so then I have to communicate. Governments are very set in their ways of planning, and this is the difference perhaps between special operations and commercial forces, it is that people are so used to dealing with defense partners. And France, I admit, is the best country uh, I have come across, uh, and, and your president, uh, whatever else you might think about him, has done an immense job with the startup and innovation ecosystem here. Um, it, it is just that whole sort of buy-in of getting people to understand it. Then when you're dealing with governments, governments are so cost, uh, the French Special Forces has a discretionary fund. There's discretionary fund for doing the Asian Innovation Defense, but you're limited to between half a million and two million. Okay, can, I, yeah, can I intervene? So, so, so when I because I, I think we are short on time, I think. But the simple answer, well, then it's a problem of culture and institution, and the, the Innovation Fund cannot, fund, uh, cannot address this problem. The, the reality is that the problem is about the society and we cannot. I, I yeah, think I, I'm so sorry, this is terrible. I hate cutting an excellent debate, and uh, it's obviously the case, but uh, there are, there's another panel coming on. I wanna give the floor to you, Lucy, for a final word if you want to. Yeah, just in, um, in, a, in a one minute, um, about your question. Uh, the idea is, uh, I think it's uh, to change the dominant design for example, um, that's what the special forces try to do. They, they just innovate in changing the way of working, and that's why they give uh, you know some funding to, especially in the U.S. with SOCOM, they you know innovate a lot and they try to you know foster capabilities uh, that can change the way of working in in an efficient way. Um, in France, they are uh, for several political reasons. Uh, it's really um, difficult to you know um, to change the dominant uh, design because we want to maintain legacy uh, equipment. Uh, we want to maintain deterrence. Um, we want to maintain a, a whole army model. So that's a political, uh, I mean, point of view. Uh, that's not my, uh, my, my, my specific issue. But uh, the idea is that we need to understand that um, for several reasons, um, when we think about funding, it's about scaling. So of course in France, if we can't uh, give some space to those te uh, tech startups or startups anyway, uh, of course we won't change domain design and that's Basically, the problem I think you, you encounter is that when you go to the uh, uh, innovation um, uh, different agency in France, you can maybe have like a half a million or maybe one million uh, of, um, uh, of funding and uh, you can go further. So you need to, you know, uh, change the way the, um, the armies are working and then change the dominant design to maybe have more funding. That's, that's really hard to do in France and that's the problem. And, and yeah, that's also becoming a French story. So, mm. with that, I um, I thank you all. I please ask you to join me in a, in a round of applause to thank our speakers today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me to moderate this session, and uh, I'm asking the organizer: uh, Is there a break before the coming session, or are we just following? We are going all right, so we're gonna just pursue this effort. I'm sorry for the little uh, delay on the panel. Thank you. Good afternoon again to everybody. Good morning to uh, Bruno Charbonneau, who is uh, via Zoom uh, joining us from Montreal. We are now reaching the third stage of today's colloquium. And uh, as uh, you may remember, the first panel, we have identified singular and complementary approaches of the key players, and we went pretty far into details of the current strategic environment. The second panel examined the technological stakes in NATO's strategic concept. The amplitude of the challenge is such that cooperation of different types is a must, 
all the more so that financing is not limitless. Our third panel addresses other possible avenues for consideration in the widest sense of the term, touching on climate change, technologies, competition, and cyber. Bruno Charbonneau is joining us via Zoom, and he will elaborate on the strategic implication of climate change. Dr. Marek Nadej will shed light on the dynamics rela related to competition in technologies and to the ambitions of competitors. And Commander Hans-Peter Morbach will tell us all about cyber risks in our interconnected world, their effects on individuals and on critical infrastructures, and the need to be proactive in matters related to knowledge. Let me give you a few words of a bio for uh, Professor Bruno Charbonneau, whom some of you already know, but uh, no, all, not all of you. Professor Bruno Charbonneau is Professor of International Studies and Director of the Center for Security and Crisis Governance, called CRITIC, at the Royal Military College Saint-Jean. He is also the founder and director of the Centre franco -Pay en Relation des Conflits et Missions de Paix de la Chaire Raoul Dandurand at the University of Quebec, at Montréal. He is deputy editor of the Canadian Military Journal. His work focuses on international intervention in armed conflicts, particularly in Francophone uh, West Africa. He is working on the consequences of the division of labor between international counter-terrorist forces and UN peacekeeping forces in the Sahel. He also has another hat, since he is currently developing a research project on the links between armed conflict, counterinsurgency, and climate change. He recently took part in a seminar on NATO's Madrid Summit, organized by the Institut, Institut d'Etudes de Géopolitique Appliquée at the French Senate, where he expressed his view on climatic tension and NATO's action. Professor, the floor is yours on the strategic implication of climate change. Merci beaucoup. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you to SM and the organizer. I apologize for not being there in person, but I'm very happy to talk to you about uh, climate change, NATO strategy, geopolitics. Um, it's a broad topic, as I'm sure you, you're aware. So I'm just going to try to cover a, a few grounds. Uh, um, basically, what I consider to be the key questions and issues regarding the, the, this uh, large uh, issue, question, challenge. So a bit of context first, um, NATO in particular last year, last summer, the, at the summit, 2021 summit, uh, announced that it wants to be the leading international organization when it comes to understanding and adapting to the impact of climate change on security. And on that same day, Canada announced that it would host uh, a, a, a NATO Center of Excellence on Climate Change and Security which will be or should be operational in 2023 in Montreal. So part of my work is uh, uh, being a part of that sort of build up or certainly the, the research around uh, uh, these issues in NATO. And the latest strategic concept also repeats uh, NATO's uh, um, objective to become the leading international organizations uh, on climate change and security. Uh, to quote it, the Alliance will need uh, lead efforts to assess the impact of climate change on defense and security and address those challenges. We will contribute to combating climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions, improving energy efficiency, and so on and so forth. I'm quoting this because uh, the, the latest strategic concepts is uh, going beyond the effects of climate uh, change, uh, beyond adapting to climate change, but also uh, uh, addressing or pointing towards a climate mitigation, so reducing greenhouse gas emission, which is a, a very sensitive topic and certainly a very big challenge for military organizations. So the first thing I, I think I, I need to say when it comes to climate change would be if there's one message to, to remind or to repeat today would be check your assumptions. Uh, by that I mean that climate change uh, demands uh, that we do indeed 
call into question many of the things we take for granted when it comes to strategy, military operations, geopolitics, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, I would argue that climate change is not like any other new thing that you might have to do, add to the security, defense, or strategic agenda. It's something much, much bigger. If I can call so Naomi Klein, for instance, uh, 2015 books, it changes everything. It changes, in that sense, the context. It changes the background or baseline that we usually take for granted. A baseline and background is rapidly changing. So our core assumptions, for instance, about the military mission can be called into questions by climate change. And that's not something, obviously, that most military organization wants to hear. Um, uh, but, but I'll come back to that later. So three points on uh, the, the, the implication of climate change on what we could call the security strategic implication of climate change. The first one is probably the easiest one. It's certainly one that uh, <clears throat> most people agree on is the uh, climate change effects on military bases, infrastructures, and operations. Uh, the Pentagon, for instance, has uh, been working on this uh, for over a decade now, almost 15 years or so, uh, for the first, anyway, uh, official reports, uh, public reports. Um, so the impact on raising seas on naval bases, for instance, but also on uh, military or cap capacity to uh, pr uh, project force, uh, li supply lines, uh, this past summer, for instance, planes in the southern U.S. and U.K. couldn't take off because the tarmac was too hot and so on and so forth. So, so that sort of effects, I think, are, are, are technical, operational, pretty uh, well understood uh, and linked back to, I think, what the, the previous or some of the challenges linked to what the other panels, I think, today uh, have been talking about, so technical challenges to adapting to climate change. Um, another issue... Uh, is uh, what I would call the strategic landscape or the geopolitical environment that is changing under uh, climate change conditions. And uh, we're working on that. I'm leading a, research, a NATO research task group on these issues. Uh, how does climate change affect the geopolitical environment within which uh, NATO operates? So for our group, for instance, we've divided uh, those issues in three regions. So the effects of climate change on the northern flank or the Arctic, if you will, uh, on the eastern and southeastern flank um, and on the southern flank, so uh, basically north, uh, west and northeast Africa. So the issues here um, are about extreme weather events, for sure, um, when uh, weather disasters strike, but also all sorts of disruptions that come with climate change on the energy sector, on food distribution and production, on water quality and accessibility, and all, all these translate into political challenges and potentially conflict. And all, all that also feeds back with uh, the relationship between all of the regions, obviously, and NATO's responses or Europe's responses to these, uh, to these disruption and changing landscape. And I think uh, if one thing, while that the Ukraine war has shown, while it might or might not be linked to climate change, that, that's definitely a debate, but it's the uh, interlinkages between these regions, obviously. So Russia was president of the Arctic Council, for instance, when they evaded Ukraine, so that put a stop to what the Arctic Council was doing. And obviously the war, I think you're probably aware, has affected food security in many parts of the world, and particularly in Africa, uh, Eastern Africa, for instance, it disrupted supply chains and uh, food supply chains. So that's the sort of thing <clears throat> I think that also is consensual in terms of uh, the impact, but there's more research to be done on what exactly climate change will affect and how it will impact the strategic landscape. The other uh, issue would be, <clears throat> pardon me, the uh, strategic landscape or geopolitical environment global scale. <clears throat> and I like to use the concept of the energy transition here to convey uh, a, a, a large set of, uh, of issues here, pardon me. <clears throat> a large set of issues. So basically the energy transition by what, what I mean by the uh, might in, include here uh, the negotiation at COP27, but everything that has to do with reducing, mitigating climate change and reducing uh, CO2 emission, green gas emissions, and uh, phasing out fossil fuel use. So there's obviously here a lot of resistance from the fossil fuel industry, but also from fossil fuel states, uh, states who export or use 
or need a fossil fuel, gas, oil, and so on and so forth for their for their power, for the development, so on and so forth. So, so, so there's a lot of shift there. There's a lot of resistance at the global level. And on top of that, there's a struggle over the transition and over, for instance, mineral extractions and strategic material, as we call it, for the green, uh, green energy or the green energy transition. So we're, we have obviously uh, the big players like China and the U.S., the, the American government uh, a few weeks ago, as you might know, uh, as draw a line uh, on uh, semiconductors uh, and has argued that it needs to uh, bring back home uh, not only the production of such uh, uh, extraction of strategic materials, but also the production perhaps of strategic uh, uh, technologies like semiconductors, for instance. So the energy crisis here in many ways I'm trying to say is that they are here to stay. Uh, uh, there are around us, the old political economy is changing and obviously that will have uh, geopolitical effects. <clears throat> but Having said that, so the three issues, it, uh, climate effects on the operations, military bases and military operations, the true strategic landscape within NATO. Uh, so the impact of climate change on uh, 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 the potential for conflict and war and the impact on the overall global geopolitics landscape, if you will. Um, but I would say again, check your assumptions. And two points here I, I'd like to, to point out is that while all of this is changing and point to the strategic uh, uh, challenges ahead of us, um, all of this will happen while at the same time there will be effects on NATO and Europe capacity to respond to such uh, challenges. So I use the example of those planes that couldn't take off in the southern US and UK, but we can also point to increasing uh, weather disasters in Europe and the United States, North America, fires in Greece, recent floods in Germany. Uh, the uh, fires in uh, California are getting worse, uh, and so on and so forth. So this, this, in other words, will affect and continue to affect the capacity to respond both in political and capacity terms. Where do you decide to intervene when you have multiple crises, when you have to respond to multiple disaster events, while also having to defend your borders or the, uh, you, know, you have demands from the NATO alliance, and so on and so forth. And um, last point on checking our assumption is uh, who, or I can put it in a, a question, who is the red team under climate change conditions? I hear a lot uh, um, you know, discussions about uh, Russia and China for obvious reasons, obviously, in the current moment. But going forward, I would say that we also need to check our assumptions about uh, the uh, effects on the climate change on these two countries and therefore their capacity to, to influence the the geopolitical landscape. Uh, just to give one ex the example of Russia, for instance, there's uh, more and more research coming in talking about uh, the potential for Russian infrastructure collapse because of climate change. For instance, a lot of, most of their roads and railroads are built on permafrost that is now tonning. So, so uh, if everything you know, melts down, all this infrastructure might collapse and obviously that will have a, a dramatic impact on the economy and put uh, even military infrastructure of Russia, for instance. And while we don't have enough uh, data to, to, to talk too, in too many details about China, the last summer was pretty dramatic what came out of China in terms of the job, for instance, uh, the environmental challenges in China are, are huge. Um, <clears throat> so I guess in terms of a, a sort of a um, conclusion here, we can point to the NATO strategic concepts 2022. The context was talking about the Premier Center of Excellence in Montreal and so on and so forth. But um, the NATO strategic concept, uh, for instance, uh, points out or, or, or claims that we need that NATO will now integrate climate change. It names climate change, human security, and the one piece in, in security agenda into its core task. And my question here is, uh, indeed, what I was saying in the introduction, whether climate change does simply be integrated into the core, tra core task, or it does not demand to rethink those core tasks. In other words, is it only another issue that you can integrate into what you've been doing forever, or is it something more profound? And I suspect, and I, I think it is more profound as it is uh, challenging or transforming the context within which uh, we operate and live, really. 
Um, and so while there's agreement on the effects of climate change on security, certainly at the operational level, for instance, or the, the risk for conflict, there's very little agreement right now about what to do about it. What, the, what does that actually mean for the security agenda, for security actors, for security priorities, and so on and so forth, uh, both the operational and strategic level. So it is easy to talk about the climate effects on military operation bases, I was always saying, but there's still resistance to discuss the effects on the military mission, or for instance, on, the, um, on NATO's core tasks. So fundamentally, obviously, climate change is not a security defense issue responsibility. Right, COP27, for instance, uh, we, we can point or certainly indicates where the core responsibilities are. And yet, having said that, climate change will affect the mission, the military mission, the strategic environment, and arguably, I would say, uh, NATO's core task in potentially radical ways. And uh, I, I would be remiss not to also point out that the military emits a significant amount of CO2 contributing, therefore, to the problem, to climate change. Uh, the Pentagon, if it were a country, would be the seventh country uh, in terms of, of emissions. So that's a significant challenge, uh, a strategic challenge, a military challenge. Um, so ultimately, uh, uh, as a real conclusion now, uh, there's a lots, of, lots of research that still needs to be done in terms of the effects of climate change. But there's no avoiding the strategic uh, uh, question that uh, um, climate change confronts us with. And in particular, well, one of the questions certainly is an ethical question, whose security matters under climate change conditions? What does it mean to actually do security under climate change conditions? So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Well, we, we will have uh, our, our second speaker, who is going to talk about new territories for competition, as we uh, uh, propose the uh, title. And uh, Professor uh, Marek Madej is uh, an associate professor in the Department of Strategic Studies and International Security at the University of Warsaw. He formerly was a research fellow and a senior expert on international security in the Polish Institute of International Affairs and an expert on security in the Chancellery of the President of Poland. He also held the position of Deputy Director for Research and International Cooperation at the Institute of International Relations at the University of Warsaw. He is a visiting professor in various universities around the world. His research interests concern NATO and other European security institutions terrorism and asymmetric threats, contemporary armed conflict, as well as Polish security policy. He published in 2019 a book on Western military intervention after the Cold War, evaluating the wars of the, of the West. Professor, the floor is yours for new territories for competition. Thank you very much. Okay, it works. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the invitation. And I was asked to talk about things we called new territories, although very often it's not so new. Some technologies are, are old. Nevertheless, uh, as you may see in the bracket, there is a suggestion that I would like uh, to talk rather, or I should talk rather, about military technology, which is relatively high end in that sense that it's rather about uh, heavy weapons and heavily advanced technologies, at least with some ma majority of cases. Uh, Americans have a uh, say, uh, say that if something is highly complicated, it's rocket science. In this case, it's literally rocket <laughs> science sometimes. Uh, nevertheless, I would uh, like to focus on three issues, on uh, hypersonic uh, missiles and that kind of technology, on outer space problems with outer space and militarization of it or weaponization of it, of it depends on how we, about what we are talking here, as well as on uh, issue of robotics that is unmanned and maybe in future autonomous technologies, to what degree that could be an issue for NATO. I would like to start to ref with reference to some degree to what was said in the first panel concerning NATO strategic concept and the threat perception here, because the, to some degree, renewed interest in such technologies, maybe with the exception of, of robotics, because it's a bit more new about outer space or hyper uh, velocity or high, uh, uh, um, high velocity uh, missiles, is to some degree a consequence of that somewhat paradigm shift in thinking about threat perception. That is, we stay started to think as a NATO, again, more about state 
uh, uh, threats as the most important from our perspective than uh, non-state actors with Russia as a direct threat and China as a systemic competitor. Uh, however, it's good to also to remember that newly published U.S., taking into account the, the impact of U.S. on, on NATO, uh, threat perception also, uh, uh, new defense strategies talking about Russia in context of acute threat, which is a bit different wording. That is something imminent, but not the most important, and China as the most important threat. And that's why I think that the, in spite of all technological aspects, that's what we have to take into account, that the relevance in the threat perception of, for NATO of such technologies like hypervelocity or, or outer space is to large degree depending on how we perceive these two players, that is Russia and China, how imminent, how serious, how dangerous, let's say, for NATO they are. Then the, the question, for example, if the feeling of, of imminency of the threat from, as for now, strategic competitor China grows, probably also the interest in some of the technologies will grow, uh, grow as well. And the last thing in, of the introduction which I would like to say, we have here two angles of the problem. One is, let's say, NATO ambition in these areas. That is what NATO is thinking about its own capabilities as far as that kind of technologies are concerned. The second is what NATO could expect. That is what NATO thinks about other aspirations and capabilities in these areas. That is what kind of, for example, threat could be posed by high velocity or hyper, uh, hypersonic missiles uh, from, uh, from Russia or China could be caused, or to what degree that kind of technology could be useful for NATO to solve its, uh, its uh, security problems. So I would like to start with hypersonics because that's probably uh, the most fancy, let's say, and most sexy maybe even uh, <laughs> topic here and most acute theoretically due to one, especially due to one thing, because uh, we earlier heard about the need of keeping technological edge by NATO here or by US. That's probably one of the few technologies which seemingly it's not NATO and not US who are most advanced at least as far as operational capabilities are concerned. Uh, According, let's say, to China, they have already operational hypersonic uh, missiles. Maybe not missiles. It's rather, uh, uh, yeah, it's missiles, but it's so-called hypersonic gliding vehicles. That is, you have some warhead which is raised very quickly to the air and then drop. And by gliding with high speed, is going to the target with possibility of maneuver. Uh, Russians already demonstrated because they used how it was, it's another story, how it was effective, but they used already in, in, uh, Ukraine, in the Ukraine Kinjau uh, missile, which is hypersonic uh, cruise missile, or at least ballistic missile with some cruise capabilities. But now going into details, that's why hypersonics probably cause, especially in the US, some huge discussion due to the fact that they, we realize that it's maybe the one of the few technologies where maybe not NATO and US is, is the leader here. So that's why. First, uh, existing programs, especially from uh, Russia and China. Secondly, uh, the um, assumed, at least, uh, offensive potential of such weapons. Huge speed, we talk about 5,000 or and more kilometers per hour. So it means that if something is sent from Russia, it could come in 20 minutes to Europe or in less than an hour to the United States, definitely. Uh, uh, if uh, that's one thing, or if we talk about shorter range, it means that we are talking about a couple of minutes uh, after, after ignition. Uh, speed and possibility of maneuver. All that means that our capabilities to do anti-missile uh, uh, defense is simply significantly reduced, at least uh, in theory, because even if in temporal phase of that missile means that we have to be very quick to react, which is high, high, highly demanding. And also the problem is that it shortens the time for response. That is, you have a couple of minutes sometimes to assess what kind of missile is coming, where, and what to do about it. The whole process of reaction is, is more complicated. However, it's also good to take into account some disadvantages of, or some realities of that kind of technology. First of all, uh, People are saying how good that missiles are, but it's not so fully proven. That is, fortunately, we do not have to test them so quickly, so frequently. But nevertheless, the problem is of accuracy, for example, to what degree they are really ac accurate as, the, as, as producers and uh, owners declare. Uh, of course, in case of nuclear warhead, there is no difference if it's 120 meters from the target. But in case of conventional, 
or kinetic because with that kind of speed you do not have even an, any payload, any, any warhead on, 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 the, on the rocket. It's even the, the speed is, is here, the weapon. So uh, 120 meters could matter if, if, if we talk about conventional uh, matters. And use of Kinjo, for example, in Ukraine and general accuracy of, U of Russian missiles, even if not that kind of ty uh, the types, uh, shows that accuracy is a huge challenge for Russia. Uh, as estimates are rather that some 50% of their missiles are going not in the place they, they were expected to go. Uh, not talking about hyper hypersonics, which is a bit co more complicated. The issue, ad other issue is also maneuverability, that is, especially in context of the gliding missiles, they are very s quick, it's true, but once they start to maneuver, they will s slow down. So it's also a, a question which is technically important here. But generally, probably they are hard to destro destroy in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the air. But nevertheless, uh, it's rather costly and, uh, and complicated, uh, complex technology. So it means that we are talking about very few number of potential rivals, at least as for uh, near and, and mid-term future, especially China and, and Russia, not others. And in both cases, the main rationale for developing it was mainly to have a capability to do a nuclear penetration of, of, our, uh, of US especially anti-missile uh, capabilities and so on. <laughs> that means that we are talking about things which will be used in majority of cases rather on a high end of escalation. So uh, it's not something which is very, let's say, flexible as far as con conventional contingencies are concerned and so on, rather distant option. Uh, of course, not going into details, but yeah, the, they are, have role also to, for example, destroy aircraft carrier group or that kind of of thing from US perspective, highly important from NATO as a whole, important because it's important for US. Uh, no other country has such capabilities to be destroyed in this way, uh, but we have to take it into account uh, as well. But what I want to stress that that kind of technologies are developed by China and Russia, especially in context of nuclear exchange, less to conventional weapon. Even if it will be used in that context, it's not it's a bit like shooting with the cannon against mosquitoes. That is, there are alternatives which are cheaper, probably more affordable also for that country. So I do not expect that they will, let's say, use it very intensively. It was rather US which thought about it uh, in context of conventional uh, strike. Of course, somebody could tell me, so I'm, I'm discussing now with myself, but somebody could, uh, could tell me that uh, how to make a distinction. That is, when you have a so speedy missile and it was ignited, you have some couple of minutes to assess, is it nuclear or conventional warhead on, on board? And probably you will just for, uh, for safe, you could assume maybe it's rather nuclear one. But still, the possibility that nuclear exchange will start from the scratch without further earlier escalation is rather limited. So I would not, let's say, uh, focus too much on, on, on that risk as a, as a thing which could happen every day. Definitely knowing that our anti-missile capabilities are limited in context of subsonic or supersonic missiles, in case of hypersonic it's even worse. That it's simply tracking and destroying it in the mid-air or in the terminal phase is hard to do. Nevertheless, having capability, other capabilities as far as uh, the issue of nuclear exchange, that is SLBMs and, and that kind of stuff, and having precision conventional capabilities, probably we could manage it with simply old deterrence by retaliation, that is to make uh, those who have that kind of capabilities, at least we could cope with that probably the most in most effective way by uh, relying on deterrence by retaliation. That is, yes, you can penetrate our capabilities, you can penetrate our territory, but you may have to take into account that we will fight back. That's as far as hypersonics, which in my opinion is rather hype than the real, real uh, problem, or at least not as big for NATO as a whole. A bit different situation is in context of, oh, one, okay, uh, outer space. Here, complex picture is much more complex. First of all, uh, we have some impression, uh, there's, popular, uh, there's common opinion that we have demilitarized de outer space. Not fully true. Outer space treaty is talking only about denuclearization, that's one thing. And secondly, we are not talking in that uh, treaty uh, which regulates a bit uh, our activ activities, especially military ones in the outer space. We are not talking uh, about, for example, earth-based assets. There is, there is no talk about missiles which you can send from air to destroy something in the in, in the outer space. 
Moreover, militarization is in fact already happened, even by us. That is, if you have a satellite communication, if you have satellite tracking and ISR, you're already militarized. There are, that assets are military assets that are used to, to do military operation. So they are also attractive target, especially for, uh, for your uh, enemies. By the way, even due to the fact that that's specificity of the technology, if you have a satellite which is on the orbit and you change the trajectory of orbit, you have already a kinetic missile. That is, the velocity of it is so big that if it crash on the other, destroy it. So, uh, so the fact that, that all satellites could be, or at least those who could maneuver could be used as a, as a missile if somebody wants to do that, taking into account how many we have them, uh, we have already on, on, on the orbit, uh, it creates a, a huge problem. And the, sec uh, the last issue here, which make a complexity of that, uh, of that problem, is that we do not have, the, the, there is a focus on some missiles in outer space which could destroy another uh, things, or missiles from the Earth, that is SAAT, anti-satellite missiles sent uh, in the outer space to destroy, for example, our communication or, or uh, intelligence assets. Yeah, but that's one option which is costly and a bit uh, cumbersome. Other options are more, let's say, based on cyber hacking, on jamming, or on blinding satellites in different way. Uh, and they are cheaper and more effective, and probably it's hard to look for any option how to counter proliferation of such techniques and so on. So that's why the picture is much more complicated, because on the one hand, we are uh, in this mo model which I said, NATO is definitely interested in using some capabilities, or NATO allies, in using capabilities especially as far as uh, support is concerned, intelligence collection, communication from the outer space, and also in protecting that kind of capabilities, not to mention about ability, less probably in ability to, do, to, to attack or to do offensive war, that is uh, to, to, to attack uh, uh, our potential enemies' capabilities in the outer space. But nevertheless, in such environment, it's simply, let's say, impossible to develop capabilities which will allow us to, to let's say, defend our space assets without risk of, of creating, for example, debris, which could be da dangerous for, for us and so on. And also, it's hard to stop, for example, anti-satellite missile from the Earth, sent from the Earth. From, um, and it could be done not only, by the way, by Russia or by China, but Iran is able to do that, or North Korea is able to do that, they prove it. So, uh, and one uh, last but not least, which uh, should be also taken into account, is an issue here of non-state actors. Uh, it's good to remember, of course, I know that it's anecdotal argument, but it's good to remember that uh, if you want to take men payload, people in the air, even US is using now a uh, contractor that is SpaceX of, of Elon Musk. Uh, if you take into account what role plays Starlink, to some degree at least in Ukrainian war, we have to take into account also that some assets will be delivered by companies, sometimes multinational companies, and therefore the control over, over that, uh, that assets by, by states is also complex. Therefore, to, to focus, let's say, what could be done to, to, to deal with especially threat of that kind in context of, of outer space, uh, probably not being able to, to, let's say, defend very often uh, effectively our, our capabilities. The, the issue is rather to, to, again, we could refer to, defer, uh, to deterring by retaliation to all those who will, for example, use anti-satellite missiles to destroy our assets, but that's, let's say, one option. But probably NATO and all Western countries will have to start to think how to be a bit less reliant on that kind of capabilities. We have some kind of, with RMA, this revolution of military affairs, we had some tendency to put a, as much bandwidth as we could, uh, especially into satellites, because it's safer than on Earth. Y it's no longer true. So maybe looking for alternatives, uh, how to avoid being so dependent on data collected and transferred by uh, satellites as we are now. That is, you know, if you have a UAV, or in, uh, spying UAV like Global Hawk, which is so deeply, let's say, uh, dependent on, on satellite communication, maybe we have to think about, uh, you know, I, I'm not a technician, so, uh, so it's hard to say easier said than done how to solve it, but simply dependency on satellite uh, communication especially started to be simply a, a vulnerability which has to be reduced some, uh, somehow. Yeah, and very briefly about robotized issue or should not? I could stop here and if somebody wants to... to, to then we can ask you a question. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
Okay. Okay, we are coming to our uh, next speaker. Thanks for understanding the respect no problem. of the, our timing, but we, we, can, we can compensate. Um, our next speaker will uh, highlight us about uh, new types of hybrid warfare. And uh, Commander Hans Peter Morbach, who is on my right, started his career in 1998 in the German Navy, and he finished his computer science studies in 2003. On board frigates, he was entirely responsible for the security of the ship's communication and information systems during peacetime and during operation in the Horn of Africa. He was twi de twice deployed for the Operation Enduring Freedom and the EU Operation Atalanta. In 2013, the commander started the second part of his career in the field of cyber defense. He served twice at NATO as a cyber expert at the International Military Staff in Brussels and as an expert on command control, communication, computer, and cyber defense in Brunson. During his time in Brussels, he was a member of the NATO team working with the EU on how to increase cooperation between both organizations. Some of the proposals on countering hybrid threats and enhancing cyber security and defense were afterwards included in the joint declaration signed by the President of the European Council, the President of the European Commission, and the Secretary General of the North Atlantic Treaty in December 2016. In between those two assignments, he served in a position on international relations at the German Cyber and Information Domain Service, HQ, in Germany, where he contributed to develop cooperation between Germany and its allies and partners. Commander Morbach is currently taking the French General Staff course at the Ecole de Guerre in Paris. Commander Morbach, the floor is yours for sharing your experience in the field of hybrid warfare and cyber defense. Yeah, thank you very much and uh, thanks for the nice words. For me, it's now the first time be here in front and presenting uh, to a forum, so please uh, bear with me. Uh, thank you for the nice words. In the upcoming next 20 minutes, I will show you my experience uh, based on cyber defense hybrid threats. And I've uh, separated my uh, presentation or divided my presentation um, in um, several parts with an introduction. And then I will present uh, how NATO sees it uh, while showing the figure of uh, one of NATO doctrines on cyberspace operations. Uh, with this uh, figure, I will show um, the cognitive and the technical aspects of cyber attacks and we'll come back uh, then to some conclusions. So um, hybrid warfare as such, in my opinion, is not something new because uh, it was done um, for years, decades, uh, centuries, or even more. Um, hybrid warfare, uh, although uh, there's no worldwide known term, is in my opinion uh, the, the matter to express uh, the will to put pressure on neighbors or other um, bodies to do as I want. And uh, this is done either by um, showing military power um, or more covered state by cyber attacks or even uh, by economic pressure. But as I said, this is not new. Uh, I found some examples like um, the Romans 2000 years ago already uh, hijacked the children of uh, the chiefs of tribes um, just uh, to assure that these tribes uh, do what the Roman Empire wants. But also no, at a later stage, uh, kings and emperors used the presence uh, of military force to press money out of their neighbors. And I think we can continue uh, even collecting this example and we will be busy for the whole afternoon. But however, uh, quoting um, or in accordance with um, Karl von Clausewitz in his book from Kriege, every age, has its own kind of war, its own limiting conditions, and its own uh, particular preconditions. So here we are coming now to the uh, new age. So since uh, the 18th century, middle of the 19th century, um, everything was done on a physical manner, either uh, exchange of letters or forum romanum, um, the person who speaks to the people, but um, Starting with the 19th century and the introduction of uh, the telegraph, 
the, the humankind starts to use um, what is not later called, and I will express it, uh, explain it later, the, uh, the logical layer. In the 20th century, um, the communication with the radio and the television starts to, uh, by some kind of one-to-many communication, so it was e very easy to distribute messages, uh, information um, to a lot of people from one uh, station. Um, and of course, um, since um, the internet, it's now very easy um, to exchange information in a kind of many-to-many -many, uh, with, uh, way with uh, fora, with uh, newsrooms and all the stuff what we have now, uh, especially with social media. But now, explaining um, in some regards, uh, I'm used here um, the uh, figure from Natus Doctrine on Cyberspace Operation. So um, this is um, divided in three layers. So starting with the physical layer, and the physical layer is uh, where the hardware is. Now all the servers, computer, um, the network cable, but also um, since recent some years, now smartphones and uh, with the upcoming uh, years, smart home. So in the future, even uh, now your fridge is connected to the internet, um, maybe other elements. Um, so this is also touched with the physical layer. Um, the next layer is so the logical layer. Here are the information, the programs, um, which are uh, exchanged uh, through the f uh, by the physical layer all over the world, spread all over the world with uh, nearly no li uh, boundaries, although I would like uh, to limit um, the idea uh, the, uh, the internet has no um, frontiers. In my opinion, uh, um, the internet has frontiers by using the physical layer and um, with the configuration of networks, um, information have boundaries as we see it in China and Russia in a way they block um, informations so um, that um, here we have a separated uh, informational environment. Uh, North Korea is here also in another example. Um, another element which, is, uh, which shares in the logical uh, layer is malicious code and malware. Now here is uh, where, the, where the virus, um, the, the attacker through cyberspace goes to attack um, the physical or which is then the next layer, the, log uh, the um, cyber persona layer. The cyber persona layer is um, the entrance for everyone to the logical layer, to the cyberspace. This can be um, an email address, this can be a uh, social media account, nearly everything uh, which gives you the um, ability to use the internet to reach into the cyberspace. Um, this, can, uh, this means that uh, one person can have more, uh, multiple cyber personas, like multiple email addresses, uh, social media accounts, but also with shared accounts, you know, one cyber persona is, rep uh, is represented uh, by many people, you know, while uh, group, group mailboxes or uh, things like that. So, um, as I said, I would like to start or uh, to focus my presentation on um, the use or the misuse and the um, threats. Um, as I said, um, with the physical and uh, cognitive aspects, I would like to start with the physical aspects. So from my perspective, from the logical layer to the physical layer. And here I uh, would uh, set some uh, two boundaries um, with two examples. One is a high level attack, Stuxnet. And one um, is a low-level attack, uh, WannaCry. High-level attack because um, this um, malware attacked um, Iranian centrifuge and had to pass many, many, many boundaries. Even the system was not uh, connected to the internet, so it was, uh, was, let's say, a high-level cyberspace operation. Um, with many, many, many work to be done. The other element, which I would uh, put it to low, lay, uh, low level, was WannaCry. Now, it was a vulnerability known for months. Uh, Microsoft already patched, uh, or offered a patch for Windows. However, 
um, not all the uh, computers were patched, so um, a group or a person, I'm not sure currently now, uh, used this vulnerability and was able to infect 230,000 computers in 150 countries by just using uh, one vulnerability which was known. So uh, it was just to look up in the darknet or whatever, uh, see, okay, um, and then write a code. Even maybe the code was even available in the darknet. So just uh, configure the code. Um, most of the people, even me, no, I haven't noticed uh, because my system was patched, uh, the automatic was on, so um, for most of the people it was not, uh, not an uh, issue, but a special embedded system which are not uh, uh, patched automatically got um, infected. And um, the ransomware is an, a big issue because now the people want to press money and here uh, um, I spoke also to um, recently to the gendarmerie in Paris, not in Paris, here, uh, near Versailles, but also here in the, the German authority says, if you're infected by ransomware, don't pay. Because if you pay, then you, um, then, uh, you encourage, um, then you benefit the attacker, and this is uh, something all the authority says, don't pay. Um, this is um, the, the, the big, big challenge when it comes to um, ransomware. However, now we have now a big uh, also defense industry, cyber defense industry, uh, which offers um, a huge amount of technology to harden your systems, to protect your systems. Um, the big problem is um, they're very reactive. Now they, the attacker can design a program um, and the defender, mostly then the companies have to react. And this takes time. And even the patching, as seen by WannaCry, um, takes takes time. Um, so um, here is then one big point which I want to underline is um, for everyone very important. It's not only for the organization; it's for each individual. It's um, cyber hygiene, um, cyber awareness, that everyone knows. Okay, these are the risks in the internet. And uh, the big problem is don't pass, bypass um, cybersecurity measures. Um, because here, um, this is um, a very big issue, and this is because the, um, the human is mostly the attacker, uh, the, not the attacker, but also the, the first um, victim of a cyber attack, because, and this is brings me to this next step, to, to Stuxnet, uh, to um, infiltrate a system uh, with a malware, it's uh, necessary to uh, use a person to air gap, uh, to motivate a person to uh, plug a USB stick into a computer, also here violating cybersecurity regulation. Um, so mostly um, this includes um, social engineering Social engineering is um, the technique to manipulate people, not only through cyberspace. It can also be phone calls, uh, harassment, threatening, every kind of um, maneuver to manipulate a person um, to act as I want. And here, also, I found recently a book, a very interesting book from uh, Kevin D. Uh, Mitwick. Um, it's called you know, The Art of Deception. Um, this is a very interesting book uh, he uh, shows in uh, nice little stories um, how people can be manipulated um, with sometimes easy manners, easy ways, um, and even I have to recognize by reading the book, them, in, in one or two cases, I could have been the victim. Uh, being naive or, or uh, under pressure, all the stuff, this is something um, really to consider, and I recommend reading the book because um, it brings it forward. Social engineering. Um, this brings me to the second element uh, when it comes to information operation. So now here, focusing um, not from the logical layer to the physical layer, but from the logical layer to the cyber persona layer. Because nowadays, uh, we have so many information, we have so many opportunities. And also here, uh, I checked, based on a German company uh, collecting information uh, called Statista, um, in the beginning of the year, around 
two uh, billion people have a social media account. Um, the, the challenge here, uh, maybe it's sometimes it's a problem, uh, this um, services are for free. However, now we see um, the stock news and all the stuff, now they say they make money. How do, uh, do they do, uh, how do they make money? No, mostly with advertisement. So um, here they start to click, uh, offer clicks, um, and this brings the risk because among others, no, not only um, companies offering food or uh, the, the pizza delivery service is uh, presented, but also some uh, specific media um, are presented and offer the clicks, and this increases the risk of, um, and this for me were two important words, echo chamber and filter bubbles. Um, so each person has a high risk to be trapped into a filter bubble and to be multiple times uh, bombarded by the same information uh, with the echo chamber. And um, at a certain point, if you're bombarded with the same information again and again and again, um, you start to believe. In the beginning you say, okay, no, this is nonsense, and you're bombarded, and then um, at a certain point you believe. And here yeah, this has been uh, shown, uh, especially during the uh, COVID crisis um, that we have um, seen. A lot of groups with the, uh, had the feeling they have separated them from the society um, with, with their own piece of information because um, they were completely, or they have th themselves completely disconnected uh, from the rest of the informational environment um, and this is the risk no, from the uh, so social consensus. Um, and here is um, where is uh, the next risk. Um, if a group is in a bubble, um, then an attacker can also try to infiltrate this bubble and put, again, uh, new false information to plant fake news, to even push um, these groups more um, away from the society. So here is then again um, the big um, discussion and a big perspective and a big threat to myself because this uh, threatens the coherence of our societies. Um, um, uh, um, summarize this here in this um, slides together. So this is where we have to really very uh, cautious. So um, what we need to learn and now uh, where it comes to my conclusion. When it comes to uh, cyber attacks, physical layer, um, important is um, personal awareness, um, cyber hygiene, don't click on things where you should not click. Um, let the cyber security uh, industry uh, do their work effectively, taking uh, into account uh, into personal but also company and organizational perspective, no, it will take time, so have a plan B. Um, no, as, a, as a military, we are always told, no, have a plan B. Um, this is something I think uh, for everyone very interesting. Um, and uh, also important, no, when it comes to ransomware, when have I saved uh, my latest information um, so that it cannot be encrypted, so I can just, if I'm attacked by ransomware, I don't care, uh, back up, back in, and I can continue. Um, so no operational effect. But also when it comes to the information environment. Um, the, the, the big challenge is how do we handle um, the, the, the problem that we have uh, people trapped in this uh, filter chamber, uh, echo chamber, filter, uh, filter bubble echo chamber. How do we reach them? How do we bring back um, this is the best case, no? can we bring them back? At least, uh, wor uh, uh, worst case, no? um, avoid uh, bro uh, broader separation. So how do we manage um, this new environment? Like, uh, okay, ta uh, knowing how the social media works no? with the um, mechanism, with the algorithms that we know, okay, that we can identify. Are we in a filter bubble? Can w how do we get out of this fil filter bubble? And um, finally, if we are going into a discussion, maybe do a fact check, 
uh, are we discussing on the same figures, on the same piece of, of information? Because you cannot come to the same consensus if you discuss on uh, different information, on the different facts. So um, these are uh, my points. So. And this concludes my presentation. Okay, thank you, Commander. Well, we have had uh, three presentations which uh, are very rich in, uh, in a number of issues which uh, are not necessar necessarily familiar to everyone, but which touch on our daily life, basically. Um, I'm wondering if Professor Charbonneau is still with us? Yes? Well, so you, you have the opportunity to ask him directly questions about climate change, which is a very vibrant subject, knowing that um, he recalled that uh, we need to check the assumptions. So I would stop the uh, question by asking him, what does it mean by that when you talk about climate change? D does it mean that you question the change in climate? <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> on the contrary, I'm taking them very seriously. And, and, and I think not enough people take them seriously enough. Um, when I say check your assumptions, I, I, I think that, I mean, if you take climate change seriously, like if you look at the climate science, um, the challenges ahead of us are frightening, to be quite honest. Um, they, they will affect everybody and everything, every sector of life, human life and human systems. Um, so that means a lot of changes happening at the same time, right? A lot of challenges, crisis management, um, changes at multiple level, multiple sector societies, and so on and so forth. And so the basis uh, upon which, uh, let me give you an example. When we do um, risk analysis and risk assessment, for instance, uh, usually risk assessment is based, the methodology of a risk assessment is based on probability of certain events happening. Right? You can look at the insurance sector, for instance, not only strategic and security analysis. So, so they look at past data. What is the, for instance, probability of a certain event happening? And you, uh, you therefore lead from that past set of data to probabilities, to risk assessment, what's the possibility of certain event happening and whatnot. But that's the, the key challenge with climate change. Though so that past data becomes less and less relevant in the sense that the, the background, the environmental background that we take as a given, as stable and static, is rapidly changing. The geophysical changes that come with climate change mean that the seasons, the, the probability of extreme events, uh, uh, um, diseases coming up north, like new viruses and so on and so forth, everything becomes new in a sense. So our, our, the basis upon which the data upon which we use to do risk analysis and assessment, for instance, is changing rapidly. And so there's a huge gap here between what we know and what we used to know and the uncertainties of the future and tomorrow. So, and if you take that sort of uncertainty and expand it to all the sectors happening more or less at the same time, that means we need to take into consideration the implications, for instance, the use of military force, military capability, uh, or the resources uh, of power, for instance, just very basically phasing out fossil fuel in another way is another way of saying moving a certain type or specific types of instruments of power from certain people and moving them into other sectors to, into other hands, maybe other countries and so on and so forth. So the energy transition, for instance, I was talking about, in theory anyway, in the next few decades will take away or there will be a lot of pressure on fossil fuel estate producers to phase out, get out of that, and so on and so forth. We're going to live with fossil fuels for the next few decades for sure, but the pressures are increasing to phase those out, obviously, because they are the core of the problem. There are other sectors, other problems, so on and so forth. But 
uh, when you shift towards another form of economy and another basis for economic power, for economic resources, how you, you produce energy and so on and so forth, you're shifting the basis and the bases and the structures of power and power relationships. So the assumptions about who, who has an influence here today versus what, who will have power and influence and what the power structures and relations would be 10 years from now, I think that's what I mean by chicken assumptions. But it will be fundamentally be the structures of power relations and structures 10 years, 20 years from now, given all these challenges and changes that come with climate change. That's what I mean by chicken assumptions. Thank you, Professor. A question in the audience? Yes. Hello, thank you. Thank you for your uh, very uh, interesting uh, intervention. I had a question maybe for Commander and Peter Morbach, yes. Um, uh, I work um, Could you speak up, please? More, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I work as a retreat research research analyst, and especially in crypto criminality. And I wanted to ask you, do you think that um, Web3 is, or maybe like blockchain te technologies, is uh, emerging disruptive technology? Do you think um, the threat that is posed by crypto criminality is um, honest, is understood by the state, the organization, the institution, and is it something that, um, uh, for you that work in cybercriminality and hybrid warfare, that is taken into consideration? Does it have uh, a place, a space, a budget that is um, allocated specifically to the problem problematics linked to to that? Voilà. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, crypto crime and, and blockchain technology. Blockchain technology as such um, is considered, uh, I don't know by NATO, but I know, for example, um, the government of Germany um, has developed a blockchain strategy because uh, the blockchain technology as such, uh, also in my opinion, is a good thing. It offers uh, a way to, to store, to safeguard um, information um, and also um, to, to, to uh, create a pile of information in a way to uh, prevent manipulation. So this, for example, Ethereum, although we know it as a um, cryptocurrency, but in the end, Ethereum is uh, a way to uh, create a blockchain of contracts. Also other uh, crypto technology uh, and crypto, what we know as a currency, is used um, for good means. Internet of things, they have a blockchain technology and all the uh, technology as such. So um, it is a good use, uh, good, it's a good technology and a good technology to come. Um, however, of course, um, the, the, the big challenge is here um, the misuse. Although um, I personally, when it comes to crime, um, normally if a crypto blockchain is um, created properly, it, it's, it's, it's very hard because especially now, uh, when it also comes to um, Bitcoin, uh, with the amount of um, checkers. Now it's, uh, the idea is um, in this network uh, um, to have um, a very long blockchain and the longest blockchain win. And so the attacker, one attacker, has to be uh, more successful than, than the uh, validation network in the blockchain technology. And this uh, needs a lot of uh, computer power. So in the end, uh, the blockchain, if uh, configured properly, um, is, is not a bad, bad um, thing. When it comes to, to the use of cryptocurrency in the uh, crime scene, um, this is a big problem because um, it's, it's very hard. Uh, here the cyber persona, uh, and, um, it's also here again a hash code, which is associated to, to a crypto wallet. And it, it's very hard um, to identify um, the owner of a wallet. Um, I've uh, seen here uh, one uh, successful event uh, in the US by the FBI, but uh, only because um, the FBI um, was, or some of the American uh, law enforcement services, um, was able to uh, infiltrate the mobile phone where the wallet was stored to, to get the information. But uh, also the, FBI, uh, the, the uh, law enforcement authorities were not able to 
um, hack the um, or to to yeah uh, disclose um, the blockchain as such. So therefore, yeah, this is this is a big challenge, and uh, here I think a lot of governments are already working on it, how to control the the crypto market. Um, although now with the uh, collapse of the uh, recent collapse of the um, FTX uh, provider, well, there's currently a lot of trust in uh, blockchain technology and cryptocurrency is lost and has to be uh, gained uh, again. Yes, hello. Um, I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, already for evoking such important t subject matter. I had a question for Professor Madej. Uh, could I believe could you're cut you off. identify yourself, please? Oh, yes, absolutely. My name is Jules. I'm an analyst at the Citadel Group for the uh, Air Force. Mm -hmm. um, security analyst, just general stuff. And uh, I know that the professor got cut off before he was able to address the topic of robotics. And so <laughs> if there was a possibility that you uh, go back to that topic yeah. as well as it pertains to NATO more particularly. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. I will do my best to make it uh, short, but uh, to sum up, let's say, uh, the mo most important things I wanted to say, uh, it's a bit different situation than in two previous cases, because here we could talk b both about highly advanced, let's say, technology and really low tech uh, threat. And in both cases, there are the challenges. On one hand, is if, we, if we talk about high tech advanced uh, uh, robotics, uh, maybe future, uh, in future also autonomous. Uh, by autonomous, I mean things which could engage militarily that is start to be lethal. Uh, autonomously without a human in the loop, as, as currently we call it. That's probably something in which NATO will uh, be maybe not interested, but has to keep, let's say, eye on it and keep technological edge. The problem is for NATO as a threat, our, uh, car, especially in current uh, situation, in my opinion, more a bigger problem is with low tech uh, drones and so on, because proliferation of such technology is simply due to, uh, again, dual use characteristics of it uh, and possibility to make it improvised weapon, as, for example, Iranians proved in context of Aramco attack in, in a couple of years ago in Saudi Arabia, which was really done by plastic toys. and and effectively. Uh, that means that for NATO, it, on, on the battlefield, let's say, that kind of issues could, could be important, and even not only by non-state actors, but even by state actors. Again, Russian case with, with use of Iranian Shahid kamikaze drones, which again, sorry for going again for in some diversions and deviations of, but de facto it's not drones, it's rather ammunition, which is, could be guided, some kind of cheap version of cruised cruise missile with short range and very low speed. But def nevertheless, that kind of thing uh, could be useful from the perspective of those who are potential attackers. And we have to deal with that knowing that, for example, from economic point of view to some degree, our anti-missile, for um, our anti-air uh, systems are, let's say, designed to deal with s serious threats, not such. As when, especially if you have hundreds or thousands of them, it's more like like in case of Iron Dome in, in Israel. So uh, from the NATO perspective, in my opinion, in context of that, we should, uh, in the short term, focus on dealing, uh, how to deal with low-tech problems, less high-tech. Here, technological is, uh, edge is kept. But on the other hand, here I think that uh, NATO have to take uh, seriously uh, in future the problem of autonomy. Because even if we will not go there taking into account, because technologically we are really close to that, and taking into account that using unmanned equipment, uh, but still operated somehow by a very distant operator, creates a lot of delays, a lot of vulnerabilities as far as jamming signal or hijacking. Uh, you know, military utility of such weapons is blocked by, being, uh, by keeping human in the loop. Uh, and also it's a bit artificial in in fact, when we have so-called situation human on the loop, that is, the machine is doing everything alone, but we, te in theory, control that process. If you are an operator of such system, you base on the, your, all your knowledge is based on the data given by the machine. So it's a bit artificial because what kind of conclusion I could have if I have only that kind of data? I will say, it, for example, engage, and then machine will engage 
with my responsibility, which will, let's say, give uh, satisfaction for uh, IHL uh, requirement, that is international humanitarian law, because not everybody knows who, who exactly said should, but in practice, decision of, of the operator will be based on fully on what machine already knows. So what's the purpose other than having, having a clear issue of responsibility to, to keep it from technical point of view, will probably reach that point. And even if, I know that it's really tricky argument, but even if NATO won't decide to design that kind of weapons, I could bet that potential enemies doesn't have to have such a moral limits or something like that, especially taking into account what happened, for example, I know, being a Pole, I, I, in, referring to Ukraine now, it's uh, symptomatic, but if you have an enemy who decides to bomb cities with no, uh, no limits, then believing that moral, for example, ground will be uh, enough to stop from thinking about autonomous weapons if it gets military advantage, is a uh, risky safe, and there is no chance, in fact, as for today, to create any arms control agreement concerning that kind of technology, not to mention about low, to, not, not only laws, that is low, uh, lethal autonomous uh, weapon systems. Hence, as short term, deal with the problem of low tech because it's already there. And unfortunately, uh, we a bit, I think, missed the, the problem, although it's manageable, but probably with a high cost, relatively high cost. Uh, in future, autonomy will be an issue for, for NATO, and taking to the ground, even if I fully agree that currently drones are not game changers. Of course, there are, again, hype around, I don't know, Bayraktar in, in Ukraine, how effective it is, probably not as much as Ukrainians are calling it. And also, of course, that Shahid, you have to send thousands of them, some of them reach the city. But nevertheless, that's the problem, especially if we talk about uh, attack on, on civilians. They will be terrified anyway, and they will have an impact on, on the government. Infrastructure in, in uh, Ukraine is destroyed m also by that kind of, of uh, thing. So uh, we have to, uh, to deal with that, and uh, autonomy in future will also could could happen. Therefore, uh, NATO will need probably to develop, because in case of autonomous weapons, I am afraid that there will be an issue of being able to answer, in, uh, to respond in kind. And that's trying to be brief. I hope I managed to show my main points here. Thanks. Yeah, uh, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Kim, I, I asked already many questions. I'm a banker, but also a reservist with French police, sous direction de la lutte contre la cybercriminalité. So my question is for Commander Morbar. Um, we know in France, while well, coming to the to the army side, about uh, come cyber, come cyber. Is there a cooperation at the level of NATO, as far as uh, well, offensive cyber operations are concerned, or to the extent you can tell us? Thank you. Um, I mean, uh, NATO, yes, uh, they say, okay, uh, the offensive use is, uh, is, is possible. Um, however, and here I'm uh, um, out for a while at this level, um, I know that there, there is something ongoing, but I cannot uh, say because I'm not in the loop anymore. Thanks a lot. I have a question for, for, for Marek. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's a more abstract question, let's say, because you said that uh, we need to deal with, with autonomy, and I perfectly agree with that. Uh, but you frame most of the time autonomy in a sort of offensive way, right? So our autonomy, like the new threats that we need to face, and so on and so forth. But it's a bit, ir ironically, the same technologies that can power the offense, they can also power air defense systems. Right? Mm -hmm. So advancements in semiconductors and artificial intelligence can actually render air defense systems better prepared in order to, to face new threats and, and, and so on and so forth. So probably the dynamics will be always the same. You know, like, so the new technologies will power both the offense and the defense and it's this never ending process of innovation and, and, and counter innovation. What do you think about that? I fully agree that, um, although I think the play 
uh, what, it's, what is offense, what is defense is very often very tricky because developing defense capabilities very often enable you to create some offensive capabilities as well, another way around. The problem is, in my opinion, in this context, which is proven to some degree by, of course, it's extrapolation of uh, earlier trends, but uh, with anti-missile uh, systems, we have uh, proof, in my opinion, uh, which shows that it's much easier to design a missile which will go precisely to the point you, you want it to go than to design an anti-missile which will shoot it in during the flight. Also due to the simply bigger number of calculations you have to do. And to, uh, my, uh, by the way, if you send a missile to destroy something that is offensive use, you don't care too much about how to destroy it in, in the air without risk of debris or other consequences and so on. So it means that I'm fully aware that autonomy, for example, the fact of patriot system is close to autonomy, if not autonomous to uh, some degree, at least. I, uh, and I fully agree that it could speed up, let's say, development of defensive as well. The problem is that in this, especially if you reduce time, you increase the problem of tracking because of maneuverability and so on. Uh, uh, the anti-missile or anti-drone system will be probably relatively much more complex than the missile or the drone you want to destroy by that. And that's what, I, in my opinion, could be a bigger problem because if you develop capabilities, it's better to invest in something which is more affordable and effective cheaper price. So uh, I, what I could expect, there is a probability also that we won't try to solve the problem, maybe even unsolvable, by this, uh, building great anti-missile shield and anti-passive anti defense is very often, pass well, maybe not passive, but because mm, it's not passive defense, but the deterrence by denial, that is to build such a gre great fence that you cannot cross it, is simply more uh, complex and more uh, costly than uh, the deterrence by retaliation. However, that is risky because you deter by having similar capabilities to do harm. And of course, one is on nuclear level and so on, but currently we are going also on conventional deterrence uh, basis. And here I expect that autonomy, spread of autonomy could let uh, rather to do more effective offensive weapons, which will be used in defensive way, that is, do not attack me because I have the same, then in developing highly complex, more costly and uh, less reliable anti-missile system. That's my guess to some degree, but that's why I think that autonomy will speed rather the, the, the development of, let's say, offensive capabilities than, than purely defensive or mainly defensive. I have one question for uh, Professor Charbonneau. You have mentioned, Professor, that uh, um, Russia uh, could be severely affected uh, in its infrastructure by the climate change. You mentioned the potential of Russian infrastructure to collapse. Would you be so kind as to give us some examples and uh, how you consider this risk in the short term? Well, um, I mean, I use Russia, but really it affects everyone, right? So, so let's be clear on that. But in the, the specific case of Russia, uh, I think there are two issues, obviously, that, that need to be uh, thought through and analyzed uh, more thoroughly. The first, I think, is probably now obvious uh, given the invasion of Ukraine, which is the dependence of uh, Russia on exporting fossil fuels. So, so gas and oil that will be phased out in the medium to long term. I mean, it's not a, you know, it, it won't have be happening, but the energy crisis and the, the, the war in Europe and so on and so forth, as you know, uh, most of you know, will affect uh, definitely the, 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 the sources of wealth uh, for Russia and its influence in, in those markets. Um, but, but the point I was trying to make uh, also is all, is all the infrastructures uh, um, that will affect, well, pretty much every sector of uh, Russian uh, society. So roads and railroads, uh, but a lot of also buildings in the north and parts of Russia, where, like I was saying, are built on permafrost. So. Um, 
uh, you, you have to think about what that means in terms of uh, even within Russia, internal uh, internal politics, internal political economy. So uh, a movement from west to east, uh, um, uh, or I should say east to west, in particular in terms of resource extractions, uh, uh, rely on those roads and railroads, for instance, but also a lot of buildings in the northern parts around the Arctic circles and so on and so forth are, are, are at risks of collapsing because of climate change. Um, and obviously, I think uh, uh, in that context, we'll have to see what happens with the Arctic Council. Um, there's obviously, as I'm sure you all know, a lot of interest in Arctic politics these days, or have been at least in the last decades because of linked to climate change in Russia has made uh, claims to certain resources on the Arctic floor and so on and so forth. Uh, but if it's a basis, a naval basis in the north as well around the Arctic are under threat because of rising seas, uh, um, for instance, uh, uh, you have to call into question again whether they'll be able, able to support those claims, for instance, with military force or projection and that sort of thing. So it's not a short term issue as in the next year or two or three or even five, but I'd say that in the 2030s, uh, 2030 our horizon and beyond, I mean, these issues will come up and, and, and they will affect uh, the capability of Russia to have an influence outside, if only because internally they will have uh, to face all of these challenges. And, and that, that sort of analysis, I would argue, should apply to everyone we think about when we turn, we're talking in terms of strategic or geopolitical competition. Thank you, Professor. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, Mahak has a question for you. Yeah, I hope rather short question. Sorry, uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be in one panel, even if not, if remotely. Uh, but I would like to ask you if it's possible how you assess uh, the impact of war in Ukraine on capability of global community, even maybe, uh, to counter the the warming global warming process. That is, would it be a stimulus for increasing, knowing that? the relevance of, of fossil fuels and dependency on it used by, by Russia, especially in Europe, or rather other way around, that it will make an, be, be rather an obstacle to, to, to that global warming, taking into account the current COP uh, debates in, in Egypt, and also, I don't know, facts like, for example, that Russia is starting again to produce LADAS, which met uh, standards in ecological pollution issue uh, from mid-90s at best. So, of course, again, not, I don't want to be perceived as Paul who always said bad about Russia, but that kind of issues happen also in, in Poland in that sense that we are running on call and we want to run on call even more because of, of, of what happens now. Mm -hmm. So, how you think that, that is to what degree war, war in Ukraine could have an impact on, on global capability to deal with global warming? Yes, that's a very difficult and uh, important question. It, it remains to be seen. It's a bit too early, I think, to draw uh, uh, strict conclusions to, to what's happening. I, I think one thing I would be, and I think is uh, quite clear already, is that it has brought forward and accelerated the importance of the question of the energy transition. As I, in Europe, obviously, I think this is where it's happening. Uh, uh, the reliance on, on, on Russian markets for energy consumption in Europe has, has come to the fore. So it's now an unavoidable question, right? Uh, uh, you cannot just forget about it. You cannot just think that energy comes from somehow magically appears at your door to warm up your homes and so on and so forth. So, so that issue, I think, and now if there is one effect that's for clear that it's now a political issue and a highly sensitive and important political issue that's at the forefront now as to how Europe, European governments, Germany, for instance, in particular, is responding and will respond. You're right. It's, it's, so, some seem to be doubling down. There's a, a lot of pressure, for instance, to uh, go to Africa uh, um, to, to uh, build infrastructure to dig for more oil or, or coal or whatnot. So, so that sort of pressure to compensate, I think, um, is definitely interesting. Now the question, I think, becomes, is this like a crisis sort of short-term management of what's going on? Will that be sustainable? Can you uh, think that 
or, or can you think that it will accelerate in it, the energy transition? I, I think that that still remains to be seen whether, for instance, uh, 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 Europe will turn to alternative sources of energy or will just double down and find other sources of oil and coal and so on and so forth. I mean, I really don't have an answer here because I think it's ongoing, uh, but you see signs, for instance, in France uh, trying to accelerate the use of solar panels, for instance, uh, and trying to find solutions to their problems with nuclear reactors, right? Uh, uh, to, to uh, um, I guess strengthen or, 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 or respond to that crisis and the fact that last summer uh, uh, nuclear reactors uh, could not be um, cooled down by water that was too hot. <laughs> so, they, so, so you need to also think in such terms. So, so uh, yeah, my, my, yeah, I, I'll just end here. I think the, the issue now is public. It's high stake level of stuff, but where it will go remains uh, to be seen, but Ukraine has brought it forward at the very least, for sure. Thank you. I think we've, uh, you, you have a question. I guess one last question. One last question, yeah. Yes, I missed again. I think you, I heard you say there is no red team for climate change. Because the army uh, is using uh, science fiction novels and so on, but uh, do you think there should be one? Uh. No. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I. I guess I, I had something very specific in mind. Um, uh, talks about, for instance, in military contexts of including inserting climate change in uh, uh, training, like uh, simulation, tabletop exercises, and so on and so forth. Uh, you can't say climate change is, yeah, who's the red team behind climate change, right? Uh, uh, or is it an enemy? Is it a target? Is it something like that? So, so that obviously it makes no sense. Climate change is not a red team. You can't say climate change is a threat or something that needs to be addressed like any other threat. Uh, uh, so I guess that's what I was saying. So, so there's more, there's definitely, like I was saying, a big challenge towards integrating climate change into that sort of thinking and security. To me, it's about the context. It's about checking our assumptions, how it changes, I think, the baseline of what we're doing. Uh, I, I, at the very least, it, it does, and I think it's well, re, fairly well accepted, as I was saying, uh, that it will and is affecting military operations. But I think, as I've said in previous uh, comments that it is a, it goes way beyond that it goes be, it, it changes the overall context and the question about the energy transition for instance in Europe uh, uh, our energy crisis right now also talks to to those shifting um, uh, political alliances centers of influence centers of power uh, and resistance to those changes and transitions obviously so there's no red team per se i mean red team might be it depends on the context obviously uh, um, but but i think climate change does make us ask that question i think it should ask us we cannot avoid the issue of climate change how it affects how we interpret understand the red team whoever you want to identify as the red team in the particular context I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I would like to thank really very warmly uh, our speakers. We have had a lively panel on a subject which is uh, very technical. And uh, I, I think it's, it was very complementary to what we had this morning and beginning of the afternoon, which gives you a sort of large panel of what NATO has to cope with or can cope to. And um, I, I really would like also to thank you for staying till the end. Uh, it's, uh, it has been a pleasure organizing this uh, seminar for you uh, to uh, contact all the uh, speakers, to exchange with them, to make sure that we have the same understandings of words and concepts so that you have a sort of fluid uh, seminar. And before closing completely, I. I uh, encountered a, a, few, uh, um, a few words which I thought would be uh, very adapted to today's. It's, um, it's a word by Lao Tzu, who is uh, a, a 
wise man in China, was a wise man in China, saying, water is fluid, soft and yielding, but water will wear away rock, which is rigid and cannot yield. As a rule, whatever is fluid, soft and yielding will overcome whatever is rigid and hard. This is another paradox, what is soft is strong. It's with this word that I will, I'm closing the seminar. Merci à tous. Merci. Professeur, merci beaucoup.